Okay, please be seated, everybody. This is case number 2018 CA5321 NC, uh, Jack Kowalski, etc., at all versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Starting with the plaintiffs, let's take appearances, please. Samantha Lawrence on behalf of the plaintiffs with Nick Whitney and Greg Anderson. Howard Hunter on behalf of All Children's Hospital with, with uh, Ethan Shapiro, Pat Crowells, David Hughes, and Chris Altenburn. Our corporate representative today is Dr. Richard Elliott. Thank you. Can I see the attorneys up here, please? Um, let's uh, recap on a couple of issues. Uh, first, we have circulated um, the draft language. Now, again, Mr. Altenburn, it's not a final. Um, feel free to, and you and Mr. Alligate, uh, chew it up, chop it up. Yeah, I'm here mostly to receive this debate. I will go back to, to my computer and work with Mr. Alligate. Elegant on this, and uh, and see what I can do with this. It looks close to me. I, frankly, um, I put in the language of the orders, wishing I could do what you did, and I'm happy that you've done that. I think that it will make it easier for the jury, and I hope that Mr. Elegant and I can work on this. Maybe have something back to you even by the end of lunch hour or so for you. Uh, only two things, Judge. I I wanted to uh, uh, mostly talk to counsel about it, but. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to get to Mr. Elliott this morning about it, but a time period for uh, not just the date of the order, but the time period when there was contact for someone and not contact from somebody else is one, one suggestion. The other one is how to deal with the ketamine uh, order, which at some point I think needs to be addressed in there. But I'll leave that up to the appellate counsel on the court. For when she was leaving the court, you mean? When she was leaving court custody? or. What, you know, the, the fact of the order itself. I'm not sure exactly how to deal with it, but I think it, it should be dealt with. Yeah, we were trying to just do visitation kinds of issues with this. And not I understand. Things. The only other suggestion I have, Your Honor, is that, that you, you said this is going to go back with the jury at the end as well as reading it to them. I, I, I frankly think it's complicated enough. It might be a good idea to give them a copy when, when you read it to them in the court, whether it's later today or tomorrow morning. But it's talk, talk of that concept with Mr. Elegant. I would okay. feel much more comfortable if both sides agree. Sure, sure. And uh, the concept, I think, is missing, and we need to also work in, and I put some brackets there, is that um, the parental rights were not removed. I understand. I'll, yeah. I'll see what I can do on that. Okay. Thank you very much on that. Now, the next issue with respect to... Dr. Malik, um, I have gone ahead and made the rulings that was just or should be emailed in the last few minutes. I saw that, Judge. I don't see that you ruled on our objection. There was a, uh, you should have had one objection from us. Um, and I saw the court had a question on one of them, and I'll have to look at the deposition to answer the court's question. 
Um, goodness, I guess I did not see your so. It's just one uh, section. I don't have it in front of me. We, we'll find it and uh, send it to the court with that. Yeah, I, I'm just seeing where where the uh, where the um, where I put the uh, deposition. Do you have the reference? Here it is. I, I found it. Um, the, there was a timing issue on I see that, page Judge. 89. I couldn't figure out from the context when we were talking about it, and that might impact the courts. I see that. I can't answer without looking at the deposition. And uh, yeah, I've got the deposition in front of me. Do you have the page in line for the, the objection? The defendant's objection. I'll just do it right now. Can you find it? If you don't have it, then. Well, let me move on to something else, okay. and then I'll come back we'll to that if you, if you find it. There was, on Friday, a discussion of a number of exhibits that presumably come from Beata Kowalski, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that these do come from Beata Kowalski. I know that there was a couple that journaled at a time when Maya and dad were in Mexico and mom was was in the United States but the language continues to be consistent and so I, I'm, I'm confident these are Beata statements. Now I know we've had some discussions about the various admissibilities of the diagnosis of uh, Munchausen by proxy. How I read these emails uh, to herself, from Beata to herself, is, is it, it's a journal, essentially. It's, it's a contemporaneous view of what was going on. And I liken this to a video in the sense that we saw videos of what was happening uh, with Maya at various different times between 2015 and her admission to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And so in reviewing these emails, I keep coming back to the generalized concept that it's important for the jury to see and understand the context of how Maya presented uh, to Johns Hopkins Ultralins Hospital. That would include how she was um, doing for the good or for the bad, because some of these, you know, she was having great days and other days, uh, not so, so good days. And so I liken these series of emails, these journal emails as contemporaneous statements uh, by Beata Kowalski, who obviously um, at this point is um, a party uh, admission. Um, and so I, I am going to, to let them in. Um, well, let, let me just go ahead and physically do that, and then I'll, I'll give you some future thoughts about the Munchausen issue. The court at this time is going to receive into evidence uh, 3144. I think it's only one page. Court will receive 3145. I believe that's only one page. 3146. I believe that's only one page. 3147. I believe that one's one page. 3148. I believe that's two pages. Correct. 3150, one page. 3151, one page. 3152, one page. 3155, one page. 3156, one page. 3157, one page. 3158, one page. 3159, one page. 3160, one page. 
3161 one page, 3162 one page, 3164 one page, 3165 one page, 3166 one page, 3167 one page, 3170 one page, 3171 one page, 3173 one page, 3174 one page, 3175 one page, 3177 one page. Um, I have 3177, I have one, I have two pages listed. I was only provided one page, okay. 3177. And okay. Your Honor, 3175, I'm not sure what it is right now, but it's not on their list. Uh, um, so well, it might have been. Not sure what's going on with that one. Well, I can show you what specifically it is here. So right now, only page one of 3177, if that is more than one page, is in. Three one seven five, and so only page one of three one seven seven. Madam Clerk, was there more than one page on the sheet? Okay, if someone can at some point show that to me. Three one seven eight. Uh, I only have two pages for that one. That's that's correct. Madam Clerk, would it help? If you saw these, they have a little number at the bottom, or are you good? Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll want them back after you're finished with them. Uh, let's see here. I think I just got an email on. Oh, this is something else. This is a reconsideration motion on counts 21. A and B, which is the intentional infliction. But have we gone, going back to Dr. Malik's deposition, do we have Did the defendant's yes. objection? Just tell us, tell, just tell, right now. Page 21, line 22, to page 22, line 24. 21, line... 22. 22 through 22, line what? 24. Chapter 39 was the objection. sustain and exclude 21 lines 22 through page 22 lines 24. Um, there are some more exhibits if we can address them unless the court had something else. 
I, I have now finished uh, my homework from last night. Okay. Okay. You get an A. All right. So, um, Judge, um, we have um, some EEG video segments that we would like to admit. Um, we can play them for your honor, but they're from that 48-hour uh, EEG. How, how, how long are they? How they're all, there's four, and they're all, what, 30 seconds or less? Has the plaintiff seen, <clears throat> seen them? I don't know. Uh, I have not. No. Have you seen them? No. Roll tape. Okay, so we need 3085. And we'll label these... One, two, three, and four, Judge. I don't know so how are you designate them. How are they designated on the? Uh... Well, they weren't. We're designating them as thirty, eighty-four, one, two, three, and four. How do you want them designated? Is that fine? Or... The clerk says that's fine. Okay. All right. This is the first one, Judge. What's this one? Thirty, eighty-five, one. And you said three, one, eight, four. No, three, zero. Eight four three zero eight. Four. I'm sorry. <laughs> we start over. Three zero eight five. Three zero eight five. The first video. Can you? Did you play? Yes. Yeah. It didn't play. I didn't see it. Okay. <clears throat> it's it's not playing. the actual video. I, I don't know. I don't know. What well, we'll fix it. We'll, we'll go into the second one, Judge. That'd be it. Any objection? No objection. The okay, court will receive 3085-2. Okay. 30853, please. My only comment, Your Honor, is I think there's sound with these videos, so... Oh. Well, let's play the sound then. Obviously, the sound there is not important, but I'm Curious to know what the sound is with the nurse and my interacting. Okay, well, any objection to 3085? That was three. No, Your Honor. Court receives 3085 3. Let's go back and play uh, two with the sound. Just as indecipherable, but <laughs> agreed. But okay. still, I could so it. two, sure, two is fine. in. What's uh, number four? Thank you. 
Okay, court receives 3085-4. Do you have to do something to yes. one to fix it? Yeah. Okay, so we'll skip that for now is what you're saying? It's, it's not for the witnesses until this afternoon, Judge. We may have to revisit oh, one. No, not yet. Oh, you no, think you fixed it? Okay. No. Okay. You fixed it? No. Not yet. Oh, okay. And then um, uh, the... Hold on, I'm trying to... 33041, can you bring that up? Probably hard to fix and put up exhibits at the same time. 33 three, what? Zero 04, it's on the last page. It's just a still photo of the EEG room. Three three zero four should be on page six of your list. I've got so many lists. I yeah. I objected to ours. I'm on a. I have a, a list that has page eight, oh. and it's three two four zero, and then the next one's three three one five. So. Um, I don't know what to tell you, Your Honor. I have one that has six pages. But this is 3304-1. Three, zero, three, zero, uh, it's quite simply a picture of the EEG room that's been referenced. We object. It's not a fair and accurate representation of the EEG room at the time. That clearly is not the setup at the time of my Kowalski's admission. He wasn't in a, I don't know if that's a, toddler bed or what that is, but that was not the bed my Kowalski was in. The apparatus is unfamiliar. And all the windows are open. Well, Judge, it is not a uh, bed she was in. That is accurate, but it is the room that's been referenced many times. Oh. I don't know. It does seem different than what we were just looking at. Who, who, who's who's going to say that this is a fair and accurate depiction of the room as it existed at the time Maya was there. Dr. D is testifying this afternoon. Can, can we put up a couple of those previous videos? Sure. Uh, 38085. You can see it's the same couch. There's the window. has that couch. Sunlight is coming in through the window. Can we focus on the commode and the bed, which are clearly different? Yeah. And if the position is it's the same, then it's cumulative. Yeah. Yeah, I... Much has been made about the, the uh, almost to liken it to a dungeon that we put the squirrel in. Um, this is, it's a still photo. It's from the, the um, when we went through the hospital with counsel, everybody's taking photos. So it's not, uh, They've never seen it before. They saw the room that day, and they have their own photos. Um, the only difference is the bed. Can I see the still photo again, please? That was uh, 3304. Do you have one that doesn't have that bed in it? I don't think we do, Judge, because it was how it was set up when we did the walkthrough of the hospital with opposing counsel. Well, I don't see it for. Here's the thing: assuming, assuming that. There's going to be testimony that this is a fair and accurate depiction, and I will probably let it in. I'm not going to let it in at this point in time. It, it does look different, so I'm going to require the testimony first. Um, you know, it does show an angle that we haven't seen, so I don't think it would be cumulative. 
All right, understood. Yes. <clears throat> so just remember when we do that, that we'll have to not show it to the um, to the jury. If you have a printout of it, it might just be easier, so I don't have to we change. Can we can print that out. Um, Judge, to answer your inquiry about Dr. Malik's deposition, yes, um, he is testifying regarding his note of ten nine sixteen. So before the shelter, I go back. Look at it now. Do you need? The, do you have the? Report? I've got it up right now. Okay. Do you need the page reference? To it? I've got it starting on page eighty nine, line fifteen. Yes. So this was after the first call, but before the second call. Am I correct in my time frame? Or is this after the second call, but prior to the decision to shelter? That is unclear. That is unclear. It's unclear. Okay. <clears throat> Wait, we're not seeing whatever anybody else is seeing. No, I'm just looking at it, the actual deposition. Explaining developments throughout the course of that day and night. Where Dr. Mallon was the seven, essentially the morning and afternoon show. That helps the court. Sustain this one. I okay. think it, it references too much about making reports to the hotline. All right, so just to be clear, Judge, that's 89, 15, 10, 90, 12. Correct. Court will sustain that designation. All right, Judge, um, I understand the time clock and uh, our first witness is by Zoom. And no one's here by Zoom yet. That's not good. Did someone ask uh, Ms. Sybach to send the link to? Yes, sir. We confirmed they have. Who is it going to be? Who is it? Who is it? It's, it's uh, Dr. Santana Rojas. Who's in Orlando? Maybe someone can call her. make a telephone call? see us and they're using the link the webinar link that the court sent well I suspect what they are is in as a observer what's the name again uh, Santana Rojas or Goodis it's like uh, her counsel was Jeff Goodis your honor it's probably under his name right they came in not as a participant under the zoom language but as just a normal attendee so Jeff Goodis um, hold on a second let me see if I can do something it's 
not giving me the option to promote. Oh, there it goes. Promote to panelist. He's telling me, Judge, you just, you just used the link you would send. Let's see if this works. And so is the is the is the attorney on a different? Oh, there, there we are. There you, there you go. Okay. What's give me the um, correct spelling of the witness's name? Uh, Doctor um, Legezia. I'm, I'm hanging up, Joe. L I S. I'm sorry. G I, say it again. L I S G E L I E. Last name. L Santana, S-A-N-T-A-N-A. Did I get this the spelling correct? No, the um it's an A at the end. A at the end of what? For the first thing. L I A. L I S G E L I A. That's correct now. Sorry about that. There we go. Your Honor, I intended the off camera to do the testimony. I assume everybody would prefer that. I can't have that one being moved. Yeah. It, because it. That one can't move because it interferes. We've got issues with where the court TV needs it and where the lawyers need it. Well, well, now it's probably too far. Let's bring it back this way. Make sure the cord is not, it usually gets under the, uh, the cord gets caught up. So use this one to flip it. Are we ready to bring in the jury? Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. Uh, and, and are you currently in the state of Florida, ma'am? Yes, sir. Let me go ahead and put you under oath. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give is the truth? Yes, I swear. Thank you. And then is the attorney, because right now you're somewhat in the picture. so uh, I'll get out of the picture, Your Honor. Thank you. Let's bring in the jury. Someone going to place the uh, video up onto the TV? I'm sorry? Just waiting on the link. Okay, hey, please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did not um, investigate this case and you did not receive any information. Is that correct? Correct. And you have not received any um, contact about this case. Is that correct? Correct. And you have not seen any media reports of this case. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, our next witness is again by Zoom. Uh, she has already been uh, placed under oath outside of your presence, so she will be testifying under oath. And I think we're going to put it on the screen here for you in just a moment. There we go. And Mr. Hunter, can you uh, please uh, call your next witness? Our next witness is Dr. Nostelio Santana Robos. You may proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Would you tell the jury your name, please, ma'am? Yes, my name is Luis Helia Santana Rojas. And where are you speaking to us from, Dr. Santana Rojas? I'm in Tampa, Florida. Okay. And I, I said you were a doctor. Could you 
tell us what your occupation is and where you work. Yes, I'm, I work at Namor Children's Health in Orlando, Florida. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist and also a pediatric pain manager doctor. Okay. Could you tell the jury where you received your undergraduate and medical training? Yes, uh, I, my undergraduate and medical training uh, were at the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. And when did you get your degree there? When? Yes, ma'am. Uh, which one? 2000, and, 2000 was undergraduate and medical school 2004. Okay. And then after 2004, where did you go from there? I did a residency program at the same location, University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine in Anesthesia. All right. And then you finished that at one year? 2004. Okay. And then after that uh, residency, where did you go from there? I did a fellowship training at Harvard, uh, Boston Children's for pain medicine. And, and what did your uh, fellowship at Boston Children's slash Harvard consist of? My fellowship consists of uh, pediatric pain management and adult pain management training. Okay. And, and was that in connection with the operation of a clinic or a particular program for pediatric pain management? Yeah, it was uh, on Harvard-based Boston Children's Hospital. Okay. Um, and you are, when, when did you go to your present location at Nemours Children's Hospital? When, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. When? Uh, yes. So I started at Nemours in 2013, January, to be exact. Okay. And could you tell me what your position is at Nemours Children's Hospital? I mean, that the director of pain medicine. Okay. And, and what does that entail? Well, um, I I direct the clinic, the uh, pain management clinic on Nemours, and I oversee everything that is related to pain management. Okay. Okay, so the jury understands. Can you explain what your pain management clinic does and what kind of care that it renders, what kind of patients it sees? Yes. So um, my clinic, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary clinic, meaning multi-specialty. Uh, we see all patients with chronic pain, um, meaning more than six months of pain. And we see every every type of pain, including musculoskeletal, headache, abdominal pain, et cetera. Okay. And does your patient population include pediatric patients with chronic regional pain syndrome? That's correct. And could you tell us what percentage of your patient population um, is, is afflicted with that disease or that syndrome? I um, cannot give you an exact number. Okay. But it's... The, it's not the majority. It's it's more rare diagnosis. Okay, and and how how frequently does uh, chronic regional pain syndrome occur in the pediatric population? It's also rare in the pediatric population. Okay, and do you have experience in treating that disease? Yes, correct. For the last decade, okay. a little bit more. Is is the clinic at Nemours? Um, one of the few in Florida that specializes in pediatric chronic pain? That's correct. Um, Memorial in Orlando has one of the unique pain clinics for pediatric patients. Okay. Was there a point at which you became aware of the case involving Maya Kowalski? Can you repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. Was there a point in time at which you became aware of the case involving Maya Kowalski, in other words, her, of, of her medical needs? I'm, I received, uh, we received a con um, phone call uh, from an intensivist. I received a phone call from the intensivist um, about this patient. Okay, could you describe for us what phone call you received and what the purpose of the call was as far as you understood? Objection to hearsay. Yes. Over -over. Um, the phone call was from an intensivist at my institution, No More Children's, 
uh, requesting um, a transfer from all children from a patient um, with the diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. And, and what was your response to that call? My response is that I, I don't know this patient. I never evaluated the patient. And the call was specifically for a treatment that I, I don't perform. So and it was intrathecal pump placement. Okay. I was going to say, what, what treatment was it that you were asked to provide? An intrathecal pump placement. And, and is was that treatment something that you that your institution provides for patients with chronic regional pain syndrome? We do not. Was there was that the extent of the the call at that time? That was the extent of the call. Okay. And was there a subsequent communication that you had with the patient's mother, Beata Kowalski? Yes, uh, there was a phone call in which um, the mom was on the call trying to explain um, the patient uh, condition and requesting again uh, to be transferred for intrathecal pump placement. And and what what was the mother's request of you in this telephone call that you had with her? She, what I can recall is that she just mentioned that she needs an intrathecal pump placement, and if I can admit the patient and place it on her. Okay. And do you recall the date of either of these calls, ma'am? I don't. I don't recall it, but I have it on um, here. There were in October nine was one of them. October nine of two thousand and sixteen. Okay. And would you would you tell let's let's backtrack a little bit. Was the first call that you had on October 9th? The first call that I had was only from the intensivist. Okay. And was that on October 9th? I don't recall. Okay. I yes, I I believe so. Okay. And and when did you actually wind up speaking with Mrs. Kowalski? On a second phone encounter. And, and what date was that, if you, if you have it in your records there, or something you can refer to to refresh your recollection? Yes. Um, I believe it was October 12, 2015. Okay. And and who was on that call, please, ma'am? With who? Yes, ma'am. Who was on the telephone call that you had with the mother? I only remember the mother. Okay. Um, tell us as near as you can remember what Mrs. Kowalski said to you and what you explained to her about what you could or could not do uh, with respect to the care of her daughter? Yes. Um, I just remembered that she mentioned several times that her daughter suffered from complex regional pain syndrome and that she wanted her to have an intrathecal pump placement. And my response to her was that um, I don't provide that treatment for that condition but I'll be happy to see her in the outpatient setting in the clinic to make an evaluation and recommendations, which for complex regional pain syndrome, we have a standard program in our clinic where we keep the patients for an average of a month, Monday to Friday, doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, and behavioral therapy every day. 
She, at the end of the conversation, she agreed with the treatment, and that was it. But that call. Okay. And was your was your program as you just described it? Um, was that on an outpatient basis or an inpatient basis? How would that be administered to the patient? Yes, it's an outpatient Monday to Friday in the morning. So we start at nine in the morning and it finishes around noon. Okay. And, and how, I'm sorry, how long does that go for? For an average of four weeks. And would that be preceded by an evaluation of uh, the patient's needs and what the patient's diagnosis was? All right. So that's what I told mom. I can, I, I will not actually admit in the patient for the program. I will need to evaluate the patient with my team. And in accordance to that evaluation, then we can make recommendation. And if we agree on the recommendation of the pain program as an outpatient setting, we will have her admitted at the pain program. But initially, there is an evaluation with the whole team. Okay. And, and were, at that point in time, were you prepared to accept Maya Kowalski into this outpatient program that you've described for us? No, again, I I only hear about a diagnosis, but I need to make a confirmation of the diagnosis myself. And if she will be a candidate for the pain program, then we'll decide and tell the parents about a future admission to the program. But they will meet, they will need an evaluation first. Okay. So you were prepared to see her and evaluate her for the program? I was prepared to see her and evaluate her in the clinic and make recommendations. It could be the program or it could be medication. It could be any other type of treatment because it's a multifactorial treatment. Okay. That would be based on what you felt the diagnosis was. Correct. Okay. Um, at that time, did um, you, you've indicated that your program involved um, behavioral therapy. Is that correct? All right. At that time, did the Nemours Children's Hospital have an inpatient psychiatric program? No, okay. not we never had a psychiatric program since we opened. Okay, very good. That's all I have this time, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, plaintiffs. Nothing. No need to cross. And uh, members of the jury, do any of the jurors have any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, may this witness be excused? Yes, Thank you. Honor. Yes. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Gettis. Thank you. Just can we approach briefly? Next witness is going to be by deposition. <coughs> Do you want to leave the lights on? Do you want me to dim it? Dim it, dim it, dim it. Dim it just a little. Okay. <laughs> is this fine? I'm not going to go down any further. Y'all try to see. <laughs> 
Uh, Mr. Hunter, please uh, call your next witness. Your Honor, defense calls doc Dr. Kelly Lowry by deposition, uh, videotape deposition. Address of work. Doctor, will you raise your right hand, please? <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to today be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, I will. Dr. Lowry, can you please state your, your uh, name and professional address for the record, please? Uh, my name is Kelly Lowry. My uh, address of work is 225 East Chicago Avenue, um, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. And, and where are you presently employed? And, and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Okay. And was that the same place you were employed back in July 2015 when you encountered the Kowalski family? Yes. Okay. Well, what is Lurie Children's Hospital? Uh, it's a pediatric children's hospital. Did you review anything uh, in connection with preparing for today? Yes. What did you review? My notes. And those are your Lurie Children's notes? Yes. Can you give me the benefit of your training and education from the time that you graduated from high school or from college through any types of advanced training or degrees you have in your chosen field? Sure. Um, I received my bachelor's at West Virginia University. Following that, I went and received a doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Florida. I completed a clinical internship here at Lurie Children's. I also completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Lurie Children's. Let me ask you this. What is, what is your current title? Director of Training in Psychology. Okay. Is that, is that, do you have a focus in the pediatric realm? I do. But what about back in 2015 when you were handling the care of Mike Bowalski? What was your, your title back then? Um, pediatric psychologist. Okay. And, and what type of, what type of, role does the pediatric psychologist play in a patient like Maya Kowalski? The role that I played was I was an attending psychologist on our consultation liaison team. And, and what are the types of things that you will do in furtherance of those duties? Um, generally, our attending teams would receive consults from our medical colleagues, and we would interview and assess families to answer the questions that they had requested. And if applicable, we might make recommendations in those cases. Okay. And did you have a PhD at the time that you cared for Mike Walski? I did. Okay. What other types of uh, degrees did you have at that point? Um, I also have a master's degree, but the PhD is probably more relevant. Okay. Well, and what's the PhD in? Clinical psychology. I'm just curious just if you could just describe generally what the field of clinical psychology is. Um, it's a field that aims to, it's kind of broad, um, individuals who are engaged in the study and potentially treatment and, um, evaluation of individuals who have psychological concerns. Did you review any other documents, literature, medical records, other than what we've described in preparation of today? I did not. Okay. How was it that you came to be involved as a uh, psychologist for Maya Kowalski? I was a member of the consultation liaison team, and I happened to receive the consultation request. Based on my review of the uh, history and physical, which is exhibit two at LCH 140 through 145, and I'm going to put that up for you right now. Um, it appears to me, based on my review of this, that a Dr. Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, was the attending physician. And I'll scroll down here to the bottom of the uh, H&P here. Do you see where it says Elizabeth A. Byrne, M.D.? Yes. And uh, if a pediatric attending physician wants psychology involved, can you walk me through how in 2015 they would get someone like you involved in the workup of a patient? Yeah, generally the process would be that the physician would put in an order for a psychiatric consult and a member of the psychiatric consultation team would receive that consult and do an evaluation and make treatment recommendations if applicable. 
just the general okay. process. Continuing here with Dr. Burns' uh, history and physical, which can be found on LCH 140 through LCH 145, I wanted to ask you um, about a few entries in there and see if you can tell me what, what the significance of these, these entries are uh, okay. in your field as a, as a pediatric psychologist. Um, on page 143 uh, in the impression section, Dr. Byrne notes here, quote, her exam is not necessarily consistent with her history, which raises concern for a psychiatric component to her presentation and specifically conversion disorder. Do you see that? I see that. Okay. So I'm drawing you back to the portion that I just quoted into the record. Her exam is not necessarily consistent with her history, which raises concern for a psychiatric component to her pre presentation and specifically conversion disorder. My question is, as, as a clinical psychologist, uh, what does that statement from Dr. Burns signify to you? Okay. Um, I mean, I don't want to kind of infer or speak for Dr. Byrne, but if I generally were to see a, a comment like that in a medical record and had received a consultation request, um, it would be consistent with wanting to get our team involved to further evaluate in that area for psychiatric um, components. In this this phrase in, in other portions of the chart, psychiatric component to her presentation, what does that signify to you? Again, generally speaking, psychiatric component to me would signify that there might be additional psychiatric contributors to a patient's presentation um, that might be in addition to or related or not related to other factors that might be contributing to the presentation. And likewise, there, there's a reference here to, quote, conversion disorder. Can you please define what conversion disorder is? Yeah, so generally speaking, conversion disorder is a psychiatric diagnosis um, that would indicate that there are psychological or psychiatric contributors to a particular presentation, which would, on the surface, appear more physical in nature. Do you have any independent recollection separate apart from the notes of your interactions with Maya Kowalski or her family members back in um, July of 2015? No. So it's fair to say you're, you're going to be guided more or less by the records? Okay. It says here at the very bottom where my cursor is, mom reports in recent hospitalizations, Maya has been resistant to separation from her mother. She does not like for conversations regarding her health to happen outside of the room does not want her mother to leave her alone. Do you see that? I see that. What, what does that signify to you as someone who practices in your field? Again, it, it's not my note, so I don't want to infer, Doctor, if that's uh, Dr. Burns' note, kind of um, that thought process. I think independent of other data, it's just a comment. One other thing that I see repeated throughout Maya's medical records here at Lurie's is um, this next line here where it says, quote, she intermittently moans but is distractible when talking about school, her friends, or her summer plans. Do you see that quote? I do. Um, I've seen the word distractible referenced uh, with respect to Maya's relationship. What does that term mean to you as a clinical psychologist? Again, it's, it's not my note, but you know, if when I see that somebody's distractible, I generally speaking would think that that means that if they were presenting with pain and then another something else can take their attention away from the pain. And distractibility in the setting of a patient with um, either chronic pain or suspected psychiatric components, what, what does distra distractibility mean to you as a clinical psychologist? Generally speaking, again, I, I would I would interpret that as somebody whose attention can be drawn to things other than pain. And why is that clinically significant to someone in your field? And as, as an isolated piece of information, probably no one piece of information is, is, you know, kind of like. At the very bottom of this addendum, do you see where my cursor is? And it says, quote, given these findings, there is concern for an underlining psychiatric etiology such as conversion disorder. Can you break that sentence down to me and tell me what is being described there by Dr. Byrne? So generally speaking, um, I read that as Dr. Byrne felt that there might be a psychiatric contribution to the patient's presentation. Um, <coughs> and that might be an area that Dr. Byrne might have had thoughts or concerns about. But for my purpose, generally speaking, in a, you know, if I receive a consult like this, it's just reason for consult. 
Okay. Well, since there was an objection, why don't you describe how you get involved in a patient's care such as Maya Kowalski back in the July 2015 timeframe at Lurie Children's? Yeah, so generally speaking for the consultation service, the medical psychiatry consultation service, we receive orders, requests for consults from our medical colleagues to get involved in specific cases. Gotcha. Now I'd like to draw your attention to our next exhibit here, which is going to be at LCH 189 through LCH 192. And it appears to be a consult note by a Claudio S. Rivera that is subsequently electronically signed by you on July 23, 2015. Do you see the Mr. Rivera's note from 7-22-2015? I see that. My first question would be, who is Claudio Rivera? Claudio was a psychology intern working with me at the time. And in this case, it looks like you electronically signed this exhibit we're looking at back in July 23, 2015 at 11-04. I'll scroll down there for you so you can see what I'm talking about on 192. Do you see there? Right where my cursor is. I see that. Okay. And so fair to say you would have reviewed Mr. Rivera's note and then signed off on it? That's the general practice. So you see on 189 here where it says psychologist attending note. You're the psychologist attending? Yes. Okay. And it says here, I saw Maya and her mother and reviewed the medical chart. Do you see that? I see that. And that's part of the process I think you just described about how you get involved and work a patient up, correct? Correct. And you also indicate here, I discussed this case with Mr. Rivera. That's Claudio Rivera, the psych intern that you were talking about earlier? Yes. And it appears here as of the date of service, you agreed with the consult assessment and recommendations as outlined. Do you see that? I see that. Okay. Is that a correct statement? Correct. Based on your documentation here, what was the reason for the consultation with the pediatric psychology department there at Lurie's back in July of 2015? Yeah. So what I'm seeing in the note is that the medical psychology consult service was consulted to assess for psychological origin of pain symptoms, specifically conversion disorder. And when you say psychological origin of pain syndromes, what do you mean there? Generally speaking, we're thinking about contributors that are outside of a purely kind of physical contribution to a pain presentation. Okay. Now, looking through here, the history of presenting illness, medical surgical history, allergies, do you know where you would have obtained that information back in 2015 for placement into the chart? Yeah. So generally speaking, the information that is noted in our consultation write-up is generally brought from review of the medical record, interview with the patient, frequently interview with a family or other relevant parties. Would that also include family social history that we see at the bottom of 190? Yes, generally speaking. Question. What is the mental status exam portion of this note? Why is this there? What are you describing? Yeah. So generally speaking, this part of our note includes the outward behavioral observations that were observed at the time of the interview and the assessment, both in a narrative form, as you see at the top, and then in very specific areas as are listed below that. Okay. And in their second sentence, it says here, quote, she was casually dressed in slight of build. And then after that, it says, quote, during the consult, she sat up in a wheelchair with support from her mother prior to being carried to her bed. She lay face down on the bed for the majority of the consult. Do you see that? I see that. What is the clinical significance of placing that entry into the chart? Generally speaking, we just tried to describe the presentation of the patient at the time we did the assessment. And continuing on after that sentence, it says, quote, she presented as distressed at times, which consisted of her moaning. She appeared able to regulate her distress specifically when responding to from the psych consult team. What is being described in this portion of your note? Yeah. So what it looks like Mr. Rivera is describing is that she presented as moaning at times, which we interpreted as distressed. 
Um, but when specific questions or comments were made by our team, she was able to modify, you know, regulate or, or kind of manage that distress at some way. And, and why for a patient like Maya Kowalski, would that be a clinically relevant thing to put into a, a medical job chart? Yes. Yeah, so generally speaking, it meant that, you know, we would include that to indicate that she does have some ability to manage her pain symptoms, or there are perhaps um, periods of our observation of her at which she appeared to be able to manage her pain. And then continuing on with this paragraph, it says, quote, Maya was able to respond to providers without attending to pain symptoms. Do you see that? I see that. To the best of your knowledge, what is Mr. Rivera describing here in this note that you signed off on? Yeah, so what I see there is that when Maya was responding, um, her pain symptoms decreased. Um, I'd like to jump forward a little bit on this note. We've, we've gone through a little bit of the mental status exam, and then we get to the impressions sec section here, which is at the bottom of 191 and then runs over to 192. Impression, you see where it says Maya is a nine-year-old girl who was admitted to LCH for pain and weakness following a transfer from an outside hospital. Do you see that? Yes. And then it says down here DSM-4 diagnoses. That's, um, what is the DSM-4? The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, fourth edition. It is the um, listing of psychiatric diagnoses that was um, standard practice at the time of this consult. Well, I know we're up to DSM-5 now, but back at the time, it seems like we were on DSM-4. Yes, that's correct. What is this DSM-4 diagnosis section here describing on LCH 192? Yeah, so generally speaking, that section describes our um, initial diagnoses at the time of our initial consult. And what were your initial diagnoses as reflected here? Yeah, so on axis one, the diagnosis was psychological factors affecting physical condition, ruling out conversion disorder, ruling out an anxiety disorder, um, no diagnosis indicated at that time for axis two, allergies, asthma, recent onset of pain, numbing weakness generalized to her body on axis three, mild problems with social environment, axis four, and um, a global assessment at axis five of 41 to 50, which is indicative of serious symptoms and functional impairment. Let me take you back to this axis one. Uh, is the diagnosis psychological factors affecting physical condition? That's a, yes, that's a diagnosis. And, and what, what does that mean if, if you're trying to explain this to perhaps a lay juror who doesn't have the level of expertise that you do in this field? Yeah, generally speaking, that indicates that there are psychological um, contributors that are impacting an individual's physical presentation. When it says below what we just talked about, RO conversion disorder, what does that mean? Generally speaking, those are on our differential and things we are continuing to rule in or out, but have not yet. So in other words... So generally it's speaking, it's, it's not a confirmed diagnosis, but it's part of the broader differential um, under consideration. Hasn't been ruled in, hasn't been ruled out yet. As yes. of this. Generally speaking, that's correct. Let me ask you the same question. When it says R slash O anxiety disorder, what, what does that mean? Same thing. Okay. Same as the, the conversion disorder answer. It, it hasn't been ruled, hasn't been, hasn't been ruled in, hasn't been ruled out yet. Generally speaking, yes. Okay. And, and is that part of the reason why the psychiatric team was involved in this workout to, to rule in or out certain things like conversion or anxiety? Yeah, as, as the consult note indicated, it looks like we were consulted to assess for psychological origin or contributors to the pain. And as of this date, do, do you, are you leaning towards a finding that there are some psychological factors that affect the physical condition? That was the diagnosis at the time of that initial consult. And then I, I think you made some recommendations at this point, too. Do you mind describing what those were? Yeah, so I think if you scroll further down in my note, uh, in, in Mr. Rivera's note, it indicates our initial recommendations. Okay, and, and I, I'm looking at that section now, and I think I have it up on screen share. It says, consider rehab model for treatment consultation from RIC. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, so generally speaking, we're looking um, for, we're making a recommendation to the medical team to consider a rehabilitation model. Um, RIC is a rehabilitation center that we frequently partnered with that if indicated 
may sometimes also come and do an independent consultation to see um, if they concur. Is RIC also known as the Rehab Institute of Chicago? Yes. Okay. And uh, when, what, what do you mean by rehab model? What, is, what does that term mean? Yeah, so generally speaking, it's um, a type of treatment that would, uh, I, I, again, it's a little bit outside of my scope of practice because I don't work in a rehab setting, but, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a treatment and intervention model that frequently would have both medical and psychological or psychiatric providers, as well as an emphasis on things like physical therapy or occupational therapy or, or other types of specialized treatments, if indicated for the patient, um, with a function typically on, with, with a focus typically on increasing function. And on the second prong of your recommendations, it says here, continue ongoing assessment for med psych and consider non-pharmacologic interventions for pain management along with parent support. Do you see that? Yes. Can you please explain what Mr. Um, Rivera is describing in that portion of his recommendation section? Sorry. Uh, so he is saying that, you know, we will continue to be involved in the case. Um, and it's for the medical team, the, the attending medical provider to consider, you know, it might be appropriate for us to start to introduce some of these non-pharmacologic interventions um, that might benefit the patient in their pain management and ability to manage and moderate their pain experience. And, and then non-pharmacologic, that just means no medication intervention, am I correct? Yes, it, it indicates, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist, I do not prescribe, so it indicates the types of interventions that are appropriate to our scope of practice. Okay. And then it says down here, med psych, which we just said was you, is in support of consults with art therapy, music therapy, and child life. Do you see that? I do. Why were those three modalities something that um, the med psych team was in support of? Yeah, I don't recall specifically, but generally speaking, we would um, see those types of services as being beneficial if we felt that, you know, additional kind of structure, additional type of um, opportunities for engagement in other services, distractions, scheduling, kind of getting other people involved to help um, provide some assistance to a patient. There's, there's lots of reasons why we might think about those three specifically, um, but generally speaking, um, they're positive, well-received types of interventions for our pediatric patients that can provide structure to their day as well as have a therapeutic um, emphasis that might also be helpful to patients like Maya who um, seem to be experiencing pain. And then the last recommendation prong here, it says consider multidisciplinary team Coordinated, coordinated care conference to provide Maya and family with impressions and treatment recommendations. What is uh, being described in that sentence? Yeah, so generally speaking, um, that would indicate that we felt it might be beneficial just to essentially bring the providers in the room together to talk about our impressions and recommendations and to present that to the family in a joint manner. And so it's not foreign to you at Larice to, to refer to a collection of treating providers as part of a quote team? It is not. No, I'm correct that this is a progress note authored by you on July 22, 2015? Yes. And it says service psychiatry. Uh, one question I had here about you, you're not a psychiatrist, you're a psychologist by trade, I think? Yes. Let's go through this first note here and just kind of dissect it a little bit. You see where it says, quote, our team met with Maya and her mother today in response to consult requests to assess for psychological contributors to Maya's current presentation of symptoms and expressions of pain. I see that. So, Dr. Lowry, can you please describe what you are explaining here in this first sentence in your progress note? Um, so, generally speaking, that first sentence is a reiteration of what we did that day. Okay. Uh, which was essentially what? Um, we, we met with the patient, we met with her mother um, in response to the consult order from our medical peers um, for the purposes of assessing for psychological contributors to the pain presentation. In the next sentence here, you write, quote, Maya endorsed significant pain with physical presentations of moaning, grimacing, and writhing. What are you describing in that portion of your note? 
So that, that appears to me to be a reiteration of what we described um, in more detail in the behavioral observations of the full consult. Okay. You had an opportunity to physically observe this finding as well per your note? Um, per my note, it says our team met with, so. Oh. Are you part of the team? I'm part of the team. Okay. And then you say concurrently, Maya was able to also cease pain expressions entirely track and participate in conversation. What are you describing there? Yeah, so I read my note as um, that Maya was also at times able to present without that um, grimacing, moaning, writhing um, uh, types of, you know, behaviors and was able to appropriately participate in the conversation and the questions that our team asked of her. Why don't we go down to the second paragraph here? Um, where you see where it says our full consult will follow, but our initial impressions at this time suggest that psychological factors could be contributing possibly through maintenance of pain symptoms in response to an initial stressor or physical change. Do you see that? I see that. Um, what are you just, what is, kind of break that sentence down for me and tell me what this sentence means to somebody who might not have a PhD in clinical psychology. Okay, so generally speaking, um, that sentence is essentially a narrative reiteration of our diagnosis that we would we had made in the full consult to follow, that we did think that there were psychological contributors likely um, to her, Maya's pain experience, um, and we weren't sure, so hence the possibly, um, but one way in which sometimes that can present is um, to continue pain symptoms, even if it's in response to a, a physical contribution initially. Can you please summarize what your five recommendations for Maya were as of July 22, 2015? Yes. So our, our first recommendation was, you know, just to support our medical colleagues in continuing to do their workup. Um, of contributions to the pain. Um, the second recommendation, um, consistent with what we've discussed, was our support of considering consults for our, our colleagues in art therapy, music therapy, and child life. The third recommendation, um, as previously discussed, was to consider um, a rehab model for uh, treatment and to consult our colleagues in the rehab space. Our fourth recommendation was to consider, again, kind of bringing the full team together to discuss this diagnosis, these diagnoses, these treatment recommendations with the family. And then the, uh, the fifth recommendation, typo there, um, was that we'll continue essentially to follow along the case with our medical colleagues as long as they, you know, will continue to follow. Uh, and it, it appears there was a first inpatient visit that was conducted uh, and um, the social worker, Ms. Allen here, uh, where my cursor is, says, quote, patient woke up during conversation with mother and became tearful, calling for mother to return to the hospital room. Um, does that seem like it could be something that's significant to a member of a med psych team such as yourself? Yeah, just it, like this statement here, patient woke up during conversation with mother and became tearful, calling for mother to return to the hospital room. Is that something that you encounter frequently with uh, pediatric patients? Um, you know, as, as an isolated statement, it's not particularly meaningful. Um, we work with kids and sometimes kids get upset when their parents are or aren't present. Uh, later on during a second inpatient visit down here, um, you see where it says, quote, patient abruptly stated in voice deeper than regular voice, voice quote, I don't do gymnastics anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later on, the patient stated, I can't be distracted. Distraction doesn't work on me. My question is, this, this reference to distraction, is that um, similar to what you previously described earlier in your testimony? Um, you know, uh, since it wasn't a note from our team, I can't really comment on whether they meant it in the same way that I meant it or not. 167, I believe this to be your second note. Do you see um, the note that I'm talking about here, Dr. Lowry? It's uh, Kelly Lowry, PhD, 723-15-1455. Do you see that? 
I see that. The very end here, it says, you know, you guys are going to try some parenting strategies likely to reduce unintentional reinforcement of pain behaviors. But what does that mean? Um, so generally speaking, there are ways that um, an adult or peer can respond to a pain presentation that has the potential to decrease or increase or maintain pain expressions. And so I read that as generally speaking, we were likely thinking that some of that inter level of intervention might be beneficial. Um, I wanted to sh draw your attention to another note here from, from Lori Allen, the social worker. It's from 72315. Um, there's a section in this note where she, the social worker is indicating that she has accompanied Dr. Byrne and Dr. Whaley for morning rounds. And then um, down here, it says Dr. Byrne explained that patient's pain is psychogenic paren conversion disorder. Do you see that? I see that. Can you please describe or define actually what psychogenic paren conversion disorder and paren means? Yeah, so again, I, I don't want to infer Dr. Burns' work. In your experience as a licensed clinical psychologist, if you see a doctor note, Dr. Byrne explained that patient's pain is psychogenic paren conversion disorder and paren, what does that mean to you as a licensed clinical psychologist? Generally speaking, psychogenic means that there's a, a psychiatric or psychological contribution. Um, and conversion disorder, I, I interpret as we previously discussed and defined. Um, and, and so do you recognize this as your note here? It says on LCH 154, that electronically signed by Kelly Lowry on 72415. I do. It indicates here, I met with the family this afternoon through participation in a multidisciplinary care conference. Am I correct in assuming that was the, the team get together with the family and various providers that you were referencing earlier? I believe so. Quote, in summary, our initial impressions at this time suggest that psychological, psychological factors could be contributing, possibly through maintenance of pain syndrome symptoms in response to an initial stressor or physical change. And again, what are you describing in that, in that clause? So again, that's a, a reiteration of our um, diagnosis of psychological factors affecting physical condition. And it looks like you list out one, two, three, four recommendations for this patient. Uh, do you see those in your note? I see that. How do those recommendations change from your previous recommendations that you documented? I do not believe that they did. It says here, uh, right about where my cursor is, quote, had a care conference with Maya's mother, father via telephone, social work, patient relations, and psychology to discuss the plan of care. Um, is that the multidisciplinary conference that you referenced earlier in your testimony? I believe so. And again, anything we're talking about today is a fresh recollection of this patient specifically, independent from what you may have reviewed in the chart. I do not have independent recollection. It, Dr. Byrne it says here, quote, I discussed with Maya's mother that I believe that there is no organic cause to her symptoms. Do you know what Dr. Byrne is referencing in that portion of, of her addendum? Um, again, you know, I don't, I don't want to interpret her words for her, but um, generally I read that as the medical team has determined that they do not feel that there is a kind of physical contributor to Maya's pain or Maya's presentation of symptoms. Okay. And then it also says here, given her extensive symptoms, recommend intensive multidisciplinary care involving physical therapy, psychology, and pain specialists. Do you see that? I see that. In, in patients similar to Maya, is that the type of treatment modality that you've seen uh, recommended on occasion? Yeah, generally speaking, that seems a, re a consistent or reasonable recommendation. Just so the record's clear, I will be introducing this as an exhibit as well. It's uh, Maya Kowalski's discharge summary from Lurie Children's Hospital. Uh, it's dated um, July 24, 2015. Uh, and it's at LCH 128 through 134. And I believe it is signed by uh, Dr. Byrne on LCH 134. Do you have any role or involvement in preparing a patient's uh, discharge summary, doctor? No. Do you know how Dr. Byrne would have gone through and prepared her discharge summary? 
Not specifically, no. Throughout the discharge summary and elsewhere, and I'll pull up an example on 130 here under neuro, it says um, alert, interactive, intermittently screaming and crying, but distractible with questioning. Do you see that? I see that. Okay. Is that consistent with some of the previous entries you've seen regarding the patient having, you know, some screaming and moaning and crying, but would also be distractible when talking about other topics? That seems consistent. And Dr. Byrne reports patient was seen by child psychology during hospital stay. Do you see that? I see that. Am I correct in assuming that child psychology is you and your department? Correct. And then um, Dr. Byrne says, quote, their opinion as as follows. And she quotes a fairly long passage there. Do you see that long passage? I see that. You recognize the opinions from the child psychology group that appear in this note to be the recommendations that you gave for this patient that we've already previously discussed. Yes. And then towards the end, impression and plan, we're getting towards the end here. Um, Dr. Byrne notes, quote, her exam is not necessarily consistent with her history, which raises concern for a psychiatric component to her presentation and specifically conversion disorder. Do you see that? I see that. And I think we've talked about similar notes in the chart related to this before, correct? Correct. Based on your review of the notes, uh, at issue, um, do you agree or disagree with this impression from Dr. Byrne uh, that I just quoted? So in my review of my records, our diagnosis was um, psychological factors affecting physical condition, and we were still ruling in our out conversion disorder. Um, but we had commented that, that we felt that um, psychological factors were contributing or could be contributing. Hey, one other thing, I'd like to just show you the consent form that the Kowalski, that Maya, Maya's mother signed in this case, um, and see if you recognize it as, as the type of consent form that they use at Lurie's. Uh, I'm going to mark this as an exhibit as well, LCH 152 to 153. Um, have you ever seen a consent to examination and treatment form from uh, Lurie Children's Hospital before, Dr. Lowry? Yes. Okay. Is, is this... What I'm showing you here, the type of consent form that a parent or patient would sign upon uh, admission to Lurry Children's. I'm not, I'm not able to read the entire note, but it appears to be consistent with our consents. Okay. And I see in one portion here, it says, I hereby authorize Lurry Children's and its medical staff to take photographs, video, digital, and other images of me, my child for treatment, education, and research purposes, end quote. Do you see that portion? I see that. Are there times as a, as a clinical psychologist where it might be helpful to take a picture or a video of a child? Um, yeah, there, there might be situations where that would be beneficial. All right. Has anything today, doctor, uh, triggered any recollection uh, outside of the notes that we testified about? Because, um, you know, I typically talk to people about their independent recollection and what they charted. Um, did anything today bring up anything independent? I do not have independent recollection. Maya Kowalski was your patient for a period of time in the summer of 2015, was she not? Um, we were consulted to make an assessment of her. And through the course of this, you spent approximately how long with her, would you say? Oh, Personally. Can we pause for a moment? I don't Less recall. than an hour? I don't recall. Yeah.
Hey, uh, members of the jury, let me turn on the lights. I am told that it actually completes uh, what we're going to be playing of that deposition. So I think this is probably a good time for a break. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Let's try to take a 10-minute break. All right. Everyone can be seated. So everything that was played was actually your designation? Yeah. Uh, there may have been a few here and there that were red, but we'll, we'll take it. So approximately 40 minutes was played. Well, let's check, Judge, we'll that check. they can check the we'll, we'll check, because they did designate some things on our okay. direct. 38 minutes was ours. Tell you what. Why don't I just say 35 minutes and then we're done? That sounds fine. Okay. Uh, how about those four photos? Uh, so there's the more than four, Judge, but I've shown them to Mr. Anderson. My understanding there's no objection. No objection. Okay, um, Let, let's uh, be, get them in evidence. I'm going to put them in evidence, Judge, to be, and to be clear, uh, we need the second page that has the date. Uh, I understand. Okay. Uh, no objection on that. Okay. All right, Judge, so do you want just to announce for the... Record. Sure. Okay, ready? It's perfect. Okay, 30, it, uh, they're, they all are part of 3232, but then there's four digits afterwards identifying the vote. So 3232 0962, 3232 and 32320439 and 0440 32320354 0355 32320355 32320355 32320365 0366. Okay, the court receives into evidence uh, all of the exhibit 3232 pages 0365 through 0366, 0345 through 0346, 0354 through 0355, 0439 through 0440. 0810 through 0811 and 0962. Did I get all that right, Madam Clerk? And, and to be clear, Judge, those aren't all photographs. The second page is the date, so that's why there's two pages to some of them. Okay, anything else before we take our break? Nothing we have planned. Let's try to keep it to 10 minutes. All right, let's go in recess.
Okay, please be seated, everyone. Are we ready for to bring in the jury? Please, so, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Let's bring in the jury. Okay, please be seated, everyone. <clears throat> Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. Right. And you've had no contact uh, with anyone about this case. Is that correct? Correct. Right. And uh, you haven't seen any media coverage about this case? Correct. Right. Okay. Well, Mr. Hunter, your next witness, please. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. The police court, the defense calls Dr. Elliot Crane. Yes, I do. Come this way. Please, Uh Good morning. Good morning. Uh, would you tell us your name, please, sir? Elliot Crane. And uh, what is your occupation, Dr. Crane? I'm a physician. And where do you presently practice your profession? Actually, I retired on May 1st, but prior to that, Stanford University at the uh, in the School of Medicine. Okay. Um, and you retired, when was it, May 1st? May the 1st. Okay. And uh, tell us, if you would, please, sir, where you received your background, where your education and training to become a physician. Uh, I went to medical school at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, graduating in 1977. And from there I did uh, pediatric residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Following that, an anesthesiology residency at the same hospital. And then a fellowship in pediatric anesthesia and critical care medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. And that was all finishing um, at the end of 1983. Are those programs at Massachusetts General and Boston Children's affiliated with Harvard? Yes, they are. And um, did you become board certified? Yes, I did. And would you tell the jury what specialties you became board certified in? Uh, first in pediatrics in, uh, and then anesthesiology. Both of those were in 1985. And, um, and then in subsequent years in, uh, well, also not long after that in pediatric critical care medicine, intensive care medicine. And then after that uh, in pediatric anesthesiology, once that specialty board was established, which wasn't for a few years, and also pain, med pain medicine. And where have you, what have you focused your practice on over the last few decades? 
initially it was uh, in 1984. It was a combination of pediatric anesthesiology and pediatric critical care medicine. And it wasn't long after that, about 1985, my interest began to shift to pediatric pain management. And uh, that grew as pediatric critical care shrunk. And then um, it's been largely pediatric pain, medic, pain medicine for the last uh, 20, 25 years. Okay. And uh, where have you had occasion to practice your profession? After my fellowship training, the first place that I went to work was at uh, the University of Washington, practicing, that was my academic appointment, practicing at the Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, and then about 11 years later, I was recruited to go down to Stanford University, which had a new children's hospital, to be the chief of pediatric anesthesiology and to establish a pediatric anesthesiology group there. And did you do that? I did. Okay. And did there come a point at which you established a pediatric pain clinic at Stanford University? Yeah, we set up the pain clinic not long after I arrived at Stanford in 1994. And, um, and it was a small clinic to begin with, and it grew rapidly over time. Okay. Um, tell us what the, the focus and scope of the pain clinic at Stanford has been over the past 20-some-odd years, 30-some-odd years. Well, at the beginning, it was a day a week, and then it was two days a week and three days a week, and it wasn't long before it was five days a week. Uh, now we're seeing oh, maybe 11,000 appointments a year. So it's become quite busy. It's a multidisciplinary clinic. So we have on staff um, pediatric uh, pain medicine specialists. Right now there's seven of them. And uh, pediatric psychologists, also seven. We have pe pediatric uh, psychology postdoctoral students, uh, four or five of those. Uh, uh, physical therapists. And then we also uh, work with occupational therapists and uh, child psychiatry. And uh, as of 2000, let's say 2016 and 2017, what was your role at that point? At that point, um, let's see, that was seven, eight years ago, right? So uh, at that point, I was, I'm just trying to, um, yeah, so at, at that point, I had pretty much stopped doing pediatric anesthesiology. It was limited to maybe two days a month. And not long after that, I stopped altogether. And uh, the rest of my practice was devoted entirely to pain medicine for children. Okay. And it does, did at that time, and, and since you've been involved in it, has the pediatric pain clinic at Stanford dealt with pediatric chronic regional pain syndrome? Complex regional pain syndrome, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I mis mis mispronunciated it. Um, to what extent have you been involved in the treatment, in the, in the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of pediatric complex regional pain syndrome? To what extent? Well, we see probably um, at the present maybe 100 new cases a year, about two a week, I would say, some weeks more. And uh, we work together as a team, so it isn't as if one physician kind of uh, owns a patient, we, we, uh, uh, we share the care of the patient, so I've been involved with all of those patients over the last several decades. Okay. And what other types of pain syndromes does the pediatric pain clinic at Stanford uh, treat? We see a little bit of acute pain, so sometimes surgeons will send kids to us postoperatively if they're struggling with their pain management, but primarily it's chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain being um, defined as pain that's lasted longer than three months, usually past the healing of whatever initiated it. So we see, um, we see a wide spectrum of pain problems. Our referrals come from orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, urologic surgeons, pediatricians, uh, oncologists. So we see cancer pain. We see a lot of, I'd say complex regional pain syndrome is one of our most common, maybe the most common diagnoses. Fibromyalgia, chronic headaches, migraine headaches, chronic uh, abdominal pain, especially functional abdominal pain, limb pain disorders. We see kids with congenital birth defects, congenital anomalies that, is, that are associated with pain, 
uh, even benign tumors such as um, fibromatosis can be associated with pain. So basically, like all of those patients. Uh, do you also have occasion to deal with patients who have psychogenic pain syndromes? It's not exactly the term I would use. We, we have patients whose pain is primarily manifestation of a psychological process. We call that somatoform pain. It's not unlike uh, patients, well, I'll put it this way, there's, there's a number of functional disorders, so, uh, such as uh, migraine headaches would be considered a functional disorder. In other words, it's functional in the sense that there's no brain tumor or brain infection or anything like that causing the headache, uh, so the child's functional in that sense. There's also functional abdominal pain where the patient has significant abdominal pain, they go to a gastroenterologist, they get a full workup, they get endoscopy, colonoscopy perhaps, nothing is found. They refer the patient to us so they have a totally functional GI tract, but they have pain. The pain is not in their head, so that's not really psychogenic pain, but we do have patients who present with pain that's not obvious from any other source or maybe amplified pain, where we know that they have pain from some discrete source, but it's amplified to a much higher degree than one would expect it to be. And uh, we call that somatoform pain. Okay. During the course of your practice, have you had occasion to contribute to the medical literature regarding pediatric chronic pain? Yes. And, and to what extent have you done that? I can't give you the number of publications. Um, there are book chapters I've written, uh, or edited one book and written one book on, on chronic pain, and uh, m many articles, but I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. And of course, I've, I've lectured dozens and dozens of lectures around the world on the management of different types of chronic pain. Have you lectured on the subject of chronic, of, of uh, complex regional pain syndrome? The yes, I have. Setting? Yes, I have. And how, how often have you done that? Do you have any, have any estimate? Well, um, there's one to 200 lectures that I've given over the years, some on chronic pain including complex regional pain syndrome, some exclusively on complex regional pain syndrome. And uh, there are a number of videos that I've, that I've made on the subject of CRPS in children. Okay. Uh, have you had occasion to serve as an editor or reviewer for various um, medical journals? Yes, I've, I've been uh, an editor of a journal that, that's an online journal called Children, a medical journal, and I'm a reviewer for many, many uh, scholarly journals, uh, such as Pain, the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, Anesthesia and Analgesia, Anesthesiology, Pediatrics, the Journal of Pediatrics, and others. Okay. Uh, you've been kind enough to give us a copy of your curriculum vitae or your resume. Um, the indication is that your bibliography includes um, 79 peer-reviewed articles. Does yes, that sir. sound correct? That's about right. Okay. And what, what is a peer-reviewed article? A peer-reviewed article is uh, a, an article that's, or a manuscript that's written up to uh, report the results of research or to summarize a subject that's then sent to a journal and peer-reviewed. Peer-reviewed means that it's sent out uh, anonymously to two or three or four experts in the field internationally, they review the article, they give it a thumbs up or they give it a thumbs down or they give it a maybe with uh, that they'll accept it with alterations or modifications, then it goes under a revision and then it's resubmitted, etc., until it's finally approved by the peers and then by the editor of the journal. Okay. Uh, doctor, at my request, have you reviewed uh, probably more, more materials than you wanted to regarding this case of Maya Kowalski? I have. And I'm going to read from a list of materials that, that, you've, that you've told me you've reviewed. I, I just want you to let the jury know that you've done that. I will. Um, have you reviewed the records of Tampa General Hospital regarding Ms. Kowalski? Yes. The records of All Children's Hospital regarding Maya Kowalski? Yes. The records of Lurie Children's Hospital? Yes. Dr. John Wozenauer's records? Correct. Dr. Kirkpatrick's records? Yes. Dr. Hanna's records? Yes. The records of agility, PT, and sports performance? Yes. The Eagles Wing uh, rehabilitation records? Or? 
records of I believe so. Yes. Um, the uh, records of the Sarasota County School Board. Don't remember if I've reviewed those actually. Okay. Have you reviewed Dr. James Lewis's report? Yes. And the report of Dr. Chopra? Yes. Dr. Sally Smith's evaluation? Yes. Uh, dot the, the evaluations of both Maya and Beata Kowalski by Tashana Duncan? Correct. Uh, and then the depositions of uh, Mr. Kowalski? Yes. Dr. Elliot? Dr. Elliot, yes. Uh, Dr. Wozenauer? Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hannah? Yes. And I, I think I asked you if you reviewed his records. Um, have you reviewed Dr. Hinchke's records? I don't remember. Um, who's he again? Hinchke. Hinchke. Psychiatrist? Yes. Uh, have you reviewed the depositions of Drs. Hannah, Revivo, and Santana Rojas? Yes. And uh, the depositions of Dr. Cantu, uh, as well as that of, uh, well, Dr. Cantu. Yes. Okay. Um, are there other records that you that you've reviewed regarding the case? Yes, there are some. Um, blog entry, en entries by. Maya's mother, and some emails from Maya's mother to herself, and um, let's see what else. Photographs, some photographs of Maya at different times of her life. Okay. All right. Uh, let me backtrack a bit, if I can, and just ask you some general questions regarding complex regional pain syndrome and some of the other syndromes that bring us together today. Yep. Um, Tell us, tell the jury, if you would, what chronic regional pain syndrome is from the standpoint of someone who treats that condition in your specialty. Complex regional pain syndrome. I'm sorry, what did I say? I'm, chronic. I'm sorry, chronic. complex That's regional okay. pain syndrome. A lot of people do that because it is a chronic regional pain syndrome. So complex regional pain syndrome means what the words say. It's complex. It's complicated. The, uh, the cause of it is not known. There are several hypotheses, but over the last decades, we still haven't nailed down exactly what the primary cause is. There's probably a genetic vulnerability that leads to it. It's regional in that it affects a region of the body. Typically, in children, a leg. Typically, in adults, it's an arm, which is mainly a factor of what kids are doing versus what adults are doing. Kids are running around soccer fields and football fields and baseball fields and, and, uh, and have um, leg injuries very commonly, twisted ankles, for example. Whereas adults don't do that, but they'll oftentimes trip and fall and break their fall with an outstretched arm and that will start it off. It usually follows a rather trivial injury, like a sprain. Uh, it can obviously follow a more significant injury, like a broken bone. Sometimes it follows surgery. It affects, initially, one limb of the body, the body that has had the sprain or the operation or the fall or what have you. And uh, it, be it begins at some point after that injury occurs. I have a colleague who's an orthopedic surgeon who gets CRPS uh, repetitively. He's, a, he's an outdoor runner. He's a trail runner. So he's frequently stepping in gopher holes or snake holes and twisting his ankle. And what he tells me is that he all right, um, I'll skip past that. Um, so at some point in time, it can be days or a week or two after the injury occurs, the pain shifts from the pain of uh, the injury, a twist or ankle or what have you, to what we call neuropathic pain, which is pain that has its origins in the nervous system. Oftentimes, by that point in time, the, the, uh, the, the original injury is, is healing. And uh, the, the pain is very different than the kind of throbbing deep pain of a, of a broken bone or a, a twisted ankle. It, the pain moves to the surface of the limb, the skin, which has a burning quality. It becomes exquisitely sensitive to touch, even the lightest touch, such as pulling a garment of clothes over that skin, is so excruciating the child can't do it. Uh, they can't sleep with bed sheets over their, their affected leg. They sleep with their leg either dangling off the bed or on top of the bed sheets. And then there's 
physical findings associated with it as well, as well as the symptoms the child's reporting. Uh, very specific physical findings. This goes on uh, for a length of time until treatment begins. And, and what, in your experience, is the, well, first of all, you've described for us how many cases or a, 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 an estimate of how many cases the pain clinic at Stanford has seen in the pediatric setting. How frequently does this disease occur in pediatric, in pediatric patients? Well, most pediatricians will never see a case in their entire career, so it's, it's that infrequent. Uh, consequently, most pediatricians are, aren't even aware of it or, or don't know what to do with it. Typically, they'll, somebody comes in with this exquisite limb pain and they'll send the child to an orthopedic surgeon. And most orthopedic surgeons are aware of this problem because it occurs in their practice. And then they'll send the patient on to a pain clinic. Uh, sometimes uh, it's seen by a physical medicine rehabilitation specialist, uh, sometimes a neurologist. So um, it, the frequency is not really known. It's probably on the order of one in 100,000 children that get this. But as I said, it's, it's so infrequent that most pediatricians aren't aware of it and will never see it in their lifetime. How is it that your clinic sees that many patients if it occurs that infrequently? Well, there's what, something like 50 million people or 45 million people in the state of California. We're the only multidisciplinary pain clinic in the state of California the fullest service pain clinic, so we get referrals from all over the state, as well as from neighboring states, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and as far away as uh, the East Coast. We've had patients come to us from Virginia, Boston, Pennsylvania, and we've had patients come to us internationally from various countries in South America, Australia, New Zealand, England, for example. Okay. Uh, we, 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 we get patients from all over because of the reputation that we have. Uh, and, and to what extent, well, within the universe of pediatric complex regional pain patients, how many present with so-called whole body CRPS? None. <clears throat> Nobody does. And why is that? Because, as I said, it's, it starts in a limb. It's a regional pain syndrome. It can, in some cases, spread, and it does spread. Uh, but not right away, not early in the disease. Usually it's after months or actually more like years. It can, it can affect the, uh, the, the opposite limb. It can spread proximally. It can affect an arm. So it can spread, but it, it typically spreads to other limbs. It doesn't spread to other parts of the body. I can't say why that is, but that's certainly the case. What is the, the recognized treatment in your experience uh, for pediatric complex regional pain syndrome? The most important, the foundation of treatment, the kind of treatment without which it will not get better, is physical therapy and occupational therapy. Occupational therapy is a little bit different than physical therapy, um, even though the child doesn't have an occupation, it's still what it's called. But a combination of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and psychotherapy by a qualified psychologist. Those are the fundamental things that will make it better. Everything else, we do other things, of course, but everything else that we do for CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, is only useful in as much as it supports physical therapy and occupational therapy. So for example, if the child cannot tolerate physical therapy because their limb is so painful, we might add medications to reduce the pain. We can't eliminate the pain, but we can reduce the pain. You might do a nerve block to put that limb to sleep, which is effective for a limited period of time. We can't block the nerve for weeks or months, but we can for days to get the kids started in physical therapy. So the other things that we might do uh, are only useful in as much as they facilitate the practice of physical therapy, without which we can't make patients better. Is there a role for uh, ketamine in the treatment of pediatric chronic complex regional pain syndrome? We do use ketamine at Stanford. There's a number of places around the country, a small number of places around the country, that use low-dose ketamine in children. There are still many, if not most, children's hospitals, if they have a pain service, uh, restrict the use of ketamine to the intensive care unit environment in any dose. Uh, we have a more liberal hospital, and we were able to convince them that using low-dose ketamine outside the intensive care unit is safe. And it's something that we reserve for refractory cases that we cannot make better after a full court press, which would be intensive physical therapy 
every day for weeks, typically 10 or 12 weeks, psychotherapy every day for the same period of time, and using all the drugs that we have on the shelf that are to some degree effective in CRPS. If those things don't work, uh, we will then put the child in the hospital for a five to seven day ketamine infusion, but as I said, it's a low dose ketamine infusion in contrast to what was used in Maya. Okay. Uh, while we're on that subject, what it, can, you, can you define for the jury a low dose as opposed to a, a higher dose? Our ceiling maximum dose is a milligram per kilogram per hour, which we've only used in one patient over the last decades. Typically, we start at about 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram per hour, and we increase the dose every six or eight hours uh, by 0.1 milligram per kilogram per hour until we reach a dose which is effective in reducing pain or a dose at which unacceptable side effects occur. Uh, or a dose at which sedation occurs. And then that becomes our ceiling. So typically our dose is going to be in the range of 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram per hour, except for that one patient in whom we had to go to one. We, the jury, I think, has heard the term anesthetic dose of ketamine. What yes. is that? In anesthetic, at, at, ketamine, you have to realize, is a drug that has traditionally, conventionally been used as a general anesthetic. You can put somebody to sleep, and operate on them with ketamine. The dose that is necessary is a, a starting dose of about one to two milligrams per kilogram given intravenously. So that would be about, about um, 27 milligrams to 50 milligrams in somebody the size that Maya was back then. In an adult, it would be 70, 100, 150 maybe milligrams. And then about three milligrams per kilo per hour will keep them asleep in order to do an operation. So you can take somebody's appendix out at three milligrams per kilogram per hour. Okay. Now, how does that compare with the dosages that were used in this case uh, by doctors Kirkpatrick and Hannah? Objection. Do you remember the question? <laughs> How does it compare to the doses that uh, Kirkpatrick and Hannah used? Yes, sir. Please, please, uh, Kirkpatrick sir. started um, around, I think, a milligram per kilogram per hour, and over four days ramped it up to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour. I don't remember what Hannah's starting dose was, but it was significantly, substantially higher and, uh, and went up even higher and higher still so that by October of 2016, he was using doses in the range of 25 to 30 milligrams per kilogram per hour, 10 times the typical anesthetic dose for a patient. Okay. Um, going back, well, let me, let me ask you to focus on the period of time between September 23rd, 2015, when the patient first saw Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Patrick and the time that she came to All Children's Hospital. Um, can you describe the course of her therapy and, and disease during that year? Uh, yeah, I... I the... the the course that she demonstrated was 
one of uh, uh, perpetual reports of severe intolerable pain, weakness, inability to use her limbs, inability to uh, bring her ankle back to a neutral normal position where the foot is about 90 degrees to the, to the foreleg. And, and a behavior that was uh, often described as a screaming type of behavior, uh, which was attributed by her or her mother and her doctors to severe pain. And that there was an undulating course and that there were episodes in which, or ep ep times periods in which uh, her pain seemed to be less and then severe pain again, and then less, and then severe pain. But it, overall, if you look at the entire landscape from uh, September of 2015 or summer of 2015 until the fall of 2016, you'd have to say that she was no better, in fact, getting a lot worse. Was there any difference in function as far as the patient was concerned during those two dates, as far as you could determine? When her function was, was much worse by the time October 2016 came around and she was admitted to All Children's Hospital. She, she said that she could not um, move her limbs, she could not lift them against gravity off a of bed. She had, serious, she had significant pain so that she would be screaming and pain would not tolerate anybody touching her. Her mother would not allow anybody to touch her because of the pain that would, would occur. Uh, going back, if we could, to the point of uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick's initial involvement in September of 2015 and the, the therapy that he offered, uh, do you have an opinion that you can state within a reasonable degree of medical probability whether the treatment he offered was within the standard of care for the treatment of pediatric complex regional pain syndrome in this country? It was, it, it was not within the standard of care. And why is that? As I said earlier, ketamine is reserved in our institution nationwide for patients whose pain is refractory and unresponsive to the fundamental treatment, which is, as I said and will repeat, intensive physical therapy, physical therapy, advancing to, advanced, advancing to intensive physical therapy if necessary, occupational therapy, psychotherapy, drug management, as an outpatient, oral drug management, his first treatment was was ketamine. So it was, at the very least, it was very, very premature. In addition, the way that he administered ketamine, which was in significant doses, was a violation of the standard of care in terms of his record keeping. There are specific, recommend, not recommendations or guidelines, there were specific ways that records need to be kept during uh, as, uh, anesthetic type infusion as, as, he, as he administered to Maya. And remember that going up to two and a half milligrams per kilogram is virtually a general anesthetic. His record keeping was, was it was just terrible. It, it was uh, skeletal minimal at best in terms of measuring vital signs and recording level of consciousness. It, that is to say, it violated the standard of care for an anesthesiologist. Was there any harm to Maya Kowalski as a result of this? There was no harm to there was no harm to Maya in in terms of specifically receiving the ketamine. Fortunately, she didn't have any complications from it. And not surprisingly, her pain reports were diminished after ketamine because ketamine is not only just uh, a great analgesic, it also has psychiatric effects, which you may be aware of. You may know that ketamine is being used more and more frequently by psychiatrists to, pre to, to treat depression and anxiety, which isn't to say that that's what she had, but only to say that there are emotional slash psychiatric effects of ketamine. So in that sense, she was no worse. But I would say the harm that was done was that instead of being referred to a center that knows how to take care of pediatric CRPS, he went ahead and administered uh, ketamine, and then when that really didn't work, it didn't provide sustained benefit, he referred her to Mexico. And that's another story that you'll probably get into, I suppose, with your questioning. But I think the important damage that was done was in denying Maya effective therapy for CRPS, and we're assuming this is what she had, 
at that time, because if she had CRPS and if she had effective therapy for it at her age, I would have expected her to improve and recover in a matter of weeks, and that wasn't done. And, and that's something I hadn't asked you before, before I go to Dr. Cantu. Uh, was, there, uh, what, was there an adequate trial of alternative therapy before the ketamine was given? There was not. And um, if there had been, if, if, if you compare what might have been, so to speak, if, if the, the program pursued was similar to your clinic, what is the outcome that, that, is, that is expected or anticipated for a child such as this receiving standard of care therapy? Maya, I think, was about 10 years old at the time. And I would say that 10-year-old girls, and I say girls because it's about seven or eight times more common in, in females than in males. So almost all of our patients are females who have CRPS. And we don't know why that is. but. Ten-year-old girls with CRPS are our favorite population to take care of with CRPS. Why? Because they're the easiest to take care of, they recover the fastest, and they don't recur. Of all the kids we've taken care of, we've never had a recurrence of CRPS in a child whom we've treated at the age of 10 or 11 or 12. As kids get older, it becomes more difficult to treat, more challenging, and as children advance through adolescence, their teen years into their young adult years, it begins more and more to uh, take on the pattern of adult CRPS, which is a much more difficult condition to treat. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Dr. Cantu's treatment. Uh, can you describe for the jury your perception of what it con consisted of? His was called ketamine coma. At, I would call, well, it was coma in the sense that a patient on the kind of doses that Cantu uses is going to be unresponsive, unconscious. In other words, under general anesthesia. So it's not really coma, but he's giving general anesthetic doses. So the patient is under general anesthesia for the five days of his infusion, which starts at three milligrams per kilogram per hour and advances day by day to a higher dose. I think the highest dose that Maya received was five milligrams per kilogram per hour, maybe six. Those doses result in, in complete general anesthesia, or coma, which I don't think is a correct term to use in that instance. For that reason, Dr. Cantu has to treat the patient as if they're under a general anesthetic, which is what we do in the operating room, except that he's doing it in an intensive care unit, which is a good environment for that. The patient is intubated, that is, they have a breathing tube placed into their mouth, down their windpipe. It's attached to a mechanical ventilator to breathe for the patient, because they won't breathe adequately on their own. They have to place a, a tube in the stomach, either to decompress it or to provide nutrition, which was done in Maya's case. Uh, so they are basically under a prolonged general anesthetic for five days. Is there, uh, well, is that treatment, in your experience and based on your background and training, uh, within the standard of care for an anesthesiologist providing care for pediatric complex regional pain syndrome in the United States. It is not. It is not within the standard of care, and that's why it's not done anywhere in the United States. Uh, let's move on. Did, did, it, did it appear to you, based on the review of the records that you saw and the depositions you reviewed, uh, did it appear that the treatment rendered by Dr. Cantu in Mexico was successful in any sense of the word? It wasn't successful in the sense that any benefit that she realized was not sustained over a significant period of time. So within four or five or six weeks, she was reporting an increase in pain. And that's in contrast to the patients that we have experience with and other places have experience with in the United States with low-dose ketamine, low-dose being one-tenth the amount that Dr. Cantu used, in which the benefit in CRPS is sustained over several months. Okay. Um, now let's talk about the, 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 the care that, well, let me back up. Uh, after seeing Dr. Cantu, uh, this patient was seen by Dr. Hanna, correct? Correct. And 
describe for the jury what Dr. Hanna's course of treatment consisted of. Dr. Hanna saw Maya from December of 2015, about a month, month and a half after she returned from Mexico, until he sent her to All Children's Hospital October the 7th of 2016, so over a period of nearly a year. His, his treatment involved giving Hannah infusions of ketamine over several days each time, over four days each time, in ever-increasing doses. So he started off using doses similar to what Dr. Cantu finished with, and because she kept coming back over and over and over again with increasing complaints of pain and no improvement, according to his notes, she continued to have dystonia of her feet, allodynia, which is this exquisite pain with light touch of the skin, etc. He kept giving her higher and higher and higher doses. How did that finish? How did, how did Dr. Hanna's treatment finish in October of 2016? Because of the excessive doses of ketamine, she was losing weight. She had lost appetite. Her weight had fallen. She was not on her growth curve. Not only had she not, not only had she stopped gaining weight as children do as they grow, she had started losing weight. She was at the first percentile, which means that 99% of children of her age weighed more than she did. Uh, and she had terrible abdominal pain. And that was one reason that he sent her to the emergency room at All Children's was because of the abdominal pain. And she had had some episodes of abdominal pain associated with these high doses of ketamine prior to that time. So it was something that had been getting worse and worse. It did, was Dr. Hanna's therapy of Maya Kowalski successful? It was not, in the sense that it was necessary to send her to All Children's Hospital. I think at, the, at that point in October, he just... He could not bring himself to give her more ketamine. He knew that the ketamine dose that he was giving was, was so high, he just couldn't imagine giving more. And at, at, he, at that point, he bailed out and sent her to All Children's Hospital. Did Dr. Hanna's care and treatment of Maya Kowalski comply with the standard of care for an anesthesiologist treating complex regional pain syndrome in the pediatric setting in this country? Objection, foundation, predicate, beyond scope, false word. Again, it did not. And it did not because of several factors. The one most glaring factor is the dose of ketamine that he was using in the way he was using it. And during the infusions, uh, as is the, was the case with Dr. Kirkpatrick, she was inadequately monitored and there was inadequate, inadequate recording of her her, the safety of this, vital signs, etc. He was giving anesthetic doses and yet was not recording things as an anesthesiologist should, documenting safety. Was there injury or harm to Maya Kowalski as a result of the course of therapy that Dr. Hanna pursued? No objection. Over and I would add that would ask, I would ask that within a reasonable degree of medical probability. There was harm. The harm was, as I said, that she was developing complications, uh, weight loss, loss of appetite, etc., from the ketamine therapy. At least I think it was from the ketamine therapy. There was no other obvious or possible cause for that except the high-dose ketamine. She had no other reason to be losing weight. And also because, as was the case with Dr. Kirkpatrick, he denied her the opportunity for effective therapy for CRPS, if that's indeed what she had. Okay. Uh, now, let's shift gears, if we can, to the patient's admission to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital on or about October 7th of 2016. Have you reviewed the entire record of that of that hospitalization? Yes, I have. Um, do you have an opinion that you can express to us within a reasonable degree of medical probability with respect to whether the care that was rendered to Maya Kowalski during that admission complied with the standard of care for hospitals and physicians taking care of pediatric complex regional pain syndrome 
in the United States. Overbroad, the Onsco Foundation predicate. Yes, I do have an opinion, and my opinion is that they did comply with the standard of care. Would you explain the basis for your opinion, if you would, please? Sir? Well, there was so much done. I'll have to. There were so many things that were done for Maya in the hospital that I have to address some of them individually. First of all, uh, she came to the emergency room the, with a complaint of abdominal pain. The emergency room physician. Um, noticed immediately that her symptoms did not uh, correspond to her physical examination, so there was a big discrepancy there. And of course, she came with a history of getting these huge infusions of ketamine, with which they had no experience. I've never heard of infusions of ketamine that high. And they realized that some of the symptoms that she may be manifesting were a complication of that ketamine therapy in some way or another, and it was necessary to hospitalize her. Uh, if, if for no other reason to effectively treat the pain that she was reporting, but also to deal with this enormous dose of ketamine, uh, what they were going to do with it, and to treat the pain and disability that she was manifesting. In the intensive care unit, they needed to put her back on a ketamine infusion. You might wonder why they were doing that when I said it wasn't an effective therapy for her, and that's because she had become physically dependent and tolerant of ketamine. The fact that she could still be awake on 13 milligrams per kilogram per hour of ketamine tells you that she had become incredibly tolerant, she become unresponsive to the ketamine, which was, I suppose, the basis for Dr. Hannah to keep ramping up the dose, which is a violation of the rule of what I call the rule of holes, which is when you're in a hole, stop digging. He kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper and making her more and more and more and more dependent, physically dependent on ketamine. A uh, common term for that would be addiction, but it's not really quite what I would call an addiction, but certainly major physical dependency and tolerance. So they needed to put her in an intensive care unit to take her down from ketamine in a controlled fashion, to wean her from ketamine to prevent over ketamine withdrawal, which would have been a very unpleasant thing for her. At that point, they still needed to keep her in the hospital. Her evaluation wasn't complete. And that also, while she was in the intensive care unit, they began to develop concern for the fact that uh, Beata, her mother, was saying that she was going to take her out of the hospital and take her back to Dr. Nelhana. Members of the jury, you're going to disregard the last comment that the witness made. Mr. Hunter, you may continue. Yes, Ron. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you some specific questions about this, if I could, Doctor. Uh, first of all, was it reasonable for the physicians and staff at Johns Hopkins All Children's to attempt to wean Maya off of the medications that she had been getting? Yes, it was. And, and tell us why that would be. As I said, she, she had come from Dr. Hanna's office after an infusion, a very high dose of ketamine. Uh, she was physically dependent on it by history, and it was necessary to wean her from ketamine in a controlled fashion over days to prevent her from having withdrawal symptoms. Uh, um, was, was it reasonable? Well, let me ask you this. What, was it reasonable for them to attempt to transfer this patient to a facility more able to deal with her complex regional pain syndrome? That wouldn't have been the priority at that point in time. 
but ultimately it would have been appropriate to transfer her to a center that knew how to take care of complex regional pain syndrome in children. Okay. And the priority at that point in time would have been to do the weaning and, and Correct. take care of the, the acute problem. Yes. Okay. Um, as the treatment at Johns Hopkins All Children's proceeded, uh, was it reasonable for them to attempt to treat, well, strike that, let me back up. Uh, what would have been the appropriate treatment of this child at that time at Johns Hopkins All Children's or at any other institution that was similarly situated? You can't treat without a diagnosis. Uh, it was, I think, clear to them after the pain management consultation that she didn't have complex regional pain syndrome. They needed to determine exactly what was causing the problems that was causing that were causing her symptoms. The um, what were the other possibilities that might be considered in in the diagnosis on this patient at that time? The important thing to realize is that the symptoms that Maya and her mother. Objection sustained. Um, let me just ask a question this way, Doctor. Um, you saw, well, did, did you see in the records that there had been a, uh, that, that the initial diagnosis uh, upon admission was uh, complex regional pain syndrome? I don't know if you're referring to the note from the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit resident, uh, which it, it didn't exactly say that. It was number one. I think it said something like CRPS, di CRPS diagnosed by outside person or institution. By history. Something like that, right? That's not the same as saying she has CRPS. Okay. Um, do you have it? And, and as time went on, that diagnosis by history remained in the chart, correct? Yes, it did. Okay. Do you have an opinion with respect to whether this child had, at that time or even today, a chronic re a complex regional pain syndrome? Today I can't answer, of course, because I haven't seen my, I don't, haven't read any very recent reports of how she's doing, but um, I didn't I see. Hear, I can't hear the witnesses. Can you get a little bit closer to the microphone? Yes, I'm sorry. I said I can't comment on today, but I didn't see anything consistent with the diagnosis of CRPS, except the report of pain, as just pain, But because there's a lot of things that cause pain, of course, but 
including CRPS, but I didn't see anything to suggest to me that she had CRPS at any point in her history. Do you have any opinion regarding what her diagnosis was during the time she was at uh, Johns Hopkins yeah, Children's question. Hospital? Uh, sustained as phrase. What were the alternative diagnoses that a physician such as yourself? Hold on a second. Would Doctor, let's, let's talk about the, the chronic regional pain opinion you just expressed. Why do you say that there was not a diagnosis that, that, that why do you say that, that CRPS was not the diagnosis at this time? Number of By reasons. At this time, I mean at the time of admission and during admission. Well, looking at her history, she. That one's allowed. Shall we continue? Yes, go ahead. Well, looking at her history, she didn't present as a patient with, with CRPS, and she didn't meet the um, usual criteria that we use for diagnosing CRPS. Can you explain that, please? There was a, um, a meeting that was held in Budapest in the late 1990s, I think. It was a meeting of the um, Neuropathic Pain Interest Group of the International Association for the Study of Pain, and they established specific criteria for the diagnosis, to make the diagnosis of CRPS. And she did not meet those criteria. In, in, in what respect? The, uh, the, the criteria include uh, features on a physical examination, which are differences in the temp temperature of the affected limb to other limbs. It's, cold, it's generally colder. Color changes, generally speaking, blue-purple color. In the very earliest phases of CRPS, it can be red, overperfused, but generally speaking, the limb is cold and blue or purple. Uh, there are secondary changes to the skin and hair growth, and there are motor, motor abnormalities, such as uh, tremors or dystonia. And the most important, well, one of the most important diagnostic criteria, and the final one, is they list criteria for symptoms reported by the patient, A, B, C, and D, and then physical examination features that are seen by a physician, A, B, C, and D. And the final di diagnostic criteria is these things cannot be explained by another diagnosis. And that's important. So if there's another diagnosis that can explain the cluster of symptoms and signs, then it's not CRPS. During the period of time between September of 2015 and the patient's admission to all children's in October of 2016, was there ever any definitive effort to rule out, that you could tell from the records, to rule out other diagnoses as a cause for her symptoms and her presentation? Yeah, she's the extent of strays into the area. You can answer that right now. She had been seen with this cluster of, a cluster of symptoms at, Tacoma General, uh, at uh, Tampa General Hospital, at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, and Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in Tampa. Are you referring to 2015? Yeah. 
in 2015. Each of those institutions, independently of each other, said that it, it was not CRPS and, and noted that there were very significant discrepancies between the symptoms that she was reporting and their physical examination findings. So the, the coming to a diagnosis when faced with that is a slow process that takes, that requires a long period of observation in order to decide exactly what's going on. But what was going, well, we know that there was no organic reason for what was happening at, that, at any of those points in time. And it wasn't CRPS. But actually, nailing down the diagnosis, it, it takes time and lots of observation and lots of hypotheses. During that period, from September of 2015 to October of 2016, did the records and materials that you reviewed indicate any effort on the part of Drs. Hanna or Kantu or Kirkpatrick to reconcile their diagnosis of CRPS with the diagnoses that were either made or suspected by the physicians at Lurie Children's and Tampa General and All Children's? Neither Kirkpatrick nor Hanna reviewed the records from Tampa General and Lurie Children's Hospital, as far as we can tell. They certainly didn't make any note of it in their records. If they had, I think they might have begun to th question their diagnosis of CRPS, because what was obvious in those records is that there was something else going on. And to answer your question, no, they, they, didn't, they didn't pursue any other diagnostic ideas. Uh, or anything to chase those ideas down. Um, during the um, during the period of her admission to Johns Hopkins All Children's, um, did it appear to you that there was any change or improvement in the child's condition? I think there was, actually, between October and January when she was discharged. In, in what respect? Well, f well, first, certainly her symptoms didn't get any worse. And yet her drug therapy was pruned down from know, something like 18 medications that she was taking on admission down to a much smaller number. I can't remember exactly what. And that process continued after discharge of slowly dropping off medications that she was taking. Um, she was more functional on discharge than she was on admission. She was able to propel her wheelchair a number of feet. Uh, she, was she was able to support her weight standing with assistance. And there were lots of observations in which she was able to do things with her arms, such as reaching for things, uh, that she said that she couldn't do, but she was doing by the time of discharge. Did you see any evidence or suggestion that her stay at All Children's Hospital uh, either caused any aggravation of her condition or caused any injury to her? No, I did not. Um, let me ask you, I'm going to show you, I'll show a couple of pictures here. Um, the jury has heard a lot of discussion, and we've had a lot of discussion about um, Let me back up here, and uh, let me ask to, be, to, to show Exhibit 3135-2 in evidence. Three one three five dash two. Now this is a picture of uh, Maya Kowalski, we believe, taken January first of two thousand seventeen. Um, what is the the mark on her forehead? 
It's a scratch. Objection to speculation. Overall. It's a scratch. Um, what are CRPS lesions, doctor? There really isn't such a thing as CRPS lesions. There are skin problems that occur with CRPS. The, the thing is that when there's a skin injury, the lesion can, or the injury can become larger, it can even form an ulcer. Because the perfusion, the blood flow to the skin of CRPS is so poor. So nutrients and oxygen are not arriving at the, the part of the skin that's been damaged. And, uh, it, 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 and so it doesn't heal, it just gets worse and worse and worse. So you see small ulcerations, you see very, very large ulcerations. And then there are other, I wouldn't call them lesions, but they're, the, the appearance of the skin can be very abnormal in CRPS. Very, very swollen, there can be color changes, as I said, deep purple skin, there can be um, you know, blood vessel, you can, it's hard to describe, almost like purple stripes on the skin. Uh, we, it can be modeled, but those aren't really lesions. So the lesions that occur, occur because of poor blood flow to the skin and some, something injures the skin and it just festers and grows from there. You can see from this picture that, well, a couple of things. First, CRPS does not occur on the face. CRPS type 1, which is what we're talking about, does not occur on the face or the forehead. Number two, you can see it's nice and pink, it's well perfused, it's got good blood flow. And number three, it's a linear, it's a linear lesion. It's, it's a fingernail scratch, I would say. I would speculate, but it's a scratch nevertheless. It's not a CRPS lesion. Okay. Uh, let me ask that, um, that, the, that we put up. Uh, Defense Exhibit 3232-962 in evidence. And for the record, this is, uh, we understand it's dated December 6th of 2014. Now, in this picture, Doctor, how this is before the disease, whatever it was, began. How is this picture significant in retrospect? Well, here we see really a cute little girl smiling, sitting on Santa's lap. Uh, she's happy. Obviously, there's not much wrong going on. What what I noticed in this picture were the position of her feet. So you see the left foot. She's she's holding it up. It's at 90 degrees. That's, that's a pretty normal posture. But you know, if you're sitting on somebody's lap or if you're being held up in the air, the feet sort of drop down if you don't pick them up. So her right foot, the, the foot is sort of dropped down with gravity, uh, and the left foot is, is, is normal. Um, but she's, she has to flex her, her calf muscles to make the left foot go up like that. So the point of this picture is that um, the very fact that a foot is pointed down like that is not an abnormality. Okay. Let me ask that we put up 3232-0810. Uh, uh, and evidence. And for the record, this is, we understand, dated July 30th, 2015. Three two three two dash zero eight ten. There we go. Now what is the uh, significance of this picture taken shortly before admission to Lurie Children's Hospital? Can we get a date on the photograph? Uh, so that's what I've got is 7 30 15. Thank you. I think this picture was taken in Chicago. She's being held by a man. The man's hands are on her left thigh and her buttock. 
uh, this, remember, she could not tolerate the touch of anything on her skin when she uh, uh, was in the emergency room and then in the hospital at Lurie Children's Hospital. She would scream and would not allow anything to touch her skin. But here you see a man holding her and obviously not only touching her skin, you can see actually his, the tips of his fingers are indenting uh, the skin a little bit, especially his left hand. And yet she's smiling and happy. And you can see again that her feet are, are pointed down a little bit, but not very much because they're going down with gravity. And she's wearing socks, and she couldn't tolerate wearing socks or anything on her feet by history at that point in time. But here she is in socks and with somebody touching her skin this way. And of course, her, her arms, which could not be touched even lightly, are touching his shirt and his shoulder and her torso is touching his body, and none of that seems to be bothering her. She seems to be very happy here. Okay. Could I ask that we put up 3232-439? And uh, this picture, we understand, is dated July 6th. 2016. What is significant about this picture from mm -hmm. your clinical standpoint, Doc? July 6, 2016. I'm trying to think of what was going on in her life at that time. Um, 2016. So this, this was during Hannah's treatment and a couple of months before going to All Children's Hospital. So you see Hannah is in a wheelchair. She's holding her left arm up against gravity. It's not resting upon anything while she's holding her balloons. She's happy. And her feet are both, well, her right foot anyway, is, is at uh, 90 degrees. It's at a normal position, even though at that point in time, according to Hannah's notes, she had dystonia of both her feet and then she could not bring them back to a normal position. She had them fixed in a pointed position. Uh, we also see that she's Looks like her foot is, uh, her feet are touching the, the footrest. It's hard to tell. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what I observed in this picture. Okay. Okay, we then put up uh, Defense Exhibit 3232-354. And that's dated... Uh, 28 August 2016, August 28, 2016. Okay, once again, Hannah is in a period of time when she's being treated you mean by Maya. Dr. I'm sorry. I mean, um, Maya is being treated by Dr. Hannah, uh, and he's, he's increasing the dose of ketamine higher and higher and higher because every time she comes in the office, he's recording that she's in terrible pain, 9 out of 10 pain, she's got dystonia of her feet, etc. But here we see that. Uh, She's sitting in a wheelchair, she's happy, she doesn't give the appearance of a child in 9 out of 10 pain, and she has her knees folded, and she's sitting on her feet, and, she's, and her legs are in contact with each other, you know, the calves are pushing up against the thighs, and again, I would have suspected that that would not be possible uh, for a child with CRPS, that would be too painful. Now, um, let me ask, we put up 3232-0345. And this is, we understand, taken August 31st, 2016. What is significant about this photo, Doctor? Again, this is uh, a, a time period at which Hannah is treating her and the dose is still going up higher and higher. So here we see, again, her right arm is being held against gravity. It's not resting on the armrest. And she seems to be comfortable. And her feet are in a perfectly normal position, 90 degrees, flat-footed on the, on the ground. At a time at which, again, Hannah is recording, presumably because Hannah is being told that her feet are in a fixed, dystonic position and she cannot bring them back to 90 degrees. Okay. 
And then finally, let me ask you to let's, let us put up 3232-365, which we understand was taken August 18th, 2016. Can you tell us about this picture? August 16th, 2016. Okay, again, during Hannah's treatment, this is presumably during one of his uh, treatments. We can see EKG stickers on her chest, a blood pressure cuff on her arm, an IV tubing. You can't tell exactly where the IV is connected to, but there's IV tubing on top of the teddy bear. And, uh, and she's unconscious. Her mouth is just slack, open, and uh, she's breathing on her own, presumably. She's pink, and she's not conscious. She's not responsive. So this is presumably during a ketamine infusion, again showing that uh, she's more than more than sedated. When you say more than sedated, what do you mean? Well, I should. It's hard to say exactly. Sedation is a continuum from being awake to having your anxiety eliminated, to being lightly sedated, to being deeply sedated. Uh, deeply sedated means, she has the appearance of a deeply sedated patient, meaning that she would not respond to a voice. But it's hard to tell exactly. But she doesn't look like she would. Okay. Uh, you've expressed a number of opinions here today, doctor. Have you expressed those opinions with a reasonable degree of medical probability? Yes, I have. Um, I have just want me on? You may. Doctor, have you seen records regarding this patient from after her discharge at All Children's Hospital? I've seen Dr. Wassenauer, is that his name pronounced correctly, of her pediatrician. I've seen his records following her vision. Do you have an impression of uh, how she did following discharge from All Children? Back up, what was your Objection. question just prior to that? I'm sorry. You asked if I had seen records of, from Hannah, I mean from Maya after her discharge? Records. Yes, yes, sir. Right. Yeah, I, I, I saw lots of Alice's records. And it seemed like she was doing exceptionally well. Okay. Uh, did it appear to you that she had recovered function in that period of time after discharge? Yes, she was in high school, she was in athletics, uh, was, was doing quite well. Recognizing that your frame of reference um, may not extend all the way to the present day and that you've never examined this patient. Uh, do you have any opinion that you can express within reasonable medical probability regarding what future needs she may have? Well, I don't think she had CRPS to begin with, so I won't comment on if she did have CRPS, what her future needs would be. But I would say, from what I know, I don't see that she would have any particular needs at all except for support from a mental health professional. That's all I have. Thank you.
you know, it was a big discussion about when we're going to do lunch. <laughs> and and uh, it probably is better that we go to lunch now as opposed to finishing the witness. So, um, let's see here. Let's have you back ready to go. <laughs> One ten. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. All rise. You're executed. Um, Doctor, since you're in the middle of your testimony, you can't talk to anyone about your testimony, okay? Okay. And if you want to go to lunch now, that's fine. And just be back here. Once you be back here by one. So you're not objecting to what? She wants to be able to talk to him during. He's our expert as opposed to a regular. No, he's in the middle of testimony. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's 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 not have the discussion. Okay. Understood. Um. And is today the day that you're going to have a witness with the diagnosis of Munchausen? Yes, it is. And if you want to talk about how we're going to need to talk about that. I agree. Okay. I'd love, I'd love some guys. Sure. Sure. You can take off. Today. All right. Thank you. Do you want to talk about that now, or do you want to go to lunch and then come back and talk about it right after lunch? Well, I, I wouldn't mind a little bit of guidance just because the witness is going to be here over this. Okay, then every, everyone can, can sit down. <coughs> some guidance about what I mean about talking about Munchausen? Sure. So the witness after Dr. Crane will be Dr. Paula Dees. She's a pediatric hospitalist who saw the patient over two one-week periods, I believe, roughly starting October 18th for about a week and then again on October 31st for about a week. Her notes are significant that in her initial impression and plan, she does have as one of her impressions Munchausen by Proxer. I think it's her exact words are concerns for Munchausen by proxy. Um, so, uh, and then there's obviously discussions in some of her progress notes about DCF. You know, one particular one, Mr. Kowalski is asking, or Maya is asking to visit with her father, and she says she contacted uh, the Child Protective Investigation CPI to help coordinate that visit. I don't, don't know that that's as much of a concern since I'm not going to dwell on it, but. I'd appreciate the court's guidance in terms of what you want me to do there and specifically whether they're going to cross her on that. Well, I'm sorry. So I thought you were having a, a expert oh, my come point. in. No, no. The, our, our expert that would have qualifications to touch on uh, Munchausen's would be Dr. Uh, Alexander, and he's not coming until, I believe, Monday or Tuesday next week. So this is just a hospitalist with that concern for Munchausen as one of her uh, diagnoses in a record. Well, let me, because I, I meant to say this yesterday and then again this morning, but I, I am, th this is kind of where I'm at right this second. Mm -hmm. Whether Beata Kowalski. I'm, I'm sorry, Judge. I, I, I'm, I'm stopping you only to throw this out because I've got Sally Smith coming in two days. So if you can give us the benefit of your wisdom on both these points, it would be helpful. In my view, whether Beata Kowalski, in fact, suffered or had Munchausen by proxy, I don't see how that is material to any cause of action or issue that is remaining in this case. 
So I'm not sure why we need to be trying to prove the diagnosis. Now, the observations of the hospital, its doctors, that, you know, as Maya was brought in and, and what the situation that the hospital faced with um, Maya coming into the hospital, I do think it's uh, relevant to help explain how and why the hospital made the decisions that it did. So, I mean, that's why I, I've been letting in, you know, the Lurie, all, all of these prior hospital visits. But when we get to, um, I'm not sure we need a, a witness to come in and testify that mom had Munchausen by proxy. I, I, I don't see what we're asking the jury to decide in this case as opposed to what would have been the chapter 39 case. So that, that's kind of where I'm at. Now, your specific question about uh, Dr. Dees, I mean, she's a, a hospitalist. I think she was a hospitalist. Yes, Your Honor. And, and so, I mean, her observations, I think, are fine. And I'm assuming those records are in evidence that you were referring to. Yes, Your Honor. Now, again, the the... The gravity associated with the Chapter 39 proceeding tends to pull everything, but let's avoid the temptation to be pulled by the gravity to walk down the Chapter 39 issues. Yeah, and so just for some clarification, one of the issues in the case that the plaintiffs have been attacking, so well, I'll just cut to the chase. Doctor, on the transfer forms to Nemours in late October, November, not the first one, before the shelter order, but later, the Nemours documentation says, uh, I don't know if it's exactly diagnosis, but they have diagnosis codes for several conditions. One of them is Munchausen's, and it says, quote, assigned by Dr. Dees. The plaintiff in this case has made a central issue that the reason why the Kowalskis would not agree to the transfer is because they didn't agree with the transfer codes. So, um, I would appreciate some guidance either from the court or from the plaintiff. Do they plan on trying to cross-examine her? I feel like she would need a chance to explain some part of this. If they're going to cross-examine her and make an issue to the jury that she had no right to list that as a concern and that her you know, thoughts on this were the reasons for blocking the diagnosis, it starts to make that, um, in her words, a concern um, you know, in blocking transfer of material issue. Well, I suggest that the witness stay away from the transfer issue to avoid this. The uh, fact is that there were no doctors qualified in any way, shape, or form at the time of the Nemours or before at Johns Hopkins that diagnosed Munchausen by proxy. It came from a nurse, Ashley Sumner, and to a certain extent, I think Dr. Malik, the refl record reflects. And so to the extent that they presented this to uh, Beata and Jack Kowalski with diagnostic codes for psychological issues, then that is relevant material to their decision not to sign the transfer. But I prefer not to get into the Munchausen well, part of it. Well, because there were two transfers. What time are we November talking second. about? Yeah, I think the actual time of the Nemours record for transfer is November 2nd. The one with the well, wait, wait, wait. But, but at that point, that's in Chapter 39 right. time frame, and that was an issue that was being discussed in the dependency court, right? Yes. Right. In November 2nd, there's transfer efforts were availing for some period of time. The initial transfer effort one that we heard about this morning. The one in October. Correct. Yes, sir. That one is 39 neutral. There was no petition. There was no order. Wait, can, can I just stop you there? But is that the one that Dr. Uh, Dees is going to be ta talking about? Yes, and no. to your point. And not that, the November one. Correct. She was not. Hmm? No. That, the, the other way around. She was not involved at all until October 18th. She had no involvement in the first one prior to the shelter. Her only involvement was trying to get 
as one of the me members of the medical team, trying to get the kid transferred to Nemours after the period of shelter. And the plaintiff has attacked Dr. D's and all children's for including or having some influence on the diagnoses codes being Munchausen by proxy as the reason why they would not sign on to transfer. That's well, that's on, on that particular issue, I go back to whether you prove that mom had, uh, mom had Munchausen or not, it doesn't go to the auto state of mind as to why she wasn't going to sign it. Right, but so, I believe so, I, I mean, I, I, one, it seems like that specific time frame is when the dependency court was involved in addressing this particular issue. And, and so I'm, I'm not seeing how we really need to walk this path with the November transfer attempt. Let me try to articulate this in 30 seconds just to give you my frame of mind. Our, the concern from the defense on a more overall basis is from opening argument and at various points in the trial, the plaintiff has injected into this litigation, right or wrong, and sometimes over the judicial instruction, that the only way Maya could be freed from all children's was for this sort of altruistic suicide, right? And I know that obviously goes to some of the elements of intentional infliction, and they're arguing directly in opening that because we accused Beata Kowalski of this Munchausen's diagnosis, so we believe it's material for that. And it's also one of the defenses to their themes of the only way to free Maya was this altruistic suicide, is that we were actually trying to actively transfer her throughout this whole time, to which the plaintiff's response is, yes, but only with this erroneous diagnosis code, which they would never agree to. So while I completely understand the court's point that in general, whether Munchausen or not Munchausen isn't directly central to any themes. The plaintiff has made an argument, and my fear on the defense side is they're going to stand up in closing argument and say, we, the, we couldn't get Maya out of there because they made this diagnosis of Munchausen with no basis, and we're afraid we're going to hear it in closing. Well, I mean, you probably saw the instruction that we were discussing this morning where I'm specifically saying, yeah. and I think I, I had took the language of Mr. Altenburn mm -hmm. about how the hospital's not responsible for the length of the stay of Maya and, and Johns Hopkins because only the dependency court control that issue. So when we talk about a transfer that is during the dependency action as opposed to the attempted transfer uh, when there was no a shelter petition filed, a no dependency court involvement, and we have the prospect of a false imprisonment. I see those as materially distinct issues. And so how do we get to discussing that specific transfer attempt in November without getting into what was going on in the dependency court? That's that gravity of the Chapter 39 issue that I'm trying to uh, keep us from going into this black hole. I, I'm completely sympathetic to this court's position on that, and you're, you're absolutely right. That is an issue that bleeds together, if not has a gravitational pull. Again, this may be an issue for a, a jury instruction where we would are going to likely request an instruction that the plaintiffs are not seeking damage from the defendants for any allegation of Munchausen, that the, defendant, that the plaintiffs are not going to suggest to this jury that some allegation of Munchausen caused or contributed to damage. Um, but I guess the, for the very, we can deal with that. But I guess for the very short purpose of this witness, what I think I'm understanding from this court is, while they're certainly going to see that in her record, um, and, you know, we can touch briefly on the fact that that was part of her impression, that I will not have this witness focus on the Munchausens, although, again, I'm somewhat concerned that they're going to get into with this okay, witness you worked with, you know, you consulted with Sally Smith, <laughs> and then they're going to blow the door open to this, right? So I, you know. Well, Mr. Whitney, Ms. Lawrence, and Mr. Anderson are hearing this discussion, and all I would say is some, if somebody feels they're going to be asking a question that might draw us into that vortex that is Chapter 39, and we can't escape the 
pull of the black hole that is chapter 39. Come talk to me ahead of time before we ask the question. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, Mr. Hunter talked about Sally Smith. That's probably a longer discussion than a couple minutes before we run to lunch. But as a 30,000 foot view, uh, it seems to me that you can talk, and, and Dr. Sally Smith can you know, generally say what she was doing, not that what her specific diagnosis or recommendations were, but she came in, she's talked to people and, and whatnot. She was a on staff that she also had this, this second hat, which is uh, with the Sun Coast and whatever her outfit is and her contracts, but very generally about that, but not into the specifics as to what her recommendations were. And I think you also are able to talk about saying, hey, you know, the plaintiffs are saying that you were on staff and that you were treating her. These are some examples of what the plaintiff was saying that you were treating her with and then getting her to say whatever she's going to say about that. But I don't want to get into um, a really lengthy discussion about uh, the 14,000 things she did or didn't do as an investigator uh, in the Chapter 39 proceeding. Does that, does that help any? I, I think so. The big question is, I guess, uh, and I, I think I just heard the answer, uh, that you, you don't want me walking her through her report. No, we're, we're, we're not walking through through the report. I mean, I've kept that out. I, I, I kind of saw where that was going. Uh, okay, very well, Your Honor. I'll, I'll, let me let me mull that over, and I may ask for the guidance. But I I believe since the plaintiffs have put into play the concept that Sally Smith went over her her line of demarcation as an investigator and was treating Maya, you are able to defend the allegations that she was treating Maya. I mean, I, I think that is fair, and you're allowed to defend that against that allegation. Okay. Thank you, Judge. All right. So if we were back all at 1 o'clock with 10 minutes before uh, the jury comes back, is that enough time? That gives us an hour and five minutes before yep. we'll be back. That's fine, Judge. 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock it is. That, or Mr. Anderson, did you have something? Yes. I have provided a summary of the ketamine infusions that we've all actually been using, originally derived, amazingly enough, from Sally Smith's notes as to the different infusion schedules of Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Cantu, uh, and Dr. Hanna. And uh, we went back and double-checked it, submitted it. What I want to know now is, is there going to be an objection about the infusion schedules, or do I have to go back and go through every single one of these? Why don't you and the defense talk about this issue offline, and then if there's a problem with it, then we will take I'll it just up. note that they've been using it during their questioning of witnesses. They've been referencing our demonstrative aid, so okay. I don't know what the objection yeah. is. I have not been using I didn't say you have. I didn't say you have. I said defense counsel has. All right. We'll, we'll discuss it, Judge, over lunch as suggested. Thank you. One o'clock. One o'clock.
everything good? Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Make sure everything's on. I think everything's on again, so. Clip that wasn't able to be played for your honor that we'll need for the next witness. And so, if, if uh, we could have that played and ruled on. Sure, I just turned the system back on. So, whenever you're able to play it, go okay. For it. Uh, so, that's 3085 1. Make sure the volume's up, please. That's it. Good. I heard a little background static, so I'm assuming the sound was on and there just no one was saying anything. Correct. Any objection to that clip? Uh, I don't think so. No objection. What was the number again? 30851 uh, dash one. Court receives 3085 dash one. Thank you, Judge. We had a discussion with regard to the demonstrative aid, as I understand it, that uh, the plaintiffs wish to use, and we are not objective to the use of it as a demonstrative aid. This one, we can get one for the court, I hope. Do we have an extra one? Judge, do you want this? I have digital, Ron. He can bring it up. Does it have the word Sally Smith on it? No. <laughs> No, Sally Smith. But it does have bunch houses. I'm kidding. <laughs> what? No. It does not. It's got, a, it's got a teaser. It says one five five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three, Hope the uh, jury's not red, green, colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> Zero eight five. What's next? I don't. I don't. I don't know, Judge. I don't think there's anything that, that can be handled in two minutes, and that needs to be dealt with for this witness. Uh, from a timing standpoint, when is the defense anticipating they're going to be able to rest? Judge, can we tell you that tomorrow? Only because we're going to meet tonight and kind of go over everything and make sure what we've got lined up is uh, and what we do or do not need to absolutely do. If that's all right with the court, we'd be we'd be. Let me put it this way: we'll be more accurate if we address that in the morning. Okay, and I guess my overall hope, request, thought, really, we kind of need is all evidence, including any sort of rebuttal case to be completed and all exhibits in by next Wednesday, November 1st. Uh, I, we don't see that as being an issue, Judge. And, and my thought again is if we are resting on next Wednesday, uh, remember Thursday and Friday, I will not be here. And then so we'd do, my thought was we would do jury instructions and closing arguments on Monday November 6th, and then start deliberations the morning of the 7th, Tuesday the 7th. You got a facial expression there, Mr. Hunter. I'm trying to read what, what, what that facial expression no, no, meant. I, 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 I mean, I looked at the calendar, too. Uh, the, the, uh, we have to, we need to talk about it, but... Tentatively, I don't see an issue with that. The reason I made a face was I was kind of thinking, you know, start deliberations on the sixth after clo after closing. But that's just. We, I mean, we can we can talk <coughs> about it. I mean, I think each side gets what two hours for closing, and then the amount of time for courts to read the jury instructions. And since I read very fast. <laughs> I know I, I read very fix. slow. <laughs> so. We need to assemble a booklet too. We're working on that. Okay. 
Can I bring the jury in, or is, are there any other issues? Oh, Judge, just briefly, um, uh, we, would, we have requested the plaintiff to provide us with their list of all the exhibits that they that they have put in, and sensing some resistance to that idea. We just want to have their list. We want to work on this Excel thing that the court has requested, and so it would be helpful for us to have their list of what they have admitted. Do we have the list of text messages? Yeah. Um, we can provide it this evening. Fantastic. I'm getting a request from the clerk's office. They would really like to see a copy of it as well, even if it's just in draft. So we will print the copy and raise more. Thank you, Part One Two. Two. Thank you. Anything else before I bring uh, back, bring in the jury? Um, uh, no, not on behalf of us, Judge. Sorry. No, you're. Let's bring in the jury. Yes, please. So is that monitor working? Okay, please be seated. Members of the jury, I hope you had a good lunch. No. No? <laughs> Well, where do we go that we need to make sure that... No, don't tell us uh, publicly where you went. Send us the note. Uh, well, I'm sorry to hear that... You had a good lunch? Okay. I mean, I know the county has not provided you lunch at all throughout this entire process, so... In any event, um, I just want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? and that you have not seen any media accounts of this case. Is that correct? correct. And no one has approached you about this case. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Uh, so, doctor, you remember you're still under oath. I do. Plaintiffs? Dr. Crane, how much have you been paid so far for your testimony? I don't have a running total in my mind, I'm sorry. Well, uh, is it over $100,000? No. Is it over $50,000? No. How much do you get paid per hour for testifying in court? $750. An hour? <clears throat> An hour. Including prep time? Including prep time. Including travel time? No. What's that? $300 an hour. Okay. Would it, safe to, would it be safe to say that you're between twenty five and $50,000 being paid now or in the future for your testimony? Uh, not, not, not to date. It's been less than that to date. I don't know how much it will be after this week. Uh -huh. Okay. And so how long did you spend total with counsel in the, say, month prior to your testimony? <clears throat> Two hours last night. And there have been some phone calls over the last month. Well, maybe, maybe about three or four hours of phone calls. Before your report was issued, though, you spent considerable amounts of time with counsel, did you not? Before the report was issued? Which report? I, I don't know what you mean, Mr. Anderson. Uh, you had done a report in this case back in 2021, I believe? Oh, that. Yes. You did, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what you mean by considerable amount of time. Uh, over 10 hours. I provided you my billing records to date, and I just, I don't remember the details of them, but you have them in front of you, I think. Okay. Is gastroparesis a symptom of CRPS? No. Best of your knowledge? Okay. 
All right. So you had testified first. Let's talk about Dr. Hanna. You had testified that you felt that uh, Dr. Hanna's treatments did not work, right? Correct. And that was because, and one of the reasons for all the weaning was because the doses just kept going up and up and up. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> That's correct. Okay. Um, oh, and incidentally, there's nothing wrong with being paid by the hour, is there? No, of course not. No. At seven hundred fifty dollars an hour, just just checking on something. All right. So you said it been going up and up and up, and that's as to the dosages. Now, is that the individual dosages? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, the per infusion dosage. There, the the total over four hours has gone up, and the hourly rate of infusion has gone up. Uh huh. Okay. So, uh, how many infusions? Uh, what was the infusion rate in June? I, can I look at my notes? I can tell you if I look at sure. my notes. Yeah. Okay, they're my briefcase. May I get them? Sure. Can we put the notes? Great. Great. We put the progress note from Hannah's stuff. Sure. We've got the progress note if that helps you. There's going to be a monitor here, sir. Okay. Put it on the monitor. Okay, if I can look at my. I, I, I have some notes with the details. There's a lot of details. And I don't want to be incorrect in answering the question. <clears throat> If you have notes, uh, I'd like to mark those, Your Honor, right now uh, for uh, as an exhibit, or actually for identification right now. Do you want them? Or yeah, should I, I just read them? I haven't seen them unless you got a spare copy, but you I can not. use them right now. I do not. Sure. All right. <clears throat> so we've got Dr. Hannah's progress reports here, and right. I believe it shows over four hours, 1,000 milligrams. Uh, which date are we talking about, please? Well, in this instance, it would be for the month of June. I have I have the the dates on specific the amounts on specific dates. I don't know what the monthly total would be. Okay. Well, is it true that on every single day between June, actually between March and August of 2016? The same dose was used, 1,000 milligrams. Yes, and then it's uh, September 30th, the dose began to rise. All right, well, we'll get to that in a moment. The most it ever went to was 1,250 by your records, correct? 1,290, I think. And so, up until October, it stayed at 1,000 milligrams. That's right. All right, so then it did not go up through the course of the summer, did it? Unless, of course, the number overall of infusions went up, right? Uh, it went, on September 30th, it went up to 1,200 milligrams, but you're correct that it was 1,000 through um, through that part of the year. All right. So if the jury got that impression that it was actually going up from your testimony over that entire period of time, that would not be true. I apologize okay. for that. I, I misremembered that. Okay. And so the number of infusions, um, it was your testimony that they kept going up and up and up, isn't it? No, I don't think I said the number was okay. going up. Well, how many infusions were there in March 2016? I'd have to look at his records to count them. I don't remember that, that detail. All right, I'll just list them out. You tell me if you have any notes for any one of them, and then we'll see what we can do. Uh, March, do you know how many? I think I just said I don't know how many. All right, April, May? Well, I didn't. I, if, we, if we can look at Hannah's records, June. we can answer that, but I didn't record the dates of every single... Might be able to help you. Can we put up the yeah. summary? Uh, doctor, I'll represent to you that this is a summary agreed to by the parties. And if we can go to 2016, please. It's use was agreed to by the parties. The summary is not agreed to by the parties. The numbers, I believe, were agreed to. The summary itself developed. But these are the numbers agreed to. All right. So if you look at the infusions then in March of 2016, there were... How many? 17? I counted up. that look right to you? Are, are the greens? Oh, I see. Greens are yes, infusions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'll take your word for it without counting. All right. Uh, in April, there were five. Mm -hmm. May, three. June, five. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. July, four. Mm -hmm. August, three. Mm -hmm. September. 
I know it's a, a small thing, but can you say yes or no as a yes, of course. Uh, yes. On, yes. Uh, yes, of course. Yes to all those previous questions then. Right. And September 4, is that right? That's right. All right. So through this period of time, in fact, the number was not increasing. The highest one was March. Correct? Correct. The number in March, yes. All right. So if we take the number of infusions and the fact that they weren't increasing and the amount of the infusions and note they weren't increasing at least until October for three times, you would agree with me that you were wrong in saying that Dr. Hanna's infusions were going up through the course of spring and summer. I was incorrect, yes. I misremembered the infusions going up in dose. They were stable at 1,000 until September 29th. Okay. Well, you've known uh, about this case for at least three and a half years, have you not? Yes, I have. Have you ever actually spoken to Maya Kowalski? Of course not, no. And uh, have you ever examined her? No, I haven't. So you don't know whether she has testified under oath here that these treatments were the only thing, the only thing that helped her. Objection to ask yeah. one witness to comment on the testimony of another. Would you repeat the question, please? You are, are you aware or are you not aware that Maya Kowalski has testified that the only thing that helped her pain were these infusions? If she's testified to that, I'm sure that she did, but um, am, and, am I aware of it? No, I wasn't aware of that. And, and, and doctor, isn't the ultimate goal here to help the patient? The ultimate goal is to improve function and diminish pain. Which is helping the patient, That's right? right? Yes, I wanted to be more specific than just using the word helping. And the main thing that Maya Kowalski <clears throat> complained about was pain, was it not? And loss of function. All right. And so through the course of the spring and summer, as the dosages from Dr. Hanna were going on, did anybody ever show you any of the videos of how Maya Kowalski's function improved? I only saw one video of her, and I don't remember the date, and that was of her dancing on her bed, but I don't recall when that figured into the chronology. Did you see any of Maya and her brother in the pool? No. Did you see any of Maya on a walker on its side, using that as sort of a exercise bar? No. So, if I'm understanding your testimony then, the thing that people did wrong here um, was that they did not follow your clinic's program. No. Is that right? Absolutely not. Okay. But you felt that physical therapy, occupational therapy, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, these are the cornerstones, right? Well, I didn't say CBT. That's just one form of cognitive. Uh, that's just one form of psychotherapy. And it's more complicated than just to use one form. But I said that those were the cornerstones, the foundation of treatment of CRPS, and that's something which is nationally, if not internationally, recognized. Did you go through the records of Tampa General Hospital and see what she received over the course of one month inpatient during the summer of 2015? Yes, I did. And did she have physical therapy? Yes, she did. Did she have psychological therapy? She had some, yes. Did she have occupational therapy? Yes, she did. And she had that for a month, right? Correct, that's right. And at the end, the physical therapist said she wasn't improving, right? The, the uh, PMNR doctor, the rehabilitation doctor, felt that she was ready for discharge and to continue the same therapy as an outpatient. In other words, she no longer required inpatient hospital admission. And right. these things are generally done as outpatients. Got it. Did you or did you not tell the jury on direct examination that under your approach, especially for a 10-year-old girl, you know, when their mind is developing, that your program here could work in a matter of weeks? I said in a matter of weeks, but not four weeks, and four weeks is never enough. So now it's more than four weeks that you need. I, I said weeks, and generally our program lasts for six to twelve, sometimes more, but I would say 
10 weeks is about the average for CRPS. For the people that were there actually seeing Maya Kowalski as she left Tampa General Hospital, she had not improved after four weeks of the therapy that you advised would work. True? And let me just check my notes out, please. Well, I'll answer your question in the following way. She wasn't performing significantly better in physical therapy, but she was doing things when she wasn't aware of being observed or when her mother wasn't in her presence that indicated that, in fact, there were physical uh, improvements in her, in her behavior and in her appearance. You got that from Bonnie Rice, correct? No, I did not. I'm pulling that from the, the uh, Tampa General Hospital records. Was Maya out of the wheelchair coming out of Tampa General Hospital? No, she was not. Was that Maya Kowalski still complaining of severe pain? Yes, she was, I'm sure. Doesn't CRPS, one of the problems with diagnosing and treating this disease is the variability of some of the symptoms? I, don't, I wouldn't consider that a problem. It's certainly a fact of the disease that different children have different magnitudes of symptoms. At different times, correct? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a smooth course to recovery. It's more of a sawtooth course to recovery. But, right. yes, the general trend is in one direction. Good days and bad days. I wouldn't quite put it that way, but I, I, I think uh, I wouldn't quibble with you if that's how you want to describe it. And are you aware that Maya Kowalski had a relapse in September of 2016? We are, you know, predicating this whole discussion, Mr. Anderson, on the assumption that this is CRPS, uh, which was not the belief of the Tampa General Hospital staff or the Murray Children's Hospital staff. And so it wouldn't necessarily be expected that her course is going to follow the typical, typical course of CRPS if she didn't have CRPS. Doctor, I just ask you whether or not she had a relapse in twenty in September of 2016. I think you said a relapse in CRPS, and that's why yes. I'm saying, well, I'm not, I don't think she had CRPS, so she couldn't have had a relapse of CRPS. But yes, she had a, a decrement, uh, a decrease in her behavior, function, yes. And are you aware that through the entire course of the spring and summer of 2016, she was on that sawtooth path of getting better? She would, she would respond to ketamine, and then after, typically, you know, her ketamine seemed to be at, at intervals of approximately once a month, and so she would feel better after the ketamine, and then she would begin to feel worse, and she would ask for another ketamine uh, treatment, and she would feel better again. So yes, it was an undulating course. She felt better after many of the ketamine infusions. That wore, effect wore off, and then she went back for more. Well, this is a disease that you don't cure, you manage, correct? What disease are we talking about? Complex regional pain syndrome. Again, I, I don't think she had complex regional pain syndrome, so if you want me to answer hypothetically sure. about CRPS. Hypothetically then, CRPS, you manage that, you don't cure it. No, I would, I would not put it in those terms. Well, you think it can, you can give somebody a shot and it'll go away? No, of course not. Or a pill? Of course not. So you think that just by continuous physical therapy, what, the rest of their lives, that's going to do it? I haven't said that either. Okay. So, I understand that you say that you do not agree she had CRPS, but you've been through the records, have you not? Yes, sir. All right. And so, you have seen then that, for instance, Dr. Chopra noticed or documented okay. first I want to know now you are refuting the diagnosis of CRPS by at least five physicians are you not? I'm telling you that my reading of the chart and in agreement with many physicians who saw her in children's hospitals that I didn't see any evidence to support the diagnosis of CRPS well, none of them after Dr. Kirkpatrick disagreed with the diagnosis. True? 
after Dr. Kirkpatrick? Once Dr. There was, Kirkpatrick. Our children's hospital did not agree with the diagnosis. Well, are you aware that they billed for it the entire time? It's a different matter. Once something gets in the medical record, it often stays there. And the billing people simply look at diagnoses that are written early on and carry through to them. And all of the doctors and nurses and social workers through the entire three month stay, they just let it follow through. The diagnosis. I don't so know if you better your own. Let it follow through. All right. And so, for instance, Dr. Barr, a neurologist, diagnosed it independently as CRPS. True? No, not true. Dr. Spiegel diagnosed it. Are you disagreeing with whether he's a neurologist or not? No, I'm telling you that he didn't diagnose CRPS. Um, are you saying that Dr. Elliott did not say he refuted the diagnosis? No, Dr. Elliott said it was not CRPS. I could have sworn he said he did believe it was CRPS yesterday. I wasn't here yesterday. I didn't hear what he said. All right. But Dr. In Spiegel, his deposition, he said it was not. And in his notes, he said... Did Dr. Spiegel testify it was CRPS? Remind me who Dr. Spiegel is, please. Did Dr. Hanna testify it was CRPS? Yes, Dr. Hanna. I didn't hear his test testimony in court, but his, Dr. his deposition. Dr. Dr. Kirkpatrick called it CRPS. Dr. Cantu. Dr. Cantu. And so you agree with the Budapest criteria, I gather? Yes. All right. And so in going through, you had to notice that, or see, I'm sure counsel provided you with photos showing dystonia of Maya. Well, I think what we know in hindsight is that it wasn't dystonia. It would come and go at will. And there were lots of times when the dystonia was not there and within the same day that it was there, or it seemed to be there. So it was something which was... It, it wasn't dystonia. It was, it was, could have been conversion disorder, it could have been confabulation, but dystonia is something which is there all the time and then gradually gets better. If it does get better and then goes away, it doesn't come and go. The stiffness in the ankles doesn't come and go on the same day. And there were many descriptions at Tampa General, at Lurie Children's Hospital, and at All Children's Hospital of her feet being in a normal posture under the covers or during the day, and then not in a normal posture when she saw that she was not being observed. Being observed. No distraction in the doctor's testimony, the portion regarding uh, psychological diagnosis. <coughs> so now, is Maya's dystonia voluntary or involuntary? Can't say. You would agree it's involuntary. In no, other words, I said I can't no say it was voluntary or involuntary. I don't have enough knowledge of her, of her um, psychological state to make that observation. When somebody is under general <clears throat> anesthesia, they lose the ability to control their arms and legs, do they not? That's true. Can we break up 2529-61? Do you recognize that? As dystonia. No, I don't. It's not dystonia. If you look at any patient under general anesthesia, any patient, their feet do that when they're under anesthesia, which is why under anesthesia and in an intensive care unit when children are unconscious, we're very careful to prop their feet up so they don't develop constrictions. So that would be the typical look of two feet under general anesthesia, sir. All right. So the fact that they're pointing inward, you think, has no significance? That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have any photographs of Maya Kowalski otherwise under general anesthesia where you can see that better? None that I can think of. Do you have any photographs around this time that demonstrate Maya Kowalski's feet staying perfectly straight? During what time? Leading up in the fall of 2015. The fall of 2015? Hang on one second. Um, there were... Um, well, I'm, I mentioned a photograph from July the 30th, 2015, when she was being carried in the man's arms. And her feet did not look 
dystonic or like the photograph that you just showed me? That would be the only photograph that I remember seeing around that time. I just want to get this straight then, Doctor. Are you saying that a physician who diagnosed Maya with CRPS was deviating from the accepted standard of care? No, not at all. I'm, I'm saying that he was wrong. I'm not saying he, it's not a violation of the standard of care to be incorrect. All right, so you also, well, let me ask you, between December of 2015 and September of 2016, do you have any photos indicating no dystonia? Sorry, the dates again? December of 2015 through September of 2016. That is leading up to, or even up to the day of getting in, going into Johns Hopkins. There were three October photos. 7th. Um, dated 8-16-8-28-8-31-2016 in which her, um, her feet, at least in one of those photos, I can't remember which one, her feet were, were flat. The ankles were 90 degrees. Okay. So, now, is it your opinion then that after the OT, the PT, and the psychotherapy at Tampa General Hospital then, that uh, she should have been cured, or whatever you're calling it, better? No, four, four weeks in a hospital of that sort would not be sufficient to, to not a sufficient amount of time, it wasn't the right, I mean, she was seeing a psychologist, but the problem was not yet identified, and the therapy the psychologist was using, if any, was not being directed specifically to what the problem was. So no, that, that was why Tampa General recommended that she transition to the outpatient pain setting, uh, where, the, where the therapy could be more directed for what her problem was. All right, and then the 13 weeks at Johns Hopkins then, uh, were they doing things correctly? Yes. Okay. Well, under your program, I think you said that the type of psychotherapy they should receive is, is virtually daily, correct? No, it's, it's, it's our program provides it uh, weekly or biweekly, twice a week for patients who are doing okay, but if they're, if they're refractory and uh, still struggling after several weeks of once or twice a week physical therapy, once or twice a week psychotherapy, we bring them into our program where they can have that daily. Did you or did you not tell this jury just before lunch that under your program there was intensive psychotherapy virtually every day? Oh, in our, that, that was in our rehabilitation program, yes, that's exactly right. Do you know how many hours of psychotherapy, psychological therapy, that Maya Kowalski received during her three months at Johns Hopkins? I don't, I don't know. I did not add it up or look at the billing records. Well, for it to have worked, for them to have done what they needed to do, about how many hours do you think? Well, it depends on the diagnosis, doesn't it? So um, it, it's not CRPS, and it depends exactly on what's going on. And with psychological problems, of course, you can't give a pat answer if somebody comes in with depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, you can't say, well, I'll make you better in 10 weeks and then you'll be done. It doesn't work that way. Doctor, you're saying then that you can diagnose whether a patient has CRPS or not without ever seeing or talking to the patient. Is that right? Well, I can read now upwards of 10,000 pages of medical records from three different institutions and draw a conclusion based on that and some photographs that she doesn't have CRPS. I can't, you know, I, I can also, you know, uh, diagnose CRPS talking to someone on the telephone and having them do uh, a certain, I can be highly suspicious of it. I can't document CRPS without examining the patient, of course. Well, in fact, you've testified, pre no, you've stated previously that you can diagnose CRPS by telling somebody over the phone to just blow like they're blowing out a candle on the child's arm. Well, I think diagnose was, I know I used that example in a video. It's probably an exaggeration, but there's very few things that will cause that kind of pain for a child. And 
Again, that's in the background of the mother telling me it's one leg, getting a careful medical history, ruling out other things that can cause that, and then in that context, with that picture painted, if, if the pain is so intense that the, the breath of a parent or wind going over it or a sock being dragged over the skin causes that kind of intense pain, yes, I'm very, very suspicious of CRPS. And I would see the patient. Well, one of the main reasons you thought that this may not be CRPS or was not CRPS was you thought it began in both legs, right? It, it began in both legs and then rapidly became profound weakness affecting both arms, both legs, the trunk, and what was called whole body CRPS, which is, first of all, an entity that if it does exist, and it probably doesn't, doesn't exist in children. If it does exist, it doesn't happen within the first few weeks of the, of the problem occurring. There are so many factors, Mr. Anderson, that just don't add up to CRPS. This child's CRPS began in her right ankle following a gymnastics event. You're aware of that? Check the foundation, Your Honor. Overall. Her CRPS didn't develop in her right ankle, Mr. Anderson, because I don't think she had CRPS. And at that time, she was not seen by anybody for the diagnosis of CRPS in her right ankle. So she wasn't diagnosed with CRPS in her right ankle. Uh -huh. so well, nobody diagnosed her with CRPS until she went to an expert on CRPS. Dr. Until she went to Dr. Kirkpatrick. Right? All right. So... Um, Let's just assume the jury believes that her legs turned in in five, six, seven, eight photographs was dystonia, and assume further that the jury has been shown lesions that are look like CRPS lesions, and let's also uh, did it come to your attention that there are photographs of discoloration of her skin. Objection on a compound. Overall, I haven't seen any photographs showing discoloration of her skin. You never saw any photographs of Maya being held down and her clothes taken off to check for CRPS lesions and her knees and palms showing discoloration? Objection, argumentative effect. Did, you, did you see those? Overall. I have not seen photographs of that sort. Okay. Would that affect your opinion if there were photographs of color changes? Oh. Yeah, well, it would depend on the color changes, the location. Well, would it change your opinion if there were objective measurements of one leg to another and so much as two inches difference because of swelling? Two inches difference? Two inches, you're legs? right, an inch and a half difference. I don't think that's possible. Okay. But let's just say that there was testimony from a board-certified physician that said that. Would that affect your opinion? I would question that. An inch and a half is, is, uh, is five centimeters. is beyond comprehension. Okay. And I would have to know what part of the body we're talking about as well. So, what part of the leg? Are we talking the thigh or the foreleg? I think it was the thigh, but the jury will know. So, if you've got a child that presents to you with extraordinary pain and with variable but still extreme pain upon even brushing her skin, with skin discoloration, with signs of allodynia, with uh, swelling, and the pain begins in one ankle and spreads up from that one extremity and then to the other extremity, wouldn't you agree that CRPS is an appropriate diagnosis? No, not quite. I would agree it's an appropriate possible diagnosis. Uh, there are other possible diagnoses that would need to be considered, and which is why the, the criteria state that if there's no other reason for these, for these changes, then yes, you can diagnose CRPS. Doesn't the Budapest criteria say that if you've got five of those, then you have a diagnosis of CRPS, assuming you don't rule out other things? Five, yes, if there's nothing else to be ruled out. All right. And finally, as to the amount of ketamine, you're, you're not a really big fan of using ketamine, are you? No, that's not true. Well, have you previously told audiences that cannabis, pot, would be better for children than no. ketamine? No. 
You did not say that during a 2018 um, meeting? I think you're taking my Project comments out of, out of context, completely out of context. Can you all come up, please? And have you seen any photographs of Maya Kowalski's reaction to light touch? No. Have you seen any video of it? No, I haven't. I had two six six six. This is from. Uh, October 4th, 2015. But it doesn't feel good when I touch your legs, right? Or the time when I touch your tummy, that feels good, right? Tremors? No, I don't think so. Is that Aldenia? It looks like it could be Aldenia. It's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's pretty strange actually. It's strange in my eyes. It's kind of strange behavior and oftentimes lack of with, withdrawal and you know tremors, tremulousness—not tremors, but tremulousness. 
in response to it. Yeah, it could be allodynia, but it could be other things as well. And that was dystonia too, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Your witness. Mr. Hunter. Just ask you a few questions, Dr. Crane. Appreciate your patience. Uh, council showed you a calendar chart of various infusions by Dr. Hanna. Yes. Uh, that chart does not show the dosages. Yes. And the chart does also also does not show. Excuse me. I'm sorry. The various other medications that were being given at the time, correct? Correct. Uh, do those make a difference? Um, the dosages, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the other medications that were being used by Dr. Hanna? It would, be, it would be good to have that background information. Such as Versed? Yes. Um, we see that there were, there were some diminution in the frequency of infusions in April and May, but then it began to pick back up in June and July, and then once again in September and October. Yes. Is that consistent with a lasting or sustained benefit from ketamine? Our experience and the literature shows that in the case of CRPS yeah, and other... Bolstering. Just, just talk about your experience, though. All right. In, in my experience, Low-dose ketamine infusions in patients with CRPS lasts, oh, let's say, three to six months. Three months on the short end. And is there a difference between single-day infusions and multi-day infusions in your experience? We typically just do multi-day um, multi infusions. Okay. And are these, um, is the need for the, the apparent need for these infusions consistent with any degree of recognizable success of the therapy? Well, when we could, well, first, it, it, the magnitude, the size of these infusions is enormous. 1,000 milligrams, 1,300 milligrams in four hours. It's, it's really unbelievable. And the, the, you say they're not successful because the duration of effect uh, is, is so short, and one would expect her to feel better for a few days, for sure, because she's still got ketamine in her system, and that causes it a euphoric state, which is why it's an abused drug on the street. Uh, council asked you. Uh, well, let me let me back up just a moment. Uh, is this, is dystonia something that can wax and wane? No, no, it can't. Is it, does it become fixed? It, it, well, it would hope it doesn't become fixed. It's a neuromuscular phenomenon, so the muscles are contracting, causing the, the joint to, be, to take that configuration. It can be any joint in the body. If it's not dealt with, then the tendons constrict, the muscles constrict, become permanently fibrotic, and, and then it becomes permanent. Then the only fix is surgical. But uh, dealt with, it's not it's not permanent. But it doesn't come and go. Um, true dystonia does not come and go. Okay. Uh, is the use of intrathecal pain pumps an accepted therapy for CRPS? In no, not at all. Never. Objection never. Never. It's never acceptable therapy. Okay. Why is that? It's way too invasive and way too dangerous. The, the risks are, are too high. Council asked you whether it was a violation of the standard of care to be incorrect. I believe your answer was no. Basically right. Okay. Um, is it a violation of the standard of care to offer the wrong treatment? If it's done in good faith, it depends on, well, it depends on the treatment. Uh, it depends on the treatment. If you were 
If you thought somebody had pneumonia and you were wrong and you gave them an antibiotic in the correct dose and the correct time, no, that, that would not be a violation of the standard of care. That would be being wrong. If you thought or called a patient as having CRPS and gave them 1,000 milligrams of, of uh, ketamine or 1,300 milligrams of ketamine in four hours, yeah, that would be a that is the de delivery of the ketamine that's a violation of the standard of care, not being wrong about the diagnosis. Thank you. No, no. We're going to see how many questions are coming. Ah, okay. Well, there's more coming. discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. All rise. There was exit. out of our presence, doctor. Uh, I need to go over these questions that we're going to ultimately ask you outside of your presence, so I need you to uh, step okay. outside, please. Yes.
Mr. Anderson. Still talking the hallway over there. Miss Lawrence, you're up. Come on. <laughs> Are you going to get to do one of the witnesses? Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> okay. The doctor's back. Uh, doctor, in front of the jury, I'm just going to remind you that you're under oath, okay? Let's bring in the jury. Please be seated, members of the jury. I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no um, investigation and you received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. You have not been approached by anyone about this case. Is that correct? Correct. And you have seen lots of media accounts about this, correct? No. Okay. I will tell you, uh, we are able to ask most, but not all of the questions, but for the vast majority of the questions we are going to be able to ask. And, uh, Doctor, you understand you're still under oath? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Let's start. Oops, I forgot to write the time down. Doctor, how is Maya doing after her discharge from Johns Hopkins Old Children's Hospital? The latest information I have is that she's doing very, very well. The Looking at her physical therapy notes after discharge from January, I think the last note I looked at was in July. She's gone in January from being wheelchair bound, um, unable to bear weight, all of her weight on her feet, having to stand with support, get out of a wheelchair and transfer to a bed or a toilet with support and help. That was how she was in January. She underwent physical therapy roughly twice a week going forward from there. And by July, she's described as, as uh, you know, walking around, uh, no pain complaints. There was a, a quotation from her father in one of, the, I think, the, in the summertime, just describing how well she was doing. And I understand that today she's, she's a high school student. She's doing well. She's in some kind of athletics. So as far as I know, uh, she's doing quite well. What are withdrawal symptoms of someone that is physically dependent on ketamine? Well, I've never seen or heard of anybody in my life getting doses of ketamine like this. 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 milligrams in just a few hours. So. I can't say that I have any experience with that, but I have seen ketamine withdrawal. Uh, back in the old days, with, uh, in when we had kids undergoing radiation therapy at Boston Children's, they would come in every day, Monday through Friday, for six weeks for radiation therapy, and we would have to put them to sleep because you don't want them to move at all when there's a radiation beam going into their body. You want to kill the bad stuff, the cancer, and not the good stuff. So we used to use ketamine. We have better drugs now, but we used to use ketamine. And uh, as we saw with, with Maya, the dose would need to be increased from week to week to week because they, they develop tolerance. That means you need more of the same drug in higher doses to get the same effect. That's tolerance. The other side of that coin is when somebody develops tolerance, they're physically, they become increasingly physically dependent on it. So if you have any drug, that's what happens. And the, the symptoms of withdrawal are going to be the opposite of the symptoms that you're trying to get by using the drug. So think about narcotics. Narcotics make pain go away. Narcotics cause constipation. Narcotics cause drowsiness. The opposite of those three things that happen with withdrawal. They feel pain all over their body. Their bones feel like they're breaking. They have wicked diarrhea. And uh, they're wired. 
absolutely wired. They're not sedated. They're the opposite wired. The same thing is true with every drug, uh, you name it, every single drug. And in fact, in Maya's case, you know, she was treated with steroids for her asthma in high doses. And when those were stopped, she had none of her own steroids in her body and had you know, uh, symptoms that could be attributed to having inadequate steroids and being at risk for infection and things of that sort. So with ketamine, when we used to give ketamine, um, we would see kids sometimes come in on Monday begging for ketamine. They had it Monday through Friday. They go home for the weekend. They're not getting radiation therapy. They come in at 8 o'clock in the morning for the radiation therapy. They can't wait to get their next dose of ketamine. They're, they're anxious, uh, begging, sometimes begging for the ketamine. Uh, they feel pain because it's all the opposite of what ketamine does. So there's no question that ketamine, call it, is addictive, is habit forming. But physical dependence does occur with ketamine. And, uh, and, th and those would be the symptoms that I, I would predict. Fortunately, I've seen it rarely, and I've never seen a kid withdraw after such high doses because I've never heard of such high doses being given before. Is it possible that the, quote, symptoms, end quote, Maya would present as, quote, CRPS, end quote, be withdrawal symptoms? That's a great question. That was one of my hypotheses, especially when she was in the ICU at All Children's Hospital, she, uh, she was showing, she was agitated, she was screaming, she was screaming for ketamine. Those could have been withdrawal symptoms that she was having. And so that's possible. That's definitely possible. What is the half-life of ketamine? Mm, uh, off the top of my head, I, I, I'd have to look it up. I would, I would hazard to guess it's in the range of, sort of like in the range of what morphine is, which would be uh, two or three hours. We have heard testimony that not all physicians that assess Maya, they did not always assess temperature changes or no color changes or assess her skin or other things, the Budapest cry, or, or the other things on the Budapest criteria. Can you make a certain determination that it is not CRPS since you did not assess Maya during this time yourself? Dr. Kirkpatrick and uh, Dr. Hannah described her limbs as being cool. Uh, I don't know what that means. When I have a trial with CRPS, one limb is colder than the other and we use uh, two degrees as the threshold, it's rather arbitrary, of, of whether that's significant or not. Now, how do we assess that? It hurts too much to touch their leg with the back of your hand to see if it feels warm or cold. Uh, you know, and Maya certainly wouldn't have let somebody do that by description. So what I use is um, one of those thermometers where, well, they're very common. They, they didn't used to be common, but you know, you see during the COVID pandemic, you saw people shooting those at your forehead and measuring your temperature. A little laser beam comes out, which shows you where you're aiming at, and it uses infrared to tell you the temperature. So we use one of those. We buy them on Amazon for about 15 bucks, so we don't have to pay a medical supply company $100 for them, but they're the same device. So, and, and they measure temperature very accurately, up to a tenth of a degree. And so we just, we, all, we have a chart, we shoot the big toe, the top of the foot, the ankle, the shin, the back of the calf, the thigh, and we just record those measurements and compare left and right and look for a difference. Then uh, as far as color change goes, that's obvious. Uh, as I said, uh, I, I provided some photographs to Mr. Hunter. He asked me some, for some photographs of what CRPS looked like in my patients. Some of them are really horrendous. Um, we have one leg that's pink, one leg that's deep blue. So that, that's pretty clear. I didn't get that. I, I don't know how Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hanna assessed temperature or anybody else subsequent to that, but I suspect that really wasn't done. Doctor, you stated many times that Maya does not have CRPS, but also stated you never examined her. How can you come to this conclusion? Uh, I can come to that, well, because I've seen a thousand or two thousand cases of CRPS and it's sort of like looking at that scratch on her forehead. You look at that and say, 
That's a scratch. It's probably a fingernail scratch, you know? Um, you just know it when you see it. When you don't see the, what you're expecting to see with CRPS, it's not CRPS. I mean, I could, if you told me somebody was an amputee and I looked at a thick picture of them and they had all four of their arms and legs, I would say, no, they're not an amputee. It's, it's as obvious as that. Um, she did, it didn't look like CRPS. It didn't sound like CRPS by description. Um, you know, in, um, there were some emails that her mother wrote to herself, but in Maya's voice, similar to the, um, the blog that she was putting out. I don't know if that's something you were shown, but in Maya's voice, uh, she's saying she's the youngest patient ever in the world to have total body CRPS. Then she said she's the youngest kid in the world to ever get ketamine coma. Um, well, I don't think she had CRPS. I don't think she had whole body CRPS. What are the odds that this child was the first kid in the world to ever have this? That's how I would say she didn't have CRPS. I don't think the odds are very large that she was the first kid in the world to ever have a condition that nobody else had ever seen before. Is there any medical oversight on the dosing of ketamine? I'm not sure what's meant by medical oversight, except this, that, for example, our hospital specifies an acceptable dosage range for using ketamine outside of an intensive care unit. If you want to use more, you have to be in the intensive care unit, which is impossible. Why is it impossible? For the reason of ketamine, because insurance won't authorize it, the ICU is super busy, and there's just not a bed for something like that. So um, I'm on a email list server of pediatric pain. People, I don't know, thousands of people from all over the world are on that list server. And the question comes up from time to time. Somebody says, hey, we want to start using IV ketamine infusions in our hospital. And they ask for advice. And different, different physicians write in and give the guidelines that are in their hospital. I would say at Stanford, for sure, we have the most liberal guidelines of any children's hospital I know of. And we only allow it to go up to one milligram per kilogram per hour. And as I said earlier, in 20 years, we've only had one kid who needed to go that high. And she was a redhead, and redheads are notorious for needing higher levels of anesthetics than people who don't have red hair. And there's a, there's a chemical reason for that. So um, that's the medical oversight, is there are policies and procedures that hospitals have that say this is what you can do and outside these guardrails you can't do it. Now who enforces that? If I were to write an order for five milligrams per kilogram per hour of ketamine in the hospital, the nurse would say, no, I'm not, do I'm not going to do that. And I might get into an argument with her or him and they would pull out the policy off the web and say, it says right here you can't go there. And that's it. You know, I would be in serious trouble if I really did that. Is it common for a diagnosis of CRPS to be questioned by physicians? Um, I think there was a question Mr. Anderson asked. Um, I think Dr. Elliott about honoring a diagnosis that comes in the hospital. So how could you not honor Dr. Hannah's or Dr. Kirkpatrick's diagnosis? And to that I would say, we don't honor diagnoses. We honor patients, we honor parents, we honor people, but we, a diagnosis is just is an idea, and they're wrong sometimes. You wouldn't want a doctor who accepts a, you from another doctor outside the hospital and just automatically agrees that this is the diagnosis, these are the drugs you should give. You know, it's gonna be your reputation on the line if that's wrong, because you're the one giving the drugs. So you're going to ask the question, is this right? You know, and sometimes it's just really obvious. You have, like in Maya's case, comes into the hospital with a diagnosis of CRPS, pain specialist is called and says, this doesn't look like CRPS, it just doesn't. And, um, and so then you have to take a step back and say, well, it doesn't look like CRPS, what else could account for what we're seeing? And that would be true for any disease. You know, if somebody comes in with a cough and the doc on the outside says, I'm sending this guy in for pneumonia, I want you to treat him with antibiotics. And you put a stethoscope on his chest and say, he doesn't have pneumonia. You do a chest x-ray, he doesn't have pneumonia. You treat him for something else, what he does have. 
Next question. Does the diagnosis of CRPS automatically raise questions of psychiatric issues? No, never. Next question. Do you require IQ tests to treat CRPS or for entry to your pain clinic? Oh, no. Why would we do that? What role would IQ play in pain treatment, assessing uh, meds or source? It would, it would not figure at all. We treat children who are cognitively impaired. Uh, we treat children who are near genius and everything in between. And, um, you know, we, we would treat them no differently, except that when you're treating a cognitively impaired patient, it's challenging to figure out what's going on because they can't really describe it, or an infant for that matter. But no, we don't do IQ tests. And we don't treat anybody differently, whether they're smart or stupid. If in a, quote, breakthrough case, end quote, it was whole body CRPS, would someone experience pain from a charm bracelet, anklet, pulling hair back tight, or application of mascara and makeup? Uh, yes, they would. Um, you know, our children and women, adult women with CRPS, don't shave their leg with CRPS because it hurts so much to drag a razor over it. Um, it hurts to drag a sock over it. They can't wear jeans. Our patients with CRPS, and probably all patients with CRPS in Florida, if it's in their legs, wear shorts 365 days a year because it's too painful to put pants on. Fortunately, you live, I live, in a place where that's okay most of the year. Uh, they live in Boston, I think they're out of luck. But that, that's how painful it is. Yeah, it would hurt. Has any pediatric CRPS case reoccurred in your center? Yes, it has. At what age? It's never reoccurred so far, knock on wood, in children who started at Maya's age, 10 or 11. As I said, those are a favor to take care of because they get better the fastest, and you know they're usually cute little girls, and you feel really good about restoring them back to 100%. Uh, the teenagers tend to recur with greater frequency, and we published a paper on CRPS recurrences by sending uh, surveys out to every patient we treated since 1984 and 1994, 1994, which is when I went to Stanford. And um, we sent it out. We got about a 35% response rate, which is pretty good for a survey, especially because we were using addresses and email addresses that were 20 years old, so we didn't know. A lot of the surveys came back as undeliverable. And what we found, we were kind of surprised that, uh, that ongoing pain was much more common than we thought it was going to be. About a third of the patients said they, they had no recurrence at all, no pain. And, uh, the rest of the patients had some kind of pain. Fortunately, most of them were mild. There's a, there's a young woman who's now a medical student at Stanford that we took care of a long time ago, 15 years ago. And she's an avid hiker, and she tells me when she goes on a really long hike, her foot hurts afterwards for a couple of days. And that's probably the CRPS. But, so it, it, the pain can be persistent or recurrent, yeah, but it's usually not disabling. And then we have had children whose CRPS has roared back at 100%. They come back, they look sometimes even worse than they did in the first place. It could be a year, two, three, four years later. Then we do the same thing that we always do, and we make it go away again. What was the length between occurrences of symptoms? The length between? The occurrence of symptoms, and it goes back to the question about uh, reoccurrence in your center. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, the, are you asking about the, the evolution of the development of CRPS after an inciting injury? It's usually days, um, maybe a week, two weeks at the most. But usually the change morphs from normal pain, if you want to call it that, to this really excruciating pain. We've had kids, uh, I mean, a, a typical scenario, this is really typical scenario, is. Um, a child injures their ankle or foot on a, in a sport, and they go to the emergency room, a photograph, an x-ray is taken, and the doctor's probably not 
used to looking at pediatric x-rays. They look different than adult x-rays, and they can look a little funny sometimes. It says, well, I'm not sure if there's a fracture, so let's put you in plaster just to be safe. And they put them in plaster, and about five days later, they're in excruciating pain, and <coughs> cut the cast off, and they have CRPS. Uh, because immobilization is one, I think, one of the triggers of CRPS, when you immobilize a limb. In fact, there was a study done by a colleague of mine named Stephen Butler okay, in sir, Sweden. Sir, let, let me just, the, the question I, I, I had to do yeah, okay. was between the length, so. Um, did I answer the question? Typically, a few days to two weeks between an inciting event, if there is one, and the development of CRPS. In terms of recurrences, uh, they can occur um, almost any time, but what I've seen is, I would say, six months to a couple of years for a recurrence. Was it ever, or when has 25 milligrams per kilogram per hour been within the reasonable standard of care or used in practical application? Never, not even for general anesthetic. Never. I've never heard of doses of that sort, that magnitude. In CRPS, final requirement to rule out other diagnoses versus psychiat psychiatric requirement to find the same before diagnosis. Are these directives in conflict here? They were in conflict with what Dr. Hannah and Dr. Kirkpatrick did. They, they didn't, neither of them read the notes from any of the hospitals where she had previously been taken care of. And I think if they had read those notes, they would have stopped and questioned the diagnosis. I hope they would have stopped and questioned the diagnosis. Because I think those notes are very uh, telling. They're, uh, that the, the symptoms that, that um, Maya was exhibiting came and went. And her, her reports of symptoms and what the medical professionals observed, and by medical professionals I'm talking about doctors, therapists, nurses, what they observed and wrote in the chart were very, very different, at, at oftentimes, almost every day, than what was being reported to them by, by Maya or her mother. So that kind of discrepancy, to me, raises red flags. If a child can go from, let's say, feeding herself with both hands, brushing her hair, smiling, to screaming in pain, and, and when a nurse comes in to give her a pill, say she can't lift her arms off the bed to to put the pill in her mouth, there's something wrong there. And it raises red flags. I'm not, I can't say exactly what it was, there's a few possibilities, but, but that isn't how CRPS works, and that should raise questions about the diagnosis. Testimony has described Maya's Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital visit as an, quote, interruption, end quote, in treatment. What was the presumed conclusion of the dosage for ketamine? The presumed conclusion for the dosage of ketamine that she was getting from Hannah was it was it was too high by tenfold. The 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 dose that, that they started in the intensive care unit was three milligrams per kilogram per hour, and that wasn't adequate to stop her from screaming in pain and thrashing. It was raised to five milligrams per kilogram per hour, and nobody felt comfortable going above that. So nobody had ever experienced giving doses higher than that in or out of an operating room. So that's where they leveled that off. Now if you look at um, whether the ACH admission was an interruption in her therapy, I would say it, it, it was and that's a good thing. Because if you look at the overall trajectory from when she was admitted to let's say the next summer, she was better, better the number of drugs that she was on starting with a huge list of drugs and slowly narrowed down to virtually no pain medication at all by the next summer. She's on a little asthma medication, a little allergy medication, but nothing directly for the CRPS. And, and yet, in spite of that, she's doing great in the summertime. And why was she doing great? I think because she wasn't going through periodic ketamine withdrawal, and she was getting physical therapy at agility twice a week, almost twice a week, but twice a week, almost every week, for that entire period of time. And we're showing continuous improvement. A few other things could account for that improvement as well. She's growing up a little bit. Um, uh, 
etc. But the point is that what they did was they put a stop to what was being done by Hannah, and that was a good thing. Now, Doctor, we're about halfway through the question, so let's see okay, if we I'll can just brief. answer the specific question asked. There, there's going to be opportunities for others to ask follow-up, so let's just try to answer that. Okay. The next question, can the CRPS pain starting in a limb radiate to other areas as well? Yes, it, it, it spreads up to the, to the body, can go all the way up to the, um, the thigh, even the lower back, and it can cross over to the other side in some patients. Are most medical treatments for CRPS temporary, although effective for at least some relief? Some patients are lucky enough to never experience CRPS again. And most patients, over 50%, that is to say, uh, do, well, children, over 50%, will have some recurrences later in their adult life. You stated CRPS does not usually reoccur when adolescent girls present with it and are treated. Is it not CPRS a lifelong condition, although fluctuating in severity over time? No, if I said teenage girls don't, it doesn't recur in teenage girls, I misspoke. As I said, it, it typically doesn't recur in 9, 10, 11 year olds. Um, CRPS doesn't even start much before that age for some reason. We don't quite understand. It begins to start as puberty starts to uh, develop. Those kids don't seem to recur. I've never seen one in, in 30 years. The older teenagers will have some recurrence, but as I said, it's about two out of three will have some kind of recurrence, but it's usually mild. I've had my patients under, have childbirth after CRPS in their 20s or 30s and haven't had any kind of recurrence even with that sort of a, a significant event. Uh, but in about a third of patients, it doesn't recur. So is it lifelong in them or are they cured? It's hard to say. I mean, maybe five years later, they will have a recurrence, I don't know. But um, almost all those patients who have CRPS in childhood and adolescence go on to live normal lives. Next question. You testified Maya was in athletics. Can you tell us what she was involved in? Um, maybe I have it in the notes I, I made. Um, let's see if I, if I did that. Skipping forward. Mm. No, I, I didn't write any notes, but I don't remember if it's uh, gymnastic or cheerleading or something. It wasn't like soccer or anything like that. My recollection is it's something like that, but I can't specifically remember without going back into the chart. Next question. You agree with all children's hospitals treatment of ketamine, five milligrams per kilogram per hour and anesthesia dose. Per your testimony, Presidex, a sedative, and Haldol, one milligram IV. With your experience as an anesthesiologist, do you think Maya would have been sedated or do you think these medications could cause a mind-altering state in her and cause her to yell out at staff or cause her personality to be different? She, well, the Presidex at 0 0.7 milligrams per kilogram per hour is, is a, a high, highish dose. 0 0.5 is typical. Uh, so it's not an extraordinarily high dose, but it's a pretty high dose and it's enough to deeply or significantly sedate most, most kids. They'll be arousable, they can wake up and answer questions and move in bed, and then they'll go back to sleep. So she was on that, and she was on ketamine at five, and it, it would be really unusual to be on those two drugs and be awake and screaming. And that was probably the reason, I'm presuming for the hell doll, is because she was a wild woman and they needed to, they needed to control her. They can't have somebody thrashing in bed, pulling out their IVs and things like that. Not to mention disrupting the entire environment by screaming. So Haldol is a 
major sedative that's used it's, uh, to, to calm people down. Now, would she be in an altered state? I don't think so. You said that an interfecal pump is way too dangerous procedure. Who is it that should make that determination, you or the patient? Well, not the patient, for sure. I mean, you don't allow the patient to come in and say, I think you need to take out my appendix, or I need a lobe of my lung removed, or something like that. Um, I mean, they have no idea what the risks of an intrathecal pump are, which includes spinal meningitis. They don't work that long. They tend to clog up, and etc. So intrathecal therapy is something that we use in dying cancer patients, for sure. It's very, very effective. Uh, but they're going to be dead in six months, and so we don't have to worry about whether it's going to work for two years, and uh, we don't have to work, worry about spinal meningitis because, you know, we know that they're dying. So it's not something that we otherwise use in pediatrics. Is CRPS and or the Budapest criteria calls for once CRPS symptoms appear, they are continuous for life or until, quote, cured, end quote, or can they come and go all or in part forever or simply vanish and never appear again? Well, there's a lot of questions in that question. So I'd say that uh, this, this, the physical observation of stuff that goes on with CRPS diminishes during therapy over time. So the leg can remain cold and blue for a while, then it warms up, it's, it's remobilized and reused. And the allodynia goes away slowly. So all those symptoms go away. And once we're done with the child and we think we've restored them, they can have some residual color changes. Those can stay for quite a while. That is to say, their, their leg will kind of turn weird color sometimes. It'll be normal, and then it'll not be normal. But uh, the rest of the symptoms and signs go away unless there's a recurrence and then they come back. Next question. Was I correct in hearing you say that one of the Budapest criteria relating to differences in body part temperatures was Maya did not have a colored or blue leg? Uh, I'm not aware that she had a blue leg or color changes in her leg. And um, and or that she had a difference between right and left in the skin temperature of her leg. Uh, this seems uh, very drastic to meet the Budapest criteria. Cannot differences in body temperatures that are measured by basic gentle touch by non-touch thermometers or is, quote, discoloration, end quote, the criteria? The criteria... Um, are go, go in categories, motor, vascular, skin, um, and uh, the vascular criteria, you don't have to have them all, but uh, it's uh, color changes and temperature changes. You can definitely have one and not the other. But they usually go hand in hand because the color change means lack of blood flow. That's why the leg turns blue, and if there's not blood flow, there's not warm blood getting down into the leg, so the leg's going to feel cold. So they usually go hand in hand. The, uh, the Budapest criteria, I think the question was, are they, are they drastic or something like that? They're very, very useful. And they're not sacrosanct. They're not carved in stone. And sometimes children come in with very early CRPS, and they just haven't blossomed into the full picture. And, but you, you get the feeling that that's, uh, that's, that's where they're going. And, and in, in fact, that is, it tends to be where they go. Next question. Is it your view that if a drug or, quote, way of treatment, end quote, that is approved by the U.S. government is the only valid or allowed treatment? Uh, truthfully, almost nothing we do is FDA approved in children. Almost nothing. So, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, almost every drug that we ever give kids has not been approved for the use in children by the Food and Drug so we're using them. It's called off-label. Next question. I believe past witnesses' testimony used the term titration. And with many drugs, and with many drugs, more may need, may be, let me start again. I believe past witnesses' testimony used the term titration. 
and with many drugs, more may be needed to have the same benefit over time. Is ketamine similar to other medications? That's different than titration. So there's two things in that question. One is titration and one is, is uh, tolerance. So tolerance is when you're using the same drug over time and you need to up the dose to get the same benefit. That happens with opioids, for example. It happens with insulin for diabetics. You know, one dose works and over time they get resistant to it, so you have to give them more and more and more uh, over time. Titration is something that you do, let's say, over minutes or hours or maybe days. You start a drug and you don't get the effect you want, so then you up the dose. So we do that with uh, Neurontin, Gabapentin, for example. We, we start at 100 milligrams a day, but our target is about 1,800 milligrams a day in your average teenager. If you don't give them 1,800 milligrams right off the bat, because number one, they'd have horrible side effects. Number two, you don't know what dose between 100 and 1,800 is going to work for them. So you just slowly ramp it up. That's called titration until you get the effect that you want. Next question. You testified high-dose coma ketamine is not done in the United States. I'd assume it is not FDA approved. Is that yes, no, or It's not other? FDA approved, but that's not why it's not used. Per mm. other medical witnesses, is it, or it is approved in other countries throughout the world, is that correct? Um, Mexico doesn't have an agency like the FDA, so Stuff doesn't get approved or disapproved there. And that's why it's used so freely in Mexico, in Monterey, by Dr. Cantu. Um, <clears throat> there's, the European Union does have a licensing body that's like the FDA that covers all our countries. I don't know what the status of ketamine is, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's being used off-label there as a high dose. And we could use it here. It's not a law, the FDA approving or disapproving. Nobody's going to come and arrest us for doing that. We don't do it. We, you know, the medical community doesn't use ketamine coma because it hasn't been shown to be effective and it's highly dangerous. As Cantu said, there was a 50% chance of Maya dying. Now, I think that's a little bit high, but still, I mean, it's dangerous. And uh, we don't do it because it's dangerous, not because of anything the FDA says. Next question. You stated that you do, at times, use ketamine in low doses to treat CRPS, is that correct? That's correct. In terms I can better understand, low dose ketamine over time, is it like chlorine tablet floating in a pool to help control make water better? Would not a period of high ketamine then be like a quote shock treatment, end quote, in a pool which has its benefits as well? Well, I've heard a lot of analogies to humans and medicine, but never a swimming pool before. Um, as a general rule, um, more is not better. I mean, if you give if you give 500 milligrams of penicillin to somebody, does that mean 2,000 milligrams is going to be better? And the answer is no. Why? Because 500 is enough, and the higher you go, the more toxicity you have, the more side effects you have, the more danger you have. So uh, more is not better, and uh, shock treatments, we don't, we don't do that to the human body. It, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Okay, we're on the last page. Only four more questions to go. In 2016, was CRPS a well-understood ailment? Yes. In 2016, was CRPS a curable illness? Well, for, I want to modify well understood. Uh, we, as I said, we, we don't know, and we didn't know in 2016, the exact cause of it. So there's a lot of science that's been done, a lot of biologists looking at it. We know there's changes in the spinal cord, there's changes in the nerves out in the body, there's infl inflammation. We don't, all these things are associated with CRPS. We don't know what actually causes it. We don't know why nobody gets it before the age of 10 or so. Uh, we don't know why it's eight times more common in females than in males. We have no idea. So we don't understand it in that sense, but we definitely understand what it is. Like we can, see, when we see it, we know it, and uh, we know how to treat it with the available tools that we have, which are far from perfect, but this is what we got. Um, second question was uh, in 2016: Was CRPS a curable illness? No, and it was not. And it, it, I wouldn't call it curable. 
I would say it's something that goes into remission, hopefully for a long time in those patients who do have CRPS, uh, for whatever reason, you know, is it luck, is it genetics, I don't know, but uh, it's, I would hesitate to say that it's really curable, except possibly again for those 10-year-old girls. Uh, I've never seen it recur in them, and I've never heard of it from anybody else, but curable is a very strong word, I, I'd be hesitant to use it. In 2023, is CRPS now a well-understood ailment? It's not much well better understood than it was in 2016, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a confusing disease. You just, just don't know why, why people get it and what causes it, what the basic mechanisms are. And the next and last question, in 2023, is there a medication or drug that will cure CRPS? Oh, I wish there were. Nope. Okay. Mr. Hunter, you're up next with any follow-ups. Mr. Anderson, you're up next with any follow-ups. every drug, right? No, I didn't say almost every drug. Some of them. But, but most of the drugs? No, not even most of the drugs. That took, that took several weeks. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't we, would it refresh your recollection to actually look at the discharge summary to see? Overruled. You can continue, Mr. Anderson. Next one. Okay. So I'm sorry, you're right. The beginning of the first one, the first page has the number one and two. All right, aquaphor. Uh, Not a drug. It's runs a, a trial. It's Let's go. On the next one. All right, acetaminophen, albuterol, baclofen. That's a prescription, is it not? Yes, it is. Uh huh. So is albuterol, is it not? Yes. All right, cetirizine. Is right. Let me let me. She's obviously going to leave on asthma medications and allergy medications because she had asthma and allergy when she came in. Okay. So albuterol and and cetirizine are allergy and asthma medications. So obviously, and the same is true for um, the, uh, there is uh, the uh, the flow vent, uh, both nasal and inhalation. Those are asthma medications. Then there's several vitamins on here. There's uh, get the vitamin D. There's a laxative, Miralax. Like, show me a kid these days who's not on Miralax. Uh, so she's she's going to. It's a lot of medications, multi multivitamins. Those are not going to be taken away at this point in time. Uh, it'll be up to her pediatrician to decide if she needs those in the long term. So okay. what she's on for CRPS or pain uh, is pregabalin. Yeah. That's it. No, 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 what you told the jury, did you not, that because of the care and treatment of Johns Hopkins over this three-month period, that her asthma was much better as well. Did you not? No, I didn't say that. Okay. But it looks to me like there are at least six different prescription drugs that she was checked out with and over 14 different substances listed. Do you agree with that? Not over 14, there's 14 exactly listed. Some are drugs and some are not. And uh, yeah, so she, okay. 14, some are drugs, some are not. And the pain medications that she was taking when she came in are not on the list. You were telling us that the ketamine coma uh, is, is dangerous, highly dangerous. Do you know that over the past 10 years, Dr. Cantu has been performing these, that there has never been a single death or major injury from them? Well, Mr. Anderson, he's doing this in Monterey, Mexico. There's no report of a single death or a single injury, but how do we really know that? And so he's just stowing the bodies in the backyard or something? I mean, how, why wouldn't there that, be? Sir. I'm just saying we don't really I'm, know. There's no data. I, I will sustain the argumentative um, <laughs> objection. I'll withdraw. Then as to Dr. Kirk, excuse me, uh, Dr. Hanna, are you where he has 
treated over 18,000 patients with his infusions, some up over 2,000 milligrams over four hours. Objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation and problem patient. Well, I'm testifying all about these men. I would like to know if 18, you're aware of that. 18,000 patients yep. in his practice? Yep. I don't believe it. Okay. All right. Let's just say if he comes in and testifies to that, that's how many. Wouldn't you expect out of that many patients that at some point, if it was so dangerous what he was doing, his titration, there would be at least one or two bad results? Objection, argument. Sustained on that one. What many bad results have you discovered in all of your intensive uh, examination of these facts? What bad results have you seen from either Dr. Cantu's ketamine coma or from Dr. Hanna's infusions? Objection, Your Honor. I like the foundation and argument overruled. You can answer. In Dr. Cantu's hands, Maya developed a multimicrobial pneumonia requiring antibiotics uh, and it could have been a life threatening pneumonia. Uh, she also may have aspirated. There was one time when she vomited with the endotracheal tube in, and there's notation uh, in one of uh, Beata's emails that the nurses had to jump on her, and there was suctioning the vomit out of her mouth and suctioning her, her tracheal tube, that breathing tube, to clear material out of that. That might have been the source of her pneumonia, for all I know. But a, a multimicrobial, which means Different, several different kinds of germs, bacteria. Uh, uh, multimicrobial pneumonia is not trivial. It's very dangerous. So um, I, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I can't say that she came to no harm. She, she did come to harm. Uh -huh. As far as um, uh, doctor, did you ask me about Dr. Hanna's treatment of her? She, he was giving her humongous doses of ketamine. Uh, she was losing weight. She had abdominal pain. She wound up in the hospital. I can't say that there was no harm from that. No, I was asking you about statistics. Whether you have any statistics or reported cases, let's leave your view of what happened with Maya aside. Any reported cases or statistics from either physician indicating the procedures they were using were causing injury or death. You, you can answer that overrule. Are you asking me, did Cantu and Hannah report their their problems? I'm asking you whether any patients came forward, or the government agencies came forward, whether Dr. Cantu himself came forward, whether Dr. Hannah himself came forward, whether their family, friends, anybody else ever came forward with any information you've been able to find Objection. that either one of these procedures caused a serious injury or death. I'm going to overrule the objection. You can answer it, then let's move on, Mr. Anderson. Well, I, I have not. I have not. I'm not a detective. I did not go after Cantu and Hannah and look to see if in their practices they had harmed anybody. You, you didn't go after Han Cantu and Hannah? Uh, okay, so... How would, I, how would I know the answer to that question? I, I, didn't, I haven't gone through the files and, and police records uh -huh. or lawsuits. I haven't gone through the databases to see if Hannah's ever been sued before, or if anybody has raised a claim or made a claim to the medical board. All these things are possible. I have no idea. Probably not. I mean, probably it's all under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, this is called the suicide disease, is it not? No, I've never heard that term. You've never heard of CRPS being called the suicide disease? Never, I've never heard that. All right. Have you ever had any patients commit suicide as a result of um, CRPS. Uh, when we did our survey, we found one patient who had, actually her parents filled out the survey, she was 30 years old, and she had committed suicide. But when she left our practice, she was in remission, and then she was, uh, she overdosed on OxyContin. Where she got the OxyContin, from whom, I have no idea, but it was an OxyContin overdose, not sure if it was a suicide or not. Were there actually three others did you have three other suicides? No. Okay. So ketamine is FDA approved, and it is true, is it not, that there is no FDA upper limit to its use? Well, it's, it's approved as a general anesthetic. Yes. Right. 
and it's proved to be titrated to the anesthesiologist's judgment of effect, right? To, to perform general anesthesia and surgery. It's not approved for neuropathic pain, complex regional pain syndrome, etc. Well, it, right now it says it's as an orphan drug, is it not? Well, as I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with using it off-label without FDA approval. But the question was, is it approved? Yes, it's approved for general anesthesia, but not for anything else. But the idea is it titrates an experienced anesthesiologist using it for whatever purpose they've got, treatment of pain, or I guess during the course of a uh, surgery. It's the anesthesiologist's judgment to titrate to effect, is it not? No. So you just ma press a magic button and you know that amount is the right amount under each circumstance? No, no, no. You, you Sustained. Well, would you agree with me that the judgment of the anesthesiologist is very important in determining the amount of a particular anesthetic given during a procedure? During an operation? Yes. And the goal is to achieve efficacy, that is, a positive response to whatever medication you're using. During surgery, Correct. the goal is to have the patient unconscious. Right. So now, in Dr. Cantu's case, you were talking about harm to, I guess, Maya, and you said it was from an infection, right? Mm -hmm. That yes. was not caused by the ketamine. That was caused by the fact of intubation, wasn't it? No, absolutely not. Wasn't it treated within a matter of four or five? I thought he just did. No, no, no. The intubation was done to protect her airway so that she wouldn't get pneumonia. And she would be able to be, they, they could breathe for her. The intubation was necessary. That's why we do it in the operating room. Perhaps, That's not what caused the pneumonia. Perhaps I misspoke. The ketamine as a chemical, a drug in her body, did not prompt the development of bacteria. It was the fact that there was a tube down her throat no. that produced this. No. True? No, you, no, no, no. Um, that's not how it works. The ketamine rendered her unable to breathe effectively and unable to protect her airway from aspiration. Therefore, the tube was put in to protect her airway. So in that sense, the ketamine was not the immediate cause of her pneumonia. But it was the cause because without the ketamine, she wouldn't have needed the tube, she wouldn't have needed the ventilator, and she, she wouldn't have developed the pneumonia. How many patients have you intubated in your career? Many thousands. Thousands of them. Thousands. And through the course of your intubations, you have from time to time seen this exact same occurrence, that is the development of a, um, a bacterial infection. Um, bacterial infections occur in intensive care patients who are on ventilators because they right. cannot cough effectively and clear secretions. So the fact of an intubation in and of itself is an accepted medical procedure, true? True. And in this instance, this infection was resolved within less than 18 hours through the use of broad-based antibiotics. Don't the records reveal that? I don't have, I don't have Dr. Cantu's records. I okay. don't think they're, they're, well, they're in the record here. We don't going know. on Beata Kowalski's? Can the witness finish his answer? Sure. We don't have medical records. Uh, we can't say that it was within 18 hours. I don't know her fever curve. I don't know what her sputum was like. There was such enough by the nurses. I don't know if he ever repeated the cultures. I have no idea. Right. So but, you're not aware of the testimony of Dr. Cantu here about that? I, I, what I'm saying is I don't have the records to show that she resolved it within 18 hours. It's possible. Okay. I'm just saying the record doesn't reflect that. You also were talking about uh, withdrawal symptoms from ketamine. And is it true that ketamine does not directly affect the opioid sensors in the brain? That's true. And through the course of this, I, the one thing I recognize is you said as part of withdrawal symptoms, you would expect someone to be wired, right? Uh, ketamine withdrawal? Yes. Benzodiazepine withdrawal, morphine with withdrawal? Yeah. Yeah, but we're specifically Actually, talking about... I mean, wired is such a, it's not a good term. I regret using that. Let's say anxious and agitated. 
All right. What objective signs accompany agitation and what was your other term? I said anxious. Anxious and agitation, is that right? Yes. Okay. What physiological signs of agitation and anxiety will you have? Would you expect? Physiological signs? By what do you mean physiological? Well, would you expect a, an elevated blood pressure? Possibly. Elevated heart rate? Probably. Would you expect in the medical records themselves some statement by the patient of being anxious or being agitated? Perhaps. Children don't generally say I'm anxious. Uh -huh. Well, and you can see their agitation, they don't need to tell you that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Nowhere in any of these records did you see any indication of an increase in blood pressure, an increase in heart rate, and a statement of any type that the ch child felt agitation? Children don't feel agitated, they act agitated, and people observe that agitation, and she certainly was agitated. And the fact that there aren't vital signs that you might expect to go along with it opens a whole other can of worms. I don't know if you want to go there, but you'll probably... She was, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I shouldn't. She was agitated for a grand total of about five hours, was she not? On October 7th. And, yeah, and then she went to sleep, right. Five hours, right? Meaning what? And they gave her an antipsychotic, either that night or the next, right? That's right. And they kept her on an antipsychotic for most of her stay, did they not? No, I don't think it was most of her stay. At least for the next four weeks. That wasn't most of her stay, but they did keep her on for a period of time to control the video. Anything else, Mr. Anderson? Um, by the court's question, I do not believe so. <laughs> You're free to ask whatever questions you want. Thank you, Judge. Um, Anything further, Mr. Hunter? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, there are any more questions? May this doctor be excused. You may, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank oh, you. oh, before we forget, uh, the report that you were reviewing, I need you to give it to the clerk so we can have it marked to for identification. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, the clerk was going to come up and wrestle me if I didn't do that. So. <laughs> Yeah, he's got a whole file. Yeah, there's a whole file there we wanted to mark, Judge. Did, did you review, Doctor, did you review any of the other papers in your file during your testimony? This is the same. This is not a copy. This is the other stuff. That just said the same. Yeah, why don't you show it How to How about the judge? stuff that's in your actual folder? Um, did you review? Just tell me if you reviewed it or not. Yeah, I just got these last night. Okay, from okay. Counsel, I'll, yes, I read these. So, you know, let's can't hand it to the... Okay. I, I don't need you to tell me what it is. Just right. hand the court deputy anything that you looked at. Right, I looked at that. While he was on the stand, Your Honor, is that While he was on the stand. Oh, you're on the stand. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Your next witness, Mr. Hunter. Um, <coughs> Mr. Shapiro. Yeah, you, would you like us to proceed forward, Your Honor? I do, and... You know, in another half an hour to an hour, we'll take a break. Sure. Uh, the defense calls Dr. Paula Dees. Good afternoon. 
If you could introduce yourself to the jury, please. Sure, my name is Paula Ballester Dees. Okay, and Dr. Dees, what is your profession? I am a pediatric hospitalist at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Well, what is a pediatric hospitalist? A hospitalist is a pediatrician that specializes in take caring, taking care of hospitalized children, so outside of the ICU, but on the general medical service. So let's go back a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, where did you get your medical degree? Um, my medical degree I obtained at Florida State uh, College of Medicine. Okay. And what did you do after obtaining your medical degree? I attended pediatric residency at the University of South Florida, training both at Tampa General Hospital and at All Children's Hospital. Um, and then after graduating residency, uh, I stayed on and was hired as an attending physician at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and I have been there for the entirety of my career since. Um, during your training or your residency, did you receive any awards or honors? I did. Um, I would have to refer to my CV for an, an, a, a complete list, but um, during medical school I was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society, which recognizes top academic performers in medical school. Um, I was also inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society, both in medical school and residency. That Honor Society is a peer-nominated process. Um, identifying physicians that are felt to be kind of exemplary, uh, em empathetic, and compassionate physicians. Um, are you board certified? I am, both in pediatrics and have my subspecialty certification in pediatric hospital medicine. And uh, you may have said it, I apologize. Um, how long have you been uh, in, with All Children's Hospital? Uh, I did complete my residency training and did training at All Children's. Um, I have been an attending physician at Johns Hopkins All Children since June of 2011. So just had my 12 year anniversary as an attending, but if you include the three years of residency training, I've been there for almost 15 years now. And I think you touched on it earlier, but if you could explain to the jury, what does a hospitalist do? Uh, so a hospitalist is a pediatrician that takes care of patients that are hosp that require hospitalization. So their medical condition is severe enough to require hospitalization and not just be managed by their pediatrician as an outpatient or in the clinic setting. So if a patient comes in um, and needs to stay overnight for whatever condition, we will continue to evaluate them, monitor and treat them throughout the course of their hospitalization. Um, we often work with other subspecialists and consultants. We have a multidisciplinary team at our disposal there at the hospital. We kind of think of ourselves as like a quarterback, so to speak. So we are typically in charge of the case in most scenarios, although we do consult on other cases but we'll typically then put together a team of specialists, whether we also include things like physical therapy, speech therapy, et cetera, um, and kind of coordinate the care between all those subspecialists and serve as kind of the main um, attending physician for the care. Um, did you have a chance to care for Maya Kowalski during her hospitalization at All Children's between October 7th, uh, 2016, until she was discharged in January of 2017? I did. Okay. I'm going to walk you through a couple of your encounters and okay. see if we can um, get an idea of what you provided care for. We're going to start with Joint Exhibit 1001-0425. Uh, okay, and if you can go into the second half of that page where it starts with hospitalists. So, um, doctor, you, you uh, we see two names here after the yes. word hospitalists. Um, uh, one is yours, and then there's someone named Patrick Del Santo. Can you explain who that is? Uh, Patrick was one of our residents at the time. Um, we are a teaching service at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, so we can typically, uh, as part of our hospital medicine team, can have medical students, residents, um, and so uh, Dr. Del Santo was one of our residents at the time. So how does that work, um, if you could explain to the jury? Do, do you see the patient? Does the resident see the patient? How does that work? Sure, great question. So typically what happens is the residents will come in in the morning, they'll begin to review all of the charts, review the electronic medical record, they'll go and examine the patient prior to round, so we call that like the pre-rounding process, 
and then we get together as a as a team and we'll go around room to room and see the families and the patients together the residents will typically present the case to me as the attending physician um, and so ultimately it is my responsibility to have oversight and to supervise their care ensure that if i um, perhaps would disagree or have additional comments or thoughts that I would add that in. Um, with respect to the documentation, typically the residents will generate the note. They are physicians that have graduated medical school and have training. Um, so they will generate the note, but then it is my responsibility as part of my duties as a, an attending physician to review their note, ensure that it's accurate and complete, and try to um, add any additional comments that I may have um, based on my experience or my visit. So to answer your question, I do see the patient every day. Um, sometimes we may all be together as a group with the residents. Sometimes I may have seen the patient independently if the residents are rounding independently that day. But I will still see the patient um, unless there's an extenuating circumstance like uh, for example, if the patient's in the operating room and I'm not able to track them down, I think there was one date where Maya was in therapies and in the gym and I had a hard time kind of tracking her down, but that was an isolated, that would be an exception, not the rule. The rule is that I see them every single day. So let's go to the next page if we can, 0426. At the top, there's something that says progress note. What's a progress note? A progress note is our account of just the daily encounter. So there are several different types of documentation that um, we would complete on my service. For example, when a patient first enters the healthcare system in our hospital, we would perform a history and physical. Um, and then from there on out, you perform daily progress notes to kind of document the updates, what happened um, in the preceding 24 hours or overnight, um, capture any new uh, laboratory tests or results that have be become available, try to synthesize any um, recommendations from specialists, uh, document the updated physical exam, and the updated assessment and plan for the day. Okay. Um, so if we can, right below that it says uh, no acute events overnight, do you see that? Yes. Um, what, what, what is being documented here? So typically in the subjective portion of the note, we typically start by summarizing if there were any acute events overnight. From a medical perspective, we're really trying to capture was there a code, was there a significant decompensation event, did the patient have unstable vital signs overnight. So that is kind of what that sentence is capturing. And then we kind of go through, depending on what the patient's presenting complaint or diagnosis may be, kind of talk about pertinent positives and negatives. Are they doing better? Are they doing worse? Are they the same from when they entered the hospital? Are there any new symptoms? Are there any uh, improvement in symptoms? Things like that. What does PO intake mean? Uh, per oral, so oral, so eating or drinking by mouth. Let's go to the fourth page of your note, which is 0428. Um, there's some free text at the top that starts with Maya's a 10-year-old girl. Do you see that, doctor? I do. Okay. Um, you noted a uh, complex PMH. What is PMH? Past medical history. And you noted a possible diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. Doctor, my question is, to you is, based on your time treating Maya Kowalski, did you believe she had CRPS? Uh, by the end of my time taking care of Maya and reviewing the totality of her case, her symptoms, her physical examination, and the medical records that I was able to review, not only internally within our facility, but also externally from other providers that had previously cared for Maya, I did not believe that Maya had CRPS. And why? CRPS is a very rare diagnosis. It is... Um, a, a challenging uh, syndrome um, because there is not a blood test or a radiologic study or anything that or biopsy that we can do to definitively rule it in or rule it out. Um, CRPS is a usually a peripheral nerve or pain disorder, typically chronic in nature. Um, and what we see is that there is reported pain significantly out of proportion to whatever may have caused the initial injury to that area. But by definition, when you look at complex regional pain syndrome, it is a regional pain syndrome. So it typically will involve a, an extremity, and it's usually the, what we call the distal part of the extremity, so more likely to be 
like a hand or a foot or perhaps the lower part of the leg, but it is not a global pain syndrome. By definition, it is a regional pain syndrome. When we see patients with CRPS, as I have treated many patients with CRPS in my career, um, we will also typically see associated symptoms affecting that distal extremity, such as things like swelling, color change, temperature change. They may have what we call dystrophic changes, where there's changes of the skin or hair or nails, and that affected region of their limb compared to the other side. So when we are looking at those cases, those are some of the signs and symptoms that we're looking for. Um, there's also typically complaints of severe pain in that region um, to where they may have something that we call like allodynia, where something that typically should not cause pain, either a light touch, a blanket, a shirt, something just superficially touching that area becomes exquisitely painful. Um, but it is, to my knowledge, never uh, a global overall pain disorder. So there were several factors specific to Maya's case that as I learned her, met her, and again reviewed all of the medical records, examined her, um, that just caused me to question whether that was the correct diagnosis because she actually had really no features that were consistent with CRPS. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Let me okay. go to the second half of your note where it starts with planned medical decision making. Sure. Um, it, in, uh, about halfway down, it says, continues with diffuse body pain secondary to pain medication dependence now being what, what did you mean by that statement? So that's a, a part of the note that the resident would have written, and that is their perception or their interpretation. Um, when Maya entered our health system, she had been receiving what I, I can only characterize as superhuman doses of ketamine. Um, and it is likely that she had some form of physical dependence to those uh, excessively high doses of drugs. Um, and so through the guidance and recommendation of the multidisciplinary team that was taking care of Maya prior to her being transferred out of the ICU, they had begun the process to try to wean her off of those medications. Certainly she was under close surveillance to try to ensure that that process was done as comfortably to her as possible, but there can be discomfort in that process. A little lower in your note, you noted that the, um, I think it's below this one, that uh, the parents wanted an intrathecal clonidine during the admission? Your Honor, we object to the reading of the medical records. I'll, I'll, I didn't mean to lead to this, but there was a reason. Anyway, um, if, you, if you go to the bottom part of the note, uh, not this one, but just below it, um, there was a, re did, was there a request for a clonidine pump? That request was not made to me directly, but it was passed along to me Objection that... Objection hearsay? Um, let me ask you about um, the next page, 429. Um, number four, uh, what are you describing here? Um, so uh, Maya had a port, which is a reservoir under the skin that is used to access the patient's vascular system to either draw blood uh, or administer medications. And that has a risk of being becoming infected or developing blood clots. Um, and so we constantly want to surveil and monitor that area to ensure that there is no signs of complication. So on this day, we noted that she had a small erythematous means red. So just a small red area. Um, an induration means uh, the soft tissues are kind of inflamed. Um, so there is an area of red inflamed tissue um, over her port. So we are drawing attention to the fact that there could be a potential developing infection or complication associated with her port and that we were monitoring that very closely. Um, what happens if a port becomes infected? Uh, if a port becomes infected, it can develop um, in a range of symptoms all the way up to a life-threatening 
um, infections such as sepsis, where the body becomes overwhelmed with infection and has uh, struggles to compensate, um, and you can actually um, die from sepsis. So that is the, the range of anything from a superficial skin infection all the way to the potential for death. Um, I wanted to ask you about an order, which is at 1001-1079. Uh, Um, and it's the uh, second one down where it says um, order for seizure monitoring unit. Correct. I, I do. Um, who, who is uh, Dr. Amy Dallasania? She was another one of our residents at the time. Was this order placed pursuant to your request? Yes. Okay. Well, why are you ordering um, seizure monitoring? Um, so we were trying to move Maya to a room that had a closed circuit video capability. Um, so the name of those beds is our seizure monitoring unit. Um, my concern in learning Maya, meeting Maya, and evaluating her, um, and also learning of other reports um, from colleagues and consultants in the case was that Maya had a repeated discrepancies noted in what she said she could do and what she would be observed doing when she wasn't aware that she was being observed, so to speak. So for example, and we may get to it, but there is um, a, a, a time where we, you know, we'll ask her, can you move your legs? And she would say no. But then later that same day, I would see her holding her legs up in such a way and crossing her feet to where someone that can't move their legs would not be able to do that. So as part of my diagnostic evaluation and trying to really go through and do my due diligence to see what I felt her true underlying diagnosis and disorder was, I wanted to be able to observe her in a way because there was differences in her performance when someone was a medical provider was talking to her and asking her questions and asking her to perform and what she was probably doing, whether it was consciously or subconsciously, I can't say, when she wasn't directly being asked to perform. So by putting her in that room with the closed video monitoring, we would be able to, for example, I wanted to know like when she was sleeping, would she roll over in the bed? Would she be kicking and kind of moving her legs? Both of which are things that she would not produce for us voluntarily, but we were curious to know what would happen when perhaps she was either in the room alone or when she was sleeping. Was the uh, your order for an E for the video surveillance for clinical and diagnostic reasons? Correct. Yes, okay. it was. Um, I'm gonna the, let me ask this: the room that Maya was in before you moved her into the uh, monitoring room. Yes. Did that have cameras on the scene? No. Okay. So the the general patient rooms do not have surveillance cameras. Correct. Sure. Do do the general patient rooms have cameras? No. Um, the, uh, if I may approach, Your Honor, I was going to have the witness. You may. Okay. Just show Mr. Whitney, since apparently this is his witness. <laughs> Mr. Whitney, you're up. Uh, doctor, I've handed you what I've marked for identification as Defense Exhibit 3304-1. Um, uh, what room is this? Uh, that's room 709. Is this the room that Maya was moved into for the video surveillance? Yes, it was. Uh, does this photo represent a, a true and accurate depiction of what the room looks like with the exception of the bed? Yes, I was going to say, it, with exception of the bed, the crib obviously would not be in there for Maya. She would have had a regular hospital bed. But yes, the room otherwise looks the same. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the windows, the location machines, everything else would have been the same back in 2016? Correct. We have on the seizure monitoring floor, we have, I believe it's uh, maybe eight, nine, ten beds that are equipped with the remote video monitoring. They look like every other room in the hospital in terms of on the general medical floors. Of course, the ICUs and the neonatal in intensive care units are a little bit different. But um, we often will have patients even in the seizure monitoring rooms that aren't necessarily being monitored because they function 
look, feel exactly like all of the other rooms. There's no difference on the side of the patient. It's just more of whether we need that video monitoring capability or not. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to move into evidence Defense Exhibit 3304 and publish it to the jury. No objection. Okay. Court receives Exhibit 3304. Can we put that up on the screen, please? So you, you told the jury, uh, obviously, well, what... What would be different from what the jury is seeing here for the video monitoring room versus how it would have looked? Was it the bed? Is that the difference? Just the bed, correct. Okay. And this would be the room that you had ordered Maya to be transferred to for video surveillance? Correct. I just, I didn't request like a specific room, but yes, we just requested for her to be moved to one of the rooms that had video uh, monitoring capabilities. How, how many are there, do you know? I believe it's eight to 10, I want to say, because um, I think it's 701 through 709 or 710. Um, let me show you what I've marked as uh, what's been marked and moved into evidence as 3002-0002, which is the consent for medical treatment. 3002. And uh, if you could take out the top where it says consent to treatment in that first paragraph, and yes. I question you, doctor, did you believe you had consent to do video monitoring? Objection. Calls for legal conclusion. Sustained. Um, Doc, doctor, why did you uh, not reach out to the Kowalskis to ask them for uh, their consent to move Maya into video monitoring? Same objection. Call for legal conclusion. Overruled. You can answer that one. Because the use of video monitoring is covered in our general consent to treat, so it is not something that we request separate authorization or consent for. Um, in addition, in this specific circumstance, alerting them to the possibility of video monitoring prospectively or proactively prior to it being done could have potentially compromised the diagnostic value of the study. Um, let me ask you about, um, during this time, in your, in your honor, I may lead a little bit here, uh, during this time, you were aware that Dr. Sally Smith was conducting a forensic investigation. Is that true? Correct. Okay. Um, was Dr. Sally Smith aware? Well, let me ask this. Uh, are you aware of whether Dr. Sally Smith also wanted to have uh, video surveillance? Objection, cost of speculation. In chapter 39. In chapter 39. Thank you. Were you, during this time, and when I say during this time, let me set the stage. October 18th, 2016, were you texting with Dr. Sally Smith? Yes. Why? Uh, I am obligated by law to cooperate. Objection. This is going right into it.
go ahead and ask a different question. Sure. Um, can you put up uh, exhibit and evidence? I think it's exhibit 2116. Showing you some text messages that you had between uh, you and Dr. Sally Smith. Why were you texting with her? I just wanted to let Dr. Smith know that I was taking over as the attending that day and to just reach out and ensure that there was nothing that I needed to do to help cooperate with her investigation as I'm obligated to do. Um, was Dr. Sally Smith a part of the treatment team at All Children's? No. In the text message, the jury may have a question of, about you using Maya Kowalski's full name. Correct. Okay. Uh, should you use that identifier over text? In retrospect, probably not. It probably would have been more appropriate to use initials rather than her first and last name. But to be clear, the order that you had your resident place for EEG monitoring, that was your decision, irrespective of what Dr. Sally Smith may or may not have wanted. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. Um, let me ask you about uh, Joint Exhibit 1001-421. Um, it looks like the next time you saw oh, um, Maya, you were caring for her on October 19th? Yes. And just briefly, it is, how does this work as a hospice? Do you generally care for a patient for like a week and then... Rotate off, does it? It depends. During this time, we were more in a, um, where we would do, you know, five to seven days in a row, but we don't have a, a predictable, like, week on, week off model. Um, it's shift work. Um, when we are on the teaching service, we do prefer to try to have as much continuity as possible, obviously mainly for the patient's sake, so that they have a consistent phase for several days in a row but also from a teaching perspective so we can help evaluate the residents and their performance. Okay. Under the interval history, uh, what does it say? Uh, that there were no acute events again overnight and that she had been transferred to room 709 for monitoring. Let, let, me, let me stop you there. Sure. Oh, oh go, ahead. go ahead, you can finish. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, just that she continued to have pain all over and reported that she was able to sleep uh, a little more overnight and that her oral intake appeared to be slowly improving. Okay. Let me uh, show to you and publish what's been received into evidence as video, which is Defense Exhibit 3085-1. 3085-1. What is this, Doctor? Uh, that appears to be Maya um, and one of our nurses performing hands-on care. And this is this from the uh, monitoring room? Yes. Presumably that would be from the monitoring room. And this was I don't room. see like a date stamp or anything, but. Okay. Well, I'll represent to you. Sure. That this was the, uh, some footage from the surveillance. Uh, and if you can play that one more time, if you don't mind, just so you can watch. And what's the nurse doing here? Uh, um, applying a blood pressure cuff to be able to take blood pressure. Let me show you what has been uh, received in evidence as 3085-2. I'll represent you. This is also from the monitoring room. What's the nurse doing here? Oh, looks like she's brushing her hair. show you what's been uh, marked into evidence as 3085-3. And is that also from the monitoring room? Yes. And let me show you what's been, what's, what's happening in this video. Uh, looks like she's got a phone up to her left ear and then is painting or drawing, presumably. It's a little grainy with her right hand. And let me show you what's been marked in evidence as 3085-4. 
what's what, what's the nurse doing here? It looks like she's helping Maya transfer to a bedside commode. Well, why is the bedside commode placed there versus right next to the bed? Well, there, there has to be a space in between the bed and the bedside commode because otherwise you can't, like, just think about it, you can't kind of get into it. So you have to be able to get your legs off of the bed, stand up, pivot, turn around, and then sit down. So we try to place it so that there is enough room not only for the patient to maneuver, but because she was needing help, there's got to be enough room for the nurse to maneuver with them. Obviously, we don't want to put it too far away where it's unsafe and they have to take multiple steps if it's a patient, for example, that has a fall risk or a weakness. Um, but that's why there has to be at least a little margin of room for them to maneuver around and get her safely to the bedside commode. So let's go back to 1001-0421. And it would be your progress note from after uh, Maya had spent the night in the monitoring room. Okay. Um, when you say no acute events overnight, that well, how, how do you arrive at that information? We gather that from the review of the nursing notes um, and documentation from the nurses, from review of the vital sign and just the medical chart in general. So based on your review of the chart, your review of the nursing notes and speaking with the nurses, was anything reported to you or anything that you saw where Maya had any events at all overnight in the EEG monitor? No, sir. Let me ask you about... Um, uh, the last page of that note, which is at 0425. Um, under the attending physician note, if you can pull that out. Um, take, take a moment and read it to yourself, and then I'll have a question for you, doctor. Okay. Um, so if you could explain to the jury, there's a part that starts where it says resident with the following comments, colon. Is, that, is this your observations or the residents, or how does that work? So correct. So after that highlighted portion, after that second colon where it starts with saw Maya, that's my um, attestation. Those are my additional comments. Okay. And um, what was significant to you? As we previously discussed, when asked to move her legs, Maya would tell us that she could not and that she did not have voluntary motor function of her lower extremities. But when I saw her on the unit that day, the way that she um, was being pushed in a wheelchair, the footrests were not down. So someone that has no ability to control their legs would need to have their feet placed on those footrests to prevent them from dragging under the chair and potentially being injured. But Maya was able to hold her legs up um, and not only keep them held up, but cross them. And again, Maya's complaints were that she had severe pain all over her body and could not even tolerate certain portions of our physical exam, like auscultation with a stethoscope. But as you've even seen in the other videos, she would have clothes on, she had stuffies all around her, she would be playing and touching things, and those things would not cause her pain only when we would try to examine her. So the fact that she could not only cross her legs without pain and keep them voluntarily lifted to prevent herself from being injured indicated to me that she did have some degree of awareness and ability to control her legs more so than she was telling us when we would ask her to perform certain tasks. Let me ask you about the next time you saw Maya, which would be the next day on October 20th, which is at uh, Joint Exhibit 1001-0417. And um, again, you would have been rounding or seeing Maya, I say round a bit, yes. seeing Maya with your resident, and who is your resident at this time? Uh, still Dr. Del Santo. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the first part of your note. Why, why did you document about Maya's eating? Maya had um, concerns for some chronic malnutrition and poor weight gain, um, abdominal pain, um, esophageal candidiasis, and so it was important for us to monitor her nutritional status and to monitor her weight while she was in the hospital. 
So it's just important to comment that she was eating and not experiencing any active pain as she was eating in front of me. But what is esophageal uh, candidiasis? Uh, so the esophagus is the muscular tube that connects your mouth down to your stomach. Um, and she had a effectively a candida is a type of yeast infection of that that was um, seen when she underwent um, an upper endoscopy. Let me ask you about your next note, which is at 0412. This, the last one was October 20th. This one's at October 21st. Um, and it's just the way this prints where we'll flip pages. But again, um, at the bottom, it shows uh, your progress note. Is that right with Dr. Del Santo? Correct. Let's go to the next page at 0413. Um, under the interval history, uh, how is Maya doing overnight? Uh, again, no acute events. Um, her weight was noted. She was again complaining of pain all over. Um, however, her mood was noted to be improved. She was asking the resident if the table could be moved closer to her bed so that she could eat. Um, and she was uh, tolerating oral intake, meaning she wasn't having vomiting or complaints of abdominal pain. Um, but declining Pediasure, which is a nutritional supplement that our pediatric dietitian had recommended to help with her chronic malnutrition. Okay. Um, let's go to the next day's note at 0409. Uh, again, did you have a chance to uh, evaluate Maya the next day on October 22nd? Yes. And um, what, did, what was your interval history? Uh, again, that there were no acute events. Um, is, uh, is this the same one? Oh, so that she had been tolerating more um, oral intake and finding foods that she liked. Again, complaining of pain all over and still refusing the uh, pediatric supplements. Okay, and then your last note for the week is October 23rd. That's at 0405. And what was your interval history that day? Uh, no acute events. Uh, again, noting the weight, continued to refuse any nutritional supplementation, saying she doesn't like them. Reports that she was hurting a lot, um, but had no fever, chills, or vomiting documented. Um, the next note you have is at 0373, which is a little over a week later on Halloween, so we can go to that one. <clears throat> and um, who are you now rounding with? at the bottom uh, the hospice. resident during that time was Dr. Chow Song okay. um, if you take a look at your addendum for a moment yes you want to move it Reg sure take that down for a sec Yeah, sure. You won't be able to read my hand as long as she can. Um, go ahead and take a read through your addendum and let me know what you've done. Correct. 
for the 31st or for the 1st? Because they're both. Uh, for the 31st at the bottom of the page. Yes, sir. No problem. You can hold on to that. I actually have another copy. Well, my question to you is, on the October 31st when you came back on, was it your recommendation to remove the port? Yes. And why? Uh, based on my review of Maya's case, um, including her physical exam, her presenting complaints, her uh, medical record, both internally and externally, that I had access to. Um, I did not believe that there was an indication for her to have the port. Um, the decision to have a port has to be made based on indications for long-term therapy requiring frequent accessing, frequent IV pokes, frequent treatment. Um, and often is reserved. Um, so for example, patients undergoing chemotherapy um, requiring a lot of intensive treatments. Um, uh, in some cases, we may have patients that have central venous access because they've been through so many procedures that they just don't have any good IV sites left. Um, at the time that we were treating Maya and that I was treating Maya, there was no indication for any IV therapy. Um, and there was no plans for any ongoing IV therapy um, based on the recommendations from our team. So when we're making medical decisions about what is in the patient's best interest, we have to obviously, like anything, weigh risks and benefits. And I really was concerned that the potential risks to Maya, already having seen that she had had that infiltration in that red area prior, the risk of infection, the risk of clotting, which both independently could lead to death, concerned me that I felt that it was important that I advocate and recommend um, that the port be removed because I really thought that the risks were much more than any potential benefit to my own. Let me ask you, thank you for that, and I'll come and take the note. So let me ask you about the next time that you saw Maya, which was November 1st, and that's a uh, joint exhibit 1001-0369. And at the bottom, um, what was the interval history? Uh, that the patient was seen earlier in the morning in bed in no acute distress, continued to review uh, refused supplements and still complained of pain all over, but was seen playing with her stuffed animals. Okay. Let me take you to the, uh, near the end of your note at 0373. And then, um, yes, that, if you could expand it down to the second paragraph as well only, the first two where it ends with her signature. Okay. Um, take, a, take a moment and read it to yourself, then I have a couple of questions. Okay. Did you have a chance to have a conversation with Mrs. Kowalski about port removal? I did via phone. And did you recommend to Mrs. Kowalski that the port be removed? I did. Um, during that conversation, did Mrs. Kowalski ask you about uh, medications? Yes. Um, there's reference in here to pure compounded dextromethorphan. Uh, what is that? Uh, my familiarity with dextromethorphan is that it is a cough suppressant. Okay. Um, and did that, was that indicated to you based on your uh, evaluation of Maya at that time? No. Um, and then the next drug that Mrs. Kowalski asked you about was uh, 
Naltrexone, is that right? Correct. And what is that drug for? Naltrexone can be used, uh, for example, in alcoholic patients to help reduce craving, patients that have been um, addicted or dependent upon opioids to reduce cravings. Um, we have patients sometimes who, if they have like picking or self-injurious behavior, it can be used to try to help curb that drive to want to injure themselves and pick at wounds and injuries. Um, so I did not um, believe Med that there was an indication or uh, for that treatment ongoing. And the next drug is uh, Nemenda. What is that drug? My familiarity with Nemenda is that it's typically, it's like an Alzheimer's type drug or we use it for arousal or awareness or alertness in patients that may have had traumatic brain injuries. And it, was that, in your opinion, as the treating physician, medically indicated for mine? No. And the last drug is uh, Nudexta. What is that drug? I honestly, I don't even have personal familiar or professional familiarity with Nudexta. I looked it up at the time, I'm sure, um, because I did not have familiarity with it, but I don't remember at this current moment what what that research entailed. Thank you. I have one more question, or I'd just like to approach real quick. Um, not at this time, and I thank you for your time. Okay, members of the jury, five minutes. Not not my statement to my wife, five minutes. <laughs> actual five minutes. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. All rise. Who was next? Okay. your testimony, but if you want to get up stretch, you okay. Thank you. Just make sure back and forth. Do I leave my belongings here? There, there's, there's enough that you can leave it here. Okay.
questions directed at. Uh, Dr. D is just walking in. Do you want her inside or outside? Outside, preferably. Dr. D, if you could wait outside, please. And Dr. D is out of our presence. There were several questions directed at uh, the consent form and consent for the treatment, the alleged treatment in the EEG room and the port. I'd like to ask the witness a question about her awareness of the parents retaining medical decision-making power during Maya's time in the hospital. I, I, I object for the same reasons of the draft. I mean, it's going to ask her for a legal conclusion on this. And, and, and I would say, Mr. Whitney, I, in the draft that we're going to be talking about as soon as the jury goes home, there's a provision in there that we leave in a statement saying, that the parents retain um, their, their well, medical rights. Understood. Well, medical rights. I understood. I won't ask. Okay. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Are you ready to bring in the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, do you want me to get the witness? Oh, yeah, let's get the, jury, the witness back. Right. Always a prerequisite for having a jury trial. Have <laughs> <laughs> a witness? I don't know. <laughs> Members of the jury, I want to confirm why you're away. You did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And did anyone approach you about the case? No, for five minutes we were gone. No. And uh, did you see any media coverage in the last five minutes? No. Mr. Whitney, your turn. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Deese. Good afternoon. You were previously deposed in this case. Do you recall that? I do. You do not have any expertise in complex regional pain syndrome, do you? I am not like a registered expert, no, sir. Yeah, you testified that under your assessment, you believed, your words, at the end, that Maya did not have CRPS. Is that right? Correct. When did you arrive at that determination? I couldn't give you an exact date. I'm sorry. You can't tell us which date? There's no date that I decided that she did not have the diagnosis. I can say that by the end of the time I took care of her, that that was my impression, yes. So your last interaction with her, if I was following, was November 1st or 2nd? I believe it was more like the 7th, I think. All right, about the 7th of November, that'd be the end of your time with her, right? Correct. So by that point, you'd reached an opinion that Maya did not have complex regional pain syndrome. Correct. As part of the treatment team. You were um, part of the treatment team. I was part of the treatment team. All right, correct. so the jury should be looking for bills for CRPS after November 7th. Correct? I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. All right. Now, you understand that complex regional pain syndrome is not equivalent to paralysis, right? Correct. So the fact that Maya could move her legs does not indicate she did not have complex regional pain syndrome. That in and of itself, no. However, there were other factors that I took into consideration. You also understand that Crossing your legs, a child crossing their legs, is the most comfortable, excuse me, the most comfortable position for a child with CRPS. Were you aware of that? I am not aware of that being a medical standard of comfort. You've never talked to any physical therapists about that being a common position for CRPS I've never, children? I have never been told by a physical therapist that that is the most comfortable position for specifically a patient with CRPS. All right. The 48-hour video that Maya did not consent to, that was for treatment, right? It was more for diagnostic purposes. All right. Where in the medical record are any notes concerning interpretation, follow-up, a report about what you learned during those 48 hours? Uh, it was part of my overall assessment that it was 
that was part of the factors that were taken into consideration. Nowhere in your notes do you have any findings or interpretation of what occurred inside that room in 48 hours, do you? There was notes made while she was in the room, yes, and observations that were made and documented, yes, while she was in the room. Let's pull up exhibit 211, the text messages, 2116, please. And if you'd focus on the fourth text message there, if you blow that up for me. Just pull out the fourth text message and enlarge it, please. This is your text on October 19th to Dr. Sally Smith, right? Yes. It says staff has been making notes while watching her remotely, right? Correct. Why aren't the staff notes in the medical record? I can't answer that. We've never seen them. Have you? No. But this was for treatment? No, it was for diagnosis. Diagnosis as part of the care and treatment for Maya Kowalski <sighs> while she's inside of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Correct. All right. And you're exchanging here text messages with Dr. Sally Smith about diagnosis for the purposes of care and treatment while Maya Kowalski's in the hospital, right? Correct. So your position is Sally Smith is not part of the treatment team? Dr. Smith is not part of the treatment team. All right. If you would please... Yeah, you're on the need approach. If you, if we're going to come back to these, but if you could please publish two two seven seven dash zero zero six eight. Dr. Deese, I'll represent to you. This is a note from the risk management file. Objections Foundation. Um, Take a moment to review it.
recognize your name on that note? I do. And who's the other physician there listed with you? Uh, Dr. Smith. Mm -hmm. And below doc, uh, Drs. Deese and Sally Smith, it says, okay from risk. Is risk management at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital often, often making the diagnostic and treatment decisions for the patients? No. No? No. But you still maintain this is for care and treatment, this EEG video? Yes. What does it say there in the diagonal right end at the bottom right? Can you read that? Uh, I have, uh, don't know, do, do, no, was there, 709. Let me try. Not, able to yeah, do I'm sorry, no I, I've never seen this before, and it's not my handwriting, so I have no clue what that says. There it is. Able to do when no one was there. Well, you see that? Continue. 709 was the room you put her in, right? That was the room she was placed in, correct. And this, this note here is consistent with your rationale, right? You were trying to see what Maya could do when no one was there. I, I don't understand your statement. Could you rephrase the question? Sure. You testified earlier that you were looking for inconsistencies and movements and things that Maya said she couldn't do, but she could do. And the thought was, if you put her in a room without telling her, you'd be able to see things she does when no one was there, right? That is correct. All right. You can zoom out for a second, please. And then October 18th and 20th, the third line down, it says on the right side there, I don't know if you can read that, it says to see if she can walk on her own. Okay. Consistent with the rationale you had for putting her in this room for 48 hours, right? Presumably, if that's what that says, my reason for placing her in the room was not specifically to see if she could walk on her own. It was to see if she could perform any spontaneous movement of her lower extremities. You thought, putting in her room under video surveillance, that you would catch her doing something not knowing the hospital was watching. True? Could you rephrase that? I'm sorry. You thought that by putting this 10-year-old girl in this room under video surveillance, you would catch her doing something that she said she couldn't do, but she wasn't aware she was doing while the hospital was watching her. My intent when putting her in the room was to assess what she was able to do when no one was watching her. It wasn't in an intent to trick her or to catch her doing something. It was to assess what her functional abilities were when she wasn't directly being asked to perform by a member of the medical team. And yet, in all the notes we looked at, there's no assessment following this 48-hour video, is there? It is included in my total assessment, yes. By saying no acute events overnight, that's it? No, it is in my entire assessment of the patient. It is all part of incorporated in there. Let's go back to the text messages for a second. Again, that's 2116. Let's look at the second page, text 15. If you'll pull out text 15 and enlarge it for me, please. <coughs> Here is Dr. Sally Smith to you on October 21st, right? Okay. And it says, probably already in progress, but get her off as many, there's a typo. Would you agree with me that meds was what was tender, as many meds as possible? Um, my interpretation, I agree with you that it was probably a typo, and that is probably what she was saying is meds, not mess. All right. Removing medications from a patient. You'd agree with me that that's a treatment and care decision. Correct. Sally Smith's involved in this decision, is she not? No. She's not. She's texting you about it, but she's not involved. She may have recommendations or suggestions, but ultimately the decision as to uh, would be mine as the attending provider. So you maintain, despite going back and forth with Dr. Smith on medications, that she was not part of the treatment team? Well, as this text indi indicated, she suspected that we were already in the progress of doing it anyway, so she's just offering her opinion. She's not telling me what to do. And you removed those medications too, didn't you? The medications that were adjusted during my time as her attending physician were part of a discussion with the overall treatment plan and experts such as Dr. Hart, who is one of our consultants, our pain team, etc.
The answer is you removed her from medications during this time, right? The answer is I would have to review the MAR specifically to know what medications were adjusted or at least refer to my notes. All right, let's go to the next text message. 16, would you blow that up for me? It says, yep, let coming, last med coming off today. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. You did remove medications during this time? We did adjust medications during her hospitalization, yes. All right, if we could put up 10010426 again. And I just note here, these text messages about medications were on the 21st of October. Okay. All right. No, 0426, please. <coughs> Top line, Maya reported she's having pain all over. Correct. And this is, looks like October 18th. Let's go to 0421, please. Um, about three quarters of the way down. Maya continues to have pain all over. You see that? I do. And this note is from, if you could zoom out for a second, October 19th. If you could go to 0413, please. Complaining of pain all over, about a third of the way down. You see that? I do. And this date, if we see it here, oh, October 21st, the same day your text message, right? Okay. So you're moving in from medications, and she's telling you she has pain all over, right? Yes. All right. 0409, please. 22nd, next day, complains of pain all over. You'd agree? Yes. All right. 0405. She is hurting a lot. See that? I do. The 23rd? I do. All right. 0369. You picked her back up in the first week of November, right, as a hospitalist? Correct. And here, what she say? Complains of pain all over? Yes. Can we please put up 2045-024? You recognize the patient bill of rights for the hospital? I do. Would you please take a look at number 19 there? It's at the top right. Yes. Maya had the right to have her pain managed, did she not? She did. And she told you on one, two, three, four, five, six different occasions as you were moving from medications that she had pain all over, did she not? She did. Who's Dr. Major? Uh, one of my colleagues, one of the hospitalists. She's a hospitalist on service with you, right? She was. And she was at the time of Maya's admission in 2016? I don't know when she took care of her in the course of Maya's hospitalization, but I do know that she took care of her during Maya's stay at some point in time, yes. You worked with her, yes. and you traded off uh, as hospitalists on rotation Correct. during Maya's admission to Johns Hopkins. And she was involved at some point in time, yes. All right. Well, if we could put up 1002-006, which I'll represent to you as Maya's discharge note. And if you would please pull out the bottom paragraph there. And the third line down, if you'd highlight it for me, what does this say about Sally Smith as part of the treatment team? Doctors. The approach. You can put it back up, please. Just focus on that line again. So Dr. Major wrote that Sally Smith was heavily involved in her care, did she not? That is what is documented, correct. Should the jury disregard Dr. Major's testimony if they hear from her going forward? 
objection, foundation, speculation. <clears throat> On those two, I'm going to overrule uh, this one. <clears throat> Argumentative. Sustained. <laughs> I withdraw. One for three. Not bad. You can take that down, please. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No further questions this time. Why are you reducing medications for my pain medications? That's a great question. As we discussed previously, there were a lot of inconsistencies with Maya's reports of her symptoms, with what she said she could and couldn't do versus what we would objectively um, observe. When you think of someone that is experiencing 10 out of 10 pain, all over pain, it would be exceptionally uncommon for not only days, but weeks in a row to have that sustained level of pain to where you are simultaneously calm, smiling, playful. So although I absolutely agree and I'm very passionate about ensuring that our patients have their pain well controlled, we have to have an indication to treat them and their pain. So we don't use, you know, morphine or ketamine or Dilaudid, these big, strong narcotic pain medications, for example, for a scrape, right? We have to assess the patient's reported level of pain against the objective information as to why they would be in that type of pain and then select pain medication that would therefore treat that type of pain. So because we did not feel as a medical team that Maya's condition was consistent with CRPS, there was not an indication to continue to escalate her pain, especially when she was not observed, at least I can only speak from my own personal experience, having any type of outward demonstration that she was actually in significant pain. I've treated, I don't know an exact number, but thousands of patients over my career, and when we are... Let, yeah, let me, let me redirect on this. The, the decision to start and stop pain medicine, yes. was that made by you? That was made in collaboration with our pain specialists and physiatrists, yes. And the pain specialists and physiatrists, those are the all children's employed pain specialists? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, your, in going through the chart, have you seen a single order from Dr. Sally Smith in that chart? No. So if the jury goes to the medical record of all children, they're not going to see Sally Smith ordering anything for this patient, is that right? I obviously would have to review them all personally, but I am not aware of her entering any orders directly um, in this case. Um, why are you communicating with Dr. Sally Smith? I am, so Dr. Smith is the only child abuse expert and is the medical director of the child protection, child protection team in Pinellas County. She is our expert. She is the only one. I would be committing malpractice if I did not communicate with her as a specialist, in addition to me being legally obligated to cooperate with her and communicate with her on this case. So we, let me ask you about that. Is it your understanding that you have a legal obligation to talk with Dr. Sally Smith if she requests her input? Objection calls for legal conclusion. She can answer that question. 100%. Okay. Um, couple other questions. Uh, you were asked about whether the EEG, the surveillance room, gave you any information. Was it significant to you to look at the video and see whether Maya could tolerate a blood pressure cuff? Um, that was... I can answer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so those were those accounts were passed on to me, yes, that there were things like, for example, her being able to tolerate um, blood pressure readings, her being able to tolerate transfers, her being able to tolerate playing, touch with play, moving her legs, all of those in totality 
were all considered as part of our overall evaluation and treatment <coughs> of Maya. Um, why isn't Maya's name on the door? Um, you mean like in terms of a placard right. under her, under the yeah, room on number? on the outside of the door. Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I can speculate that sometimes when our patients are sheltered by the state that we have different practices with respect to um, labeling their names, but I'm not 100% sure if that was why in Maya's case her name wasn't there. Uh, why do patients move rooms? Um, for a variety of reasons, obviously in this uh, reason, you know, we needed that specific room because of its capabilities. Patient also will transfer rooms, for example, if they're having a change in service, they're moving to a different, they need to go to the ICU, they're transferring from the ICU to the floor. Um, there may be, um, even within units, like for example, our different ICUs, may, different rooms may have different capabilities. We may move patients for different type of isolation purposes. Some rooms are equipped with reverse isolation, for example, in a patient with suspected tuberculosis. We do them at certain intervals during prolonged hospitalizations just to provide an in-depth cleaning of that room because if we have patients that have been in the hospital for weeks, we have certain Definitely protocols. Do, do, do you move patients so you can do a deep cleaning of the room? Yes, that's what I was just explaining when I was... Um, Okay. Um, lastly, do you remember an incident towards the end of your care uh, on around November 5th where you were able to observe Maya using her legs in a certain way? I do. Can you tell the jury about that? Yes. So I was conducting my rounds that day um, on my own without my resident team and um, the door was kind of propped open a little bit, and so I was approaching her door to come in and say hi. She was uh, seated in her wheelchair kind of at the foot of the bed. Um, there was a child outside in the hallway that kind of started to run towards her room, so instinctively I kind of grabbed the door quickly to try to close and prevent that child from running into the room. And in the moment, Maya was obviously interested in, in the kind of the quickness, presumably, of what was happening and me shutting the door and heard the commotion outside and propelled her legs several pace, paces to propel her wheelchair forward so she could look and see outside and see what was happening. And was that one of the instances where you were able to observe Maya being able to physically do things that she told you she could not? Yes, sir. One moment here. I appreciate your time. I don't have any other questions at this time. Thank you, sir. I have a few more. Sure. So Maya wanted to see another kid at the hospital? Presumably she was trying to figure out what the commotion was, yes. Were you aware during this time that her social contact with her children had been cut off by Kathy Beatty? Objection to uh, foundation speculation. I was... I was never under the impression at any point in time that Maya had had social cut off <coughs> contact with other people cut off by Kathy Beatty. <clears throat> but to be clear, her offense was wheeling her wheelchair to try to interact with another child, right? I don't know. Did you object? Sorry, I didn't. No. No, okay, sorry. Um, I never said that there was an offense. What my observation that I shared was is that Maya reported she could not voluntarily move her legs and that because of that event, I was able to see her not only move her legs, but move them with a very defined and intentional purpose to propel her wheelchair forward. And CRPS is not paralysis? Correct. Right. They are not synonyms. And no. then regarding Maya reporting pain to you day after day after day after day, you just didn't believe her, did you? It's not a matter of not believing her, but I did not believe that the pain that she was reporting was... Um, in any way supported by objective evidence and was not consistent given how long she had been making those complaints over the days and days and days that she maintained absolutely no change. Because and you didn't see the pain, you ignored her complaints. Mm -hmm. Sustained. It didn't matter what Maya told you about pain, did it? No, that's not true at all. No further questions. I just have one yard. Um, the, the insinuation that Maya was cut off, Maya was allowed to go to recreational therapy. Absolutely. Music therapy. Yes. Uh, and she was allowed to, not just allowed, but encouraged to interact with all the other children there, which not. 
Correct. Within the rules of obviously, you know, we have patients that are on isolation and we can't cross contaminate certain things. But yes, she had volunteers. She frequently had people in her room playing with her. So yes, I, I am unaware at any point in time that Maya was restricted in any way from having what would be normal hospital policy protocol visitations interactions with other patients and staff. Thank you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Jury is out of our presence. Uh, Dr. Dees, if I could have you go s sit outside yeah. for a few minutes.
Mr. Altenburn, is Mr. Alligate going to be joining us somehow? Or? All rise, there is that break. Okay, everyone, please be seated. Members of the jury, I just want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did no investigation, and did not receive any information. Is that correct? correct. No uh, one approached you? Correct. And didn't see anything about the case, correct? Okay, um, Dr. Dees was out of our presence, so this will be the first time she's hearing these. Um, There's a number of questions. Did you testify that it was your idea to place Maya under video surveillance? It was my decision, yes, to move forward with the video surveillance. Why did you ask Dr. Smith how long she wanted to keep Maya on video? Dr. Smith also had recommended video surveillance for her kind of, I guess, forensic or legal portion of it. Um, and so I had reached out to risk because I was unfamiliar with that portion of it. Um, certainly, it made sense to me for us to both complete our portions of our investigations and in a kind of coordinated and simultaneous way rather than like moving her back and forth and uh, back and forth. Um, so that's why my portion, I felt that I had enough information to help me with my decision making, but just needed to ensure if she was also done or if she needed more time for the legal portion of it. You also uh, texted Dr. Smith asking her if she wanted to review camera footage from Maya's surveillance. Why? Uh, because she had requested the surveillance as part of her legal uh, case and forensic case. Who was on the care team with you? So those would be internal providers at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. So everyone from myself, my consultants, my residents, our nurses, our physical therapy, occupational therapy, pain team, um, all of our internal providers that were part of her care team. Does CRPS pain change daily? Uh, presumably it can, of course, yes. If Maya complained about having pain all over how does Maya address herself? That's a great question. I'm, I can't answer that on her behalf. The, the October 18th progress note. Why is pain, quote, all over, end quote, in quotes? So when we're teaching our residents about involvement in cases that are, um, you know, child abuse, medical child abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, things like that, where we understand that there's a high likelihood that there will be, um, you know, court proceedings, legal things. We try to explain to them that it's important to not interpret a patient's symptoms and, and document their interpretation of the patient symptoms, but to simply ask them the question and then put their response in quotes, because we want to make sure that we're not changing what the patient reports and that we're just factually gathering that information and then reporting it as they've stated it. Were you presupposed to doubting Maya? No. How many CRPS patients, pediatric patients, had you treated before Maya? I don't have an exact number. I would say uh, it's hard to kind of extract the past six years of experience that have past or six, seven years, um, I would say at least a handful at that time, if not two handfuls, but it's kind of it, maybe five to ten, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but more than just Maya, certainly. How many CRPS pediatric patients have been treated at All Children's Hospital before Maya? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Next question. Would you be willing to admit that sometimes staff in high-stress service jobs develop family-like relationships uh, supportive of one another as the work is arduous and prolonged? That is certainly a possibility, yes. All Children's Hospital has had a number of long-term staff members and even ancillary service members who seem, parentheses, Sally Smith in parentheses, 
to have, quote, deep, root, deep roots, end quote, at All Children's Hospital. How would you describe these relationships as almost familial? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Is the question asking that there have been a lot of staff members that have had longevity at the hospital and how how do we how do we interact with each other as a family? I'm sorry. I, I think for follow-up, if the lawyers feel they need to or if the jury feels they can follow up, uh, they can. But I'm just reading it as it's... Do you mind repeating it to see if... Uh, sure. All Children's Hospital has had a number of long-term staff members and even ancillary service members who seem, parentheses, Sally Smith, in parentheses, to have, quote, deep roots, end quote, at All Children's Hospital. Okay. How would you describe these relationships as almost familial? Or maybe it's, would you describe these relationships as almost familial? I can only speak from my personal experience being a... Uh, a physician that tr not only trained as a medical student, I did a rotation at All Children's, then completed my residency training, then have stayed on as an attending. From my own personal experience, I can't speak to Dr. Smith or, or for or on behalf of other members of the medical staff. Uh, some of my very best and dearest friends are colleagues, absolutely. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of of working for Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital is the caliber of physicians, nurses, consultants, team members that work in our institution. Everyone is committed to taking care of kids, doing it in a high quality, evidence-based and compassionate and family-centered way. We definitely uh, all support each other and are there for each other. Um, but I have never had concerns about boundaries of personal um, relationships compromising our professional integrity or compromising our ability to remain objective in the face of a challenging case, for example. So if, I hope that that answers your question. Did you observe Maya being denied religious ceremony? No, never. Did you ever hear about Maya requesting religious ceremonies? No, not to my re well, recollection, no. Is it within normal expectations that most kids struggle to eat hospital food? <laughs> well, so in theory, hospital food usually is uh, thought to be unpalatable, but I do think that we have, you know, we're a pediatric hospital. We're pretty friendly towards, you know, we've got ice cream and milkshakes and cookies and stuff like that. It's not like, I guess, what you would see on TV where it looks like a TV dinner and it looks like it's this frozen, you know, horrific reheated mess. So absolutely, are there some kids that don't like our food? Of course, right? I mean, everybody has their own personal preferences. But have I seen kids order SpaghettiOs and Pop-Tarts for breakfast and they're sitting there eating it like it's the best combination and I'm sitting there nauseous because I don't understand how they could possibly eat that combination of food? that too right so it just depends but um you know it each case is so different and each child is so different so it's kind of hard to make a global global assessment of that did maya struggle to gain weight and consume desserts maya, i don't know about desserts specifically i remember she was eating a lot of graham crackers from my notes but I don't know specifically more than that about desserts. Um, there was a history of struggling to gain weight, but she did have improvement um, in her weight during the hospitalization. What kind of oversight did a hospitalist have over Kathy Beatty's position, if any at all? Uh, so the social work department has their own reporting structure, and we don't we are not responsible for the oversight of their like, standards of care, professionalism, conduct, um, proficiencies, et cetera, anything like that. Um, they are certainly, part, the social workers are an invaluable part of our teams, um, but we don't have a direct responsibility to um, monitor or evaluate or ensure their practice um, standards, if that makes sense. As the coordinating hospitalist, did your work require you to interact with Kathy Beatty? Yes. 
does a child's overall treatment in the hospital have an effect over their recovery and length of treatment in your experiences? Do you mind repeating the question one more time, please? Sure. Does a child's overall treatment in the hospital have an effect over their recovery and length of treatment in your experience? So that's a difficult question to answer because there are so many different diagnoses that I treat as a hospitalist. So I can treat anything from asthma to pneumonia to seizures. I, uh, you know, on a daily basis, treat kids with multiple chronic medical conditions like Cerebral, cerebral palsy and, uh, you know, dysphagia to where they have gastrostomy tubes and feeding tubes. So it's really hard for me to think of all of my patients as one to be able to answer that question because there are some kids that absolutely without coming into the hospital would not get better on their own, right? And, and so I feel like we help them recover more quickly. Um, there are certainly, I'm sure, some cases where there are prolonged hospitalizations that that dynamic, um, you know, being away from families, which of course is stressful and hard, um, being away from their support networks, that I, I could definitely foresee where there are situations where maybe that could impact their path to recovery. But overall, you know, of course, and, and you know, that that's our job is to try to help them we want them to get better and to get them back to back home or wherever it is that they came from some kids come to us from skilled nursing facilities and we send them back there but our goal is to get them medically stabilized to make sure that there's no longer need for acute inpatient services before we transition them back um, to where they are so that they can continue to thrive and do all the things that we love to see kids doing Next question, what floor did you work on take place? And I'm assuming that means when you were with uh, Michael. So my general uh, areas that I work in in the hospital are the seventh and eighth floors. Those, that's where the majority of my patients are. Occasionally I have to go see patients on the second floor, which is like our perioperative areas. Um, we go down to the EC to consult on patients or to admit patients. Uh, I'll go down to the ICUs to transition patients either in or out of the ICU, but my main kind of domain or territory that we typically practice and round on are the seventh and eighth floors. Who was the Kathy Beatty of those floors? The social worker that covered the seventh and eighth floors? Yes. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that I'll be able to remember people's names that far back. Um, I believe Yvonne Walton was one of our social workers that that I inter I remember interacting with a lot um, during that time period, but I don't know that I can remember anyone else's name. I'm sorry. Do these positions normally stick to a patient on multiple floors? It's possible, so it depends on the patient and the diagnosis. Sometimes. And the, the staffing models for the social work department have changed over the years when I've been there. Sometimes it's kind of diagnosis specific where they follow a cohort of patients, right? Uh, for example, our neuros, maybe neurosurgery patients, regardless of whether they're in the ICU or in the OR or on the floor, that same social worker potentially could follow them. So it is possible that um, at different times there are different models. Sometimes it's strictly geographic. If you're on this floor, that's who sees you. Sometimes it's population-based. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it was at the specific time that Maya um, was with us. When you switch a patient from room to room, do you just move them and there is no explanation or reason given to the patient? Um, so I would assume that when we are moving them for like a, you know, a clean and there's a family there and they're asking that we would certainly have no problem sharing that type of information. As I shared earlier, I think Maya's case, however, is a little bit different because in her case specifically, alerting her to why we were moving her could have potentially changed her performance to where it would not have helped with helped me with diagnosis. Do the nurses or staff not use gait belts for fall risk patients? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. I have seen them used. I don't know what our standard, like if there if there even is a standard uh, 
practice or policy on the use of gait belts versus uh, recommendations from our therapists about you know walkers or other modalities. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a particular standard. We have heard testimony CRPS is a rare disease. You testified you have treated many patients with CRPS. How many patients had you treated with CRPS prior to treating Maya? So I believe I answered that previously. I don't know. I've never like pulled records to know exactly, but I would guess probably in the five to 10 range prior to treating Maya and many more since then. We have heard testimony staff at All Children's Hospital had nicknames uh, for the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. What was your nickname for Maya? I, I, don't, I don't recall ever having a nickname for Maya. Do you think it's appropriate to call Maya Ketamine Girl? I um, I certainly, you know, think that that's probably n not ideal. However, uh, knowing the physicians that were, uh, you know, caring for her prior, I don't have any questions about their integrity or their ability to provide compassionate care, even if they were choosing to use nicknames to not divulge you know, her protected information um, when they were messaging. And certainly that's not something that uh, I would anticipate that anyone would use that terminology to the patient or her family. How often did you communicate with Kathy Beatty about Maya and her needs? Uh, I don't know that I would be able to quantify the exact number of times that I spoke with Miss um, Beatty, but as the social worker, I do remember her being involved um, in certain points of time during Maya's care. Um, so I don't, you know, of the maybe total of 14 days that I took care of Maya, um, I don't know that it was daily, if that's helpful, but certainly several times within a week, it would be important for me, for any patient that's under shelter order and that, you know, has been sheltered by the state, um, for me to keep in contact with my social worker to understand what the most recent you know, hearings or procedures are happening because our social workers are our conduits to the child protection team to the... Okay, sustained. Let me go to the next question. How involved was risk management in Maya's care and treatment? So risk management was not involved in making decisions on what treatment or diagnostic testing or diagnosis, but they were the only contact that I can recall having with them specifically when I called them because I wanted to place Maya in the video room, but Dr. Smith also had similar goals and I wanted to ensure that there was no problem with us having parallel and simultaneous goals at the same time since she is technically external and was not part of the treatment team. Uh, did risk management stay up to date with what was happening to Maya? I'm not sure. That's a great question. I'm not sure how they interact, like if, if they only just wait for someone to call or if they're monitoring the case. I'm not sure what their practice is. I'm sorry. Are you aware if upper management was aware of what was happening with Maya in your hospital? Um, I know that I had contact with what I would perceive to be upper management without a definition. Um, on at least one occasion during the two weeks that I took care of Maya. I'm unaware beyond that specific contact that I had um, if, if they were otherwise involved or aware or following the case. How long did Maya receive Haldol while at All Children's? I would have to refer to the uh, medical record for that. I don't know that off the top of my head. Even though Dr. Sally Smith uh, did not enter orders, uh, she could make suggestions to the team, could she not? Yes, she could. Ultimately, as the attending provider, it would be that attending provider's decision whether or not that was appropriate and reasonable to perform as part of Maya's evaluation and care. You oh, sorry. sorry. I, you're please good. finish. I apologize. No, you're good. Were you finished? Yes. And I apologize if I was too quick there. Uh, you testified you did not make mention to the patient or parents that Maya was being moved to a video observation room. 
because in initial hospital sign-up papers, it is already agreed to that the hospital can do as part of the hospital's treatment. Is that correct? Correct. And also, in addition, because because the purpose was to for me diagnostically to be able to evaluate her function, if I told her that we were specifically moving her to that room to monitor her, if there was any element of conscious control of what she was doing or not doing, then I was very concerned that it would be counterproductive and that she would therefore be able to be aware that she was being monitored constantly and therefore it would not be a true reflection of her function and more of her conscious effort. Okay. Uh, when you move a patient from a room, let's say to the x-ray room, do you let them know or because they are already agreed to treatment, you wheel them around without explanation? Um, no, I mean, again, we typically, we want our patients to be aware of what's happening and where they're going. It's not meant to be, you know, in pediatrics, we are always hyper aware that not only are the patients, children anxious about what's happening and what could be happening, even if we come to do a procedure in their room and not wheel them anywhere, we always want to be very mindful of their level of anxiety so that they're aware of what we're doing. This, however, this in this particular case, it was different strictly with the EEG monitoring because if we had alerted her, it could have altered and impacted the results of my investigation. At the time you encountered Maya, how many years had you been a doctor? Uh, so I graduated from medical school in 2008, um, and then I took care of Maya in 2016, so for eight years. In your time as a doctor up to the time you encountered Maya, how many patients had you examined and given the diagnosis of CRPS? Um, I don't have enough uh, recollection of the previous cases specifically prior to Maya um, in terms of was I the one to deliver the diagnosis of CRPS. Typically, when we're evaluating patients with suspected CRPS, we have a multidisciplinary team, right, um, where we may have specialists involved, whether it's uh, neurology, physiatry, rheumatology. No, you can answer, finish the answer. So, so, and maybe I'm being too literal with the question, but I don't remember, I can't tell you a number of, of the patients that I was involved in making the diagnosis or, tr or treating patients that already had CRPS, if I was the one that like delivered or, or made the diagnosis, so to speak. Um, so it's, I guess the, the short way to answer that question is, is I'm not sure how many I have personally been the one to diagnose. Please clarify requesting Maya be transferred to the, quote, seizure monitoring room, end quote. That was not because Maya was having seizures. Correct. So the video equipped rooms are our, are in our seizure monitoring unit. So it's a virtual, I guess it's kind of like a virtual unit where it's on 7 North. 7 North has, what, maybe 28 beds. And I believe it's rooms 701 through 709, 710, something like that that are outfitted with the cameras for remote video monitoring. Um, and so that's called our seizure monitoring unit. Those are the only rooms that I'm at least aware of in the hospital that have any type of remote video capability. So the order in the system when we're trying to designate that we needed to move her into one of those rooms, the only like there are certain options and that's just the option that we would use to designate that we needed her in one of those rooms. But you're right, it was not for concern for seizures per se. Sally Smith uh, texts you with what you say is just a suggestion about taking Maya off of meds. You also stated Dr. Smith is not part of the, quote, treatment team, end quote. Then the jury is shown a text, I believe from you to Dr. Smith, responding something similar to you are or have you uh, responding by virtue makes Dr. Smith a team player. So is she or is she not part of the team, the treatment team of Maya? I think the best way to describe Dr. Smith's role is that she is a external consultant. She is an expert in child abuse, child abuse neglect, abandonment, 
And in this case, we were concerned and suspicious for medical child abuse. So as the lone and only child abuse specialist in Pinellas County, she was a consultant that was part of uh, um, the legal process, so to speak, that was involved when you have a patient where you're suspected that they are a victim of physical abuse, medical child abuse, sexual abuse, etc. Yeah, you, why don't you go ahead and finish your answer? Okay. So but I'm assuming it's pretty pretty close to being finished. Yes. Right? So she was not part of our internal treatment team. She's an external consultant. That's the short answer. Mr. Shapiro. One question. The, the role of Dr. Cy Smith in this case was as director of Pinellas County Child Protective Services? Correct. Okay. Thank you. And... I'll be quick. Go I think the jury will start throwing things at me. If I'm not. <laughs> you talked about internal providers. Sally Smith had access to Miles, Maya's medical record, right? Yes, my understanding is she did. She had staff privileges, right? She has staff privileges in two different capacities. So in which capacity are you asking? As a physician. Staff privileges is an active staff member at Johns Hopkins she... Health Hospital. In addition to her role as CPT, she is a local community pediatrician that has admitting privileges to see her own patients. I don't know the difference between her access in her role as CPT and medical director for the child protection team versus her ability to access the chart as a physician with admitting privileges because her practice admitted their own patients, just general pediatric patients, not, not involved in the legal process. She was on executive committees at the hospital, right? I don't know her committee involvement, I'm sorry. She was the residency rotation director at the hospital, right? I am unaware of Dr. Smith being a residency rotation director. Would you agree with me that hospitalists of the physicians involved in a care team have the most hands-on contact with the patient? Not necessarily. In Maya's case, would you agree with me that the hospitalists are the most constant presence of any physicians? Uh, during the time she was on the floor, yes. And you testify that we, and I think you said we, you mean the hospitalists, we're not supervising the social workers, right? Our responsibility is not to supervise these social workers, um, like performance, training, things like that. No further questions. Okay. No, thank you. Okay, and members of the jury, okay. Members of the jury, unfortunately, that's not a question I'm going to be able to ask this witness. Um, so, I'm assuming that all questions that are able to be asked are now complete. Is that correct? Okay. Members of the jury, uh, have them back at 9 o'clock tomorrow, ready to go. Uh, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right.
our presence. May Dr. Dees be excused? <laughs> is, does she need to remain under subpoena? No, you're no. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Mr. Altenburn, Mr. Elegant, um, let me be with you in just a moment. Is there anything from the trial attorneys that uh, we've got to address? Uh, not from the defense room. Uh, so, I don't believe so, as long as uh, Mr. Elegant would be passed along the time on concerns about the... Uh, I haven't talked to him, but I don't have a chance. Okay. Uh, so you should probably stick around. Yeah, and that's just the appellate's comment. Okay, and uh, on the defense, was there anything? No, no, Your Honor, we're curious of the shot clock. But the I'm doing it right this second. It's 20. Okay, okay, okay. Plaintiffs consumed one hour, 40 minutes. They are at 52 hours, 40 minutes. The defense consumed three hours, 45 minutes. They are at 30 hours, 30 minutes. Okay, I'm going to ask the attorneys to be back here tomorrow at um, 8.30. And, and just for planning purposes on Thursday... Um, we're going to start at 8.45, and I'll ask the jury to be here at 9.15 on Thursday. So we'll start uh, 15 minutes later on Thursday, but tomorrow, 8.30. Okay. Let's move to uh, Mr. Elegant and Mr. Altenburn. I have received the comments from Mr. Elegant and Mr. Altenburn. I don't know if you want to go through each one or just kind of... I'm not, I'm not sure how much you've got a chance to look or think about it. I've got my, my for comments for, for you to tell us and we answer your questions. You, I know you're beyond the time you wanted to leave. <laughs> uh, so January 13th is, is the day I just... But that's the day the order was entered. And I'm, I don't honestly know that that's the day she... Yeah, okay. Yeah. January 13th. Excuse me. It's January 13th. I beg your pardon. I got the wrong order. Sure. Yeah. Um, on page 2... The sentence under the orders I described in this instruction, the auto Kowalski was totally prohibited from visiting Maya Kowalski in the hospital. I don't see why we need that because the order uh, describes that. Uh, I know, but but what you said was that we, we're not responsible for the length of her stay or the matters for which the the... the, the was kept in the hospital under the order or the length of her stay. You, you didn't say we weren't responsible for the fact that mom, mom uh, couldn't come and visit. I'm talking about the prior sentence. Oh. The, the one that was added under the orders I described right. in this instruction, Beata Kowalski was totally prohibited from visiting Maya in the hospital. Because that's not said below. And, and, I mean, there's been lots and lots of things about her not being able to visit and, and the stress that places on the child, and I want it to be clear that we're, we're not responsible for that as well as the length of the stay well, and, and these orders. That sentence, I don't think, I think that's duplicative, so we need to remove that sentence. Now, the, the balance of that paragraph and the addition and the fact that Beata Kowalski could not visit Maya okay. Kowalski, I'm okay with that, but add the words at the hospital. And the fact that Maya Kowalski could not visit, the Beata could not visit at the hospital. At the okay. hospital. Okay. And then the last sentence there is the hospital is responsible under any of the claims presented to you. I think we just say period and then strike out as the jury. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to follow. Where are you? I'm sorry. Page two. And the sentence begins. The. Well, it's the last clause of the top paragraph. 
Nick, do you want to come up here? Come up yeah, you can look at with me. I, I, I don't mind. Copy. I apologize. Yeah. Maybe it's Just to expedite, you want yes, to yeah, look at this? It's just under the claims being presented to you. Okay, that's something that's correct. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay. The next issue on the paragraph below, the one that was added, the sentence that says, if disagreements concerning her care and treatment arose, I don't see why we need uh, that sentence. The, well, to the extent that there, if, if those disagreements arose but with the hospital, and they were matters that the department wanted one thing and the parents wanted another thing. We couldn't resolve it. The court had to resolve it. And, and frankly, a lot of what was going on with, with ketamine and things like that and transfer were being done by the court because that wasn't something we could say, okay, parents, we agree with you. Let's go because of the shelter order. That's why I want that there. I'll, let, I'll defer to Mr. Elegant, but I have a comment. Mr. Elegant? Yeah, we, we don't. We agree with what you said initially, Judge. We don't think it's needed. I mean, it's that's not that's not that. Ha I thought we were talking about visitation and such here. This is going to treatment. Yeah, the, the visitation I think is the page four or five. Right. You you had wanted something about the parents' rights and and as as parents, and that was why I was putting this in here. Right, and, and I I like the the first two sentences of that paragraph. So I, I just don't see why we need that last sentence. Okay. Participate in decisions. Judge, I'm not yeah. sure where we I mean, exactly where we are because I'm not looking on. Uh, but on page two, paragraph six, uh, I have a note: family therapy was authorized. Um, no, no, we're we're. So let we're, me let me see if I can quickly find. Mm -hmm. If I yeah here let's do it this way I'll put it up onto the screen actually no I have to do I have to share my screen and then put the shared screen over so Mr. Elliot can see it so that's how I have to do it. Can you see that, Mr. Elegant? Yes. Um, I gotta make it smaller. Okay, we are talking about this sentence right here, if disagreements concerning her care and treatment. That's the sentence I'm talking about. Well, right, and that's that's the one I objected to. Well, while you were working on technology, my, my partner suggests to me that it, that it could be shortened to, and I'll let you use the exact language you just said to me. Any disagreements would would be resolved by the court, right? Concern. Because because she can participate, they can participate in it, but they can't. They don't actually get to control it. That's what I. So if my if my sentence is too long, it, the, the fact that the disagreements could be resolved by the court would. They had medical decision making power this entire time. They didn't they have could, to go to the court to. They could talk to physicians. They, they, well, there's a difference between talking to physicians and making the final decision. Right, yeah. right but disagreements those, regarding her care and treatment, those were not exclusive to the defense court. They could be worked out at the hospital between the parents, the family. In, in, the in a participation, if they, if they were worked out, but if they didn't, if they weren't worked out, like the ketamine and things like that, they had to go to the court. The transfer had to go to the court, things like that. That's all I'm... Mr. Elegant, uh, what about Ms. Crowell's truncated statement? I'm, I'm, I'm still not seeing why that's necessary. Because otherwise, Judge makes it sound like the parents could say what had to happen. Okay. I will go with... Ms. Crowell's truncated statement there, if I ultimately need to take it out. Okay. But let, let's put it in, keep it in, or actually let's amend it based on what Ms. Crowell said. Okay. 
You want to write that real quick? Since um, I think we now, now need to go to page five. Sorry for everybody. I'm going to go quickly to page five. I don't mean to make you sick as I scroll. And, and this uh, the comment isn't showing here, but... Okay, and I'll tell you what... The, well, well, I mean, it's not showing on Zoom, but this is the location of the comment. You What what you did, and I understand why you did it, the, the, the order had a conflict in it between supervised and unsupervised, and it was clear the judge intended unsupervised, and so you, you cleaned that up. The order itself was never changed, and the only thing I'm concerned about, Ms. Beatty's not been on yet, but I know that there was some testimony that... I've heard from depositions or whatnot about the process of how they they noticed this and contacted it to clean it up. And I don't know whether the trial lawyers want to be able to explain that or not. It, but is, is the issue with Kyle and Dad or is the issue with Beata because it's different for Beata? No, with, with Kyle and Dad, it said unsupervised and then the next sentence said supervised and the testimony if it gets if that's testimony to get into with Miss Beatty is she said I need this please clear this up I'm confused by this and there was a gap in time where it was not clear and I don't know where they're going with yeah. that. That's well, yeah but, but I'm saying it would only be for Kyle and and Mr. Kowalski as opposed to Beata correct because there's a different rule for yeah. Beata Yes. Correct. And so is there really an issue we have to address with Kyle and Mr. Kowalski? Because if, if there's not, then... Well, it depends. I think they're going to start to try to attack Ms. Beattie about that. If they're not, then I agree. Yeah. I'm not, I, I just don't want to have this become a problem. I'm fine with this language as long as it doesn't become a problem. Right. They're not going to try to attack Ms. Beattie on her interpretation of that until she got clarification. Then we, I agree. Well, let me, let me just throw this out as a possible solution. One, we don't deal with it in what's going to be read immediately. Okay. That if it becomes an issue, then in the final version, or when I say the final version, in the version that is a part of the jury instructions, we can add language if necessary. Or maybe even if it came up, you could exp explain that because you've seen the order. But one way or the other, I, if, if it... Solving it on the fly seems like better than trying to rework this order, especially when when it's getting late for you. So I'm 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 fine with that. The the, the last thing that I mean, I mean, it just seems to me reading context, it was unsupervised, and I, I think the context no, I think was, we all agree with that. Yes, I don't disagree, Judge. I think we'll have to deal with it depending on where they go when this PD's on scale. And then there's a final sentence. That I'm not sure, like them, I'm not sure it's necessary, but if it is, the part about against recommendation of John Hopkins is, oh, is, page is on page 10 at the yeah, very yeah. end. Let me get. Here, yeah, here is what I think it. we need to do. Yeah. Um, we need to have another heading. Okay. And I just wrote down order discharging uh, Maya Kowalski. Okay. Because I don't want this sentence that is below it to look like, look like it was persons. part of the prior. I can do that. Now, and he, I, he, he, here is my, my thought. If we said, go with the first sentence. Wait a second. All I'm objecting to is noting it was against the recommendation of John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. That's just getting in again to the testimony and things that went on at the, the hearing. Well, well, that was going to say, why don't we put a period where that comma is and then strike starting with noting through the balance of the sentence. And, and that's that's the rest of that's totally fine with us. Mr. Elegant, uh, looks like I'm, I'm stripping out a piece of your sentence. I, I understand, Judge. Anything on that? Well, sort of the overall thing that uh, the, the hospital is getting a pass on a lot of things it did and said. Now, what is, the, yeah, I, I want to put a period where the comma is and then strike the balance. Yep. I, 
uh, I think of that sentence, and I understood right. it, just that sentence. Then the say, at that time, visitation, the visitation orders ceased. Right. But I do want to include a, a you know, heading. Set, yeah, heading. heading. Right. Yes. January 13, 2017 order or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I had said five orders affecting, so this would be number six, but. You know, I have a comment not having been as involved as the others here. If, I, if now's the time. Well, speak now forever. Hold your All right. In the November 14th order. Get a page on this thing, Liz. Uh, yeah. Um, what we're calling the November 10th yeah. order. Okay. Okay. It's a trial exhibit. I don't know how to reference it to you. It's trial exhibit 2093002. Anyhow, second page of the order says that number six, upon the invitation of the child's treating mental health professionals, the parents and Kyle are authorized to attend therapy and counseling sessions with Maya. So our issue is, and I haven't reviewed this in, in detail, but as, as I saw it in the version I had, that there was a total prohibition on Beata Kowalski being at that hospital. But this says, if they had invited her, she was authorized to attend. <laughs> okay, so what is the, what are you trying to get me to do? Uh, I'm trying to get you to clarify under the November 10th order that Brianna Kowalski did have a right to attend therapy and counseling sessions with Maya upon the invitation of Johns Hopkins. And this is the family therapy that uh, the doctor yesterday said that she wasn't able to do, right? She's not right. a family therapist. Yeah. I, the, the notion that, that the judge in the dependency order intended to vacate his his overall order by putting in that language just seems like a stretch to me. Well, we go to the specific, not the general. <laughs> well, th this is what I would suggest. I'm going to not put it in for now. If when we get to the final instructing of the jury, if we need to add language, then we can. If, if, if there were, was testimony that their lawyers contacted us and said that this overrode the other order, I'd be more impressed, but I don't think there is. So we have to have lawyers contact each other to yep. say anything in these orders? Yep. I, I, I'm not. I, I, this is, I think, what I think we need to do at this stage. Because ultimately, if the issue becomes, if that becomes an issue, then we'll have to craft a specific instruction on it. And that, this we doesn't preclude that. All right, we believe, thank you. We believe it's an issue. We understand. We'll come back to it. But well, final, final Mr. question. Alligate, I'm sure, has heard and then can work with your team on an appropriate future instruction. So final quick question is, do we let the jury have a hard copy while he's reading all this to them? We haven't done that previously. I'm just asking you here, whether you're willing to do my, it with this. I've been thinking about that. Um, if we're going to possibly alter and add, you don't it's want probably to do that. best to let me just read it okay. with a statement that in the instruction packet at the end, you will have this in there. And so they will know that they will have what I'm going to read. Them. Now, am I reading this tomorrow? I would like to have you read it tomorrow because Miss Beatty is going to be on tomorrow. No, she's not. She's not? Until okay. Monday. All right. I still think. Well, you tell me. Well, I, I think we need to just take a moment to reflect on it, if that's okay. And then that, that's. I'm okay with not reading. Okay. You, you're going to have. There, there isn't anybody coming up tomorrow that would demand that this be read to. Uh, you got uh, Dr. Smith will be here on. Thursday, so we may want to do it by then, but I think tomorrow is probably a safe day to publish lunch. Okay. Anything else about this order before I take it down? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, I'm still sharing my screen. How are you? It's just not wanting me to. Well, if, if we're almost done, maybe when it ends, it'll it'll stop. It'll stop. <laughs> yeah, it's not even giving me the option to. 
just stop it at this point. Yeah. I think. I think. Oh, when no, you terminate... oh, sorry. It, it was on my other screen. There yeah. we go. Anything else we need to address this afternoon? No. Okay. Eight thirty tomorrow. See you then. We're in recess. Thank you.